Good morning. Can I ask you to please rise for the national anthem of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? His, His Excellency, Excellency President Muhammadu Buhari, GCFR, President and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, ably represented today by Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, Honorable Minister of Finance, Federal Republic of Nigeria. His, His Excellency, Excellency, Mr. Babajide Songolu, the Executive Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Mohammed Musa, Honorable Minister, Federal Capital Territory, ably represented by Alahaji Bashir Maibonu, his Chief of Staff. Dr. Issa Ali Ibrahim, Honorable, Honorable Minister, Minister Commu Communication, Communication and, and Digital, Digital Economy, Economy, Federal Republic, Republic of Nigeria. Nigeria. Otumba Femi Pedro, FCIB, former Governor, Lagos State, and Chairman, CIBN, Governing Council. The Governor, Governor Central, Central Bank, Bank of Nigeria, Nigeria Mr. Godwin Emiefele, C-O-N, F-C-I-B. Princess Adejoke Orelope Adefolire, Senior Special Advisor to the President on Sustainable Development Goals and former Deputy Governor, Lagos State. The, the President, President Chairman, Chairman of, of Council, CIBN, Mr. Bayo Olubemi, FCIB. CIBN Office Holders, CIBN Past Presidents, and CIBN Registrar Chief Executive, Mr. Sheye Awojobi. Gentlemen of the press and distinguished ladies and gentlemen here this morning. Welcome to the 13th Annual Banking and Finance Conference, CIBN. I will be your MC for today and tomorrow's proceedings. My name is Mr. Chukuma Aligwekwe. And because, and because that's, that's a, a bit of a tongue, tongue twister, twister, I was kind enough to abbreviate. So should you require my attention and you say Chico, that will work quite nicely. 
There, there are a few ground rules I will be establishing as we proceed. But well, let me apologize for the slightly late start this morning. I do promise to keep things going and uh, running along smoothly so as we can get on with the program today. I'd, I'd like, like to acknowledge those who are joining us virtually and uh, set some ground rules before we move to the welcoming address. So very, very quickly, let me remind those who are joining us virtually this morning that only participants registered are permitted to join with the login details. So if your login details were sent to you, um, those are what you need to use. There's, There's a Q&A Q &A icon on the screen that should be used for questions to be addressed by any of the facilitators later on today. And all questions should be typed in the Q&A box on the virtual platform. Each participant should click the raised hand icon to signify they'd like to contribute to the sessions. I will, I will give, give a recap, recap of this just before we go into the sessions, sessions um, and any other um, issues that, that will need to be addressed during that session. session. Let, Let me just say very quickly that in the unlikely event of an emergency, emergency there, there are safety protocols, protocols in place. There, there are two doors to the rear of this hall. hall. We, we are in the Congress Hall of the Hilton. Hilton. There, there are two doors to the back of the room not, not the, the door to my right or any other exit, but the doors at the back of the room. Once you go through there and through the foyer, in an emergency, all doors at the front of the hall will be open. Make your exit in an orderly manner. And to the left of the building, about 300 meters, there is a muster point. Uh, it won't be necessary for us to go through that, but I have to say that anyway. I would like to recognize the Senate presidents of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His, His Excellency, Excellency Ahmed Lawan, ably represented, represented today by Oba Sani, who is the chairman, Senate, Senate Committee on Banking. Banking. Without, Without further ado, let's, let's go straight, straight into, into it. it. Um, I will not ask for rounds of applause today because I know that everybody in the house here is accomplished and is at the very top of the food chain in their various disciplines. So I am assuming that round of applause will come as and when due. And the first opportunity for us to test that comes now. As I invite your host, this morning to give, give a welcome, welcome address. address. The, the president, president, chairman of council, CIBN, Mr. Bayo Olubemi, FCIB, to, to join us. I'm, I'm sure, sure I'm permitted to remove this. I'm also far away from the The president, president of the Federal, Federal Republic of Nigeria, Nigeria is His Excellency President Muhammadu Buhari, GCFR, ably represented by the Minister of Finance, Mrs. Zenab Shamsuna Ahmed. The, the Senate, Senate President of the Federal, Federal Republic, Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency, Excellency Senator, Senator Dr. Ahmad Lawan, ably represented by Senator Ubasani, Chairman, Senate Committee, Committee of Banking and, and Finance, Finance. The, the Governor, Governor of, of Lagos, Lagos State, His Excellency, Excellency Mr. Babadide Sanwolu, who is joining us online, the, the Minister, Minister of the, the Federal Capital, Capital Territory, Territory Alaji Muhammadu Musa Abelo, ably represented by the Chief of Staff, Alaji, Alaji Mayborn, the Central, Central Bank Governor, 
Mr. Godwin Mefiele. The former governor, sorry, the former deputy governor of Lagos State, Otuba Femi Pedro, who is here live. Thank you very much. The first vice president of our Rivers Institute, Dr. Ken Okara, FCIB. The second, the second vice president of our institute, institute Professor Hayos Olaleji Olanrewaju, SCIB. The past president's here press, because of our time, I won't be able to mention us the names, names one by one. The, the national, national treasurer, Mr. Olaleji Alabi, SCIB. The, the chairman of, of the Consultative Committee, Committee for this conference, conference Mr. Patrick Akiwonton, FCIB, who is also, also the Managing Director CEO of Ecobank Nigeria. Nigeria. Fellows, Associates, Bank, Bank Hem this year present and, and joining us online, top, top management staff of banks and financial institutions, our uh, regional and chief executive, Mr. Olusheya Ojobi, FCIB, Ladies and gentlemen, you will permit me just to cut the uh, protocols because of our time. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am indeed honored to welcome you all to the 13th Annual Banking and Finance Conference organized by the Charter District of Bankers of Nigeria, CIBN, with the theme Facilitating a Sustainable Future, the Role of Banking and finance. The 13th edition of the conference is a unique one in the annals of the Institute to be deployed as a hybrid of both physical and virtual audience and attendance of over 2,500 participants from various locations across the globe. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, that, that is faced all, all over the world today, the Institute has been innovative in executing all our activities, including my investiture as the 21st president, president and chairman of council of the Institute that, that took place in May at the peak of, of the lockdown using digital platforms. This, this year's, year's conference is holding concurrently at Transcorp Hilton Hotel in Abuja, in Abuja at, at the Banker's house, house in Lagos, and, and of course, virtually for all, all over, over the globe. globe. Let, Let me take a pause while I welcome, welcome the representative, representative of the president of the, president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mrs. Zainab. Shamsuna Hamed, the Minister, Minister of Finance. Finance. Welcome, The CIBN, as a membership-based professional body, is no doubt blazing the trail as a foremost professional institute for capacity development, talent management, ethics and professionalism, advocacy and research. Our, Our business, business continuity plan under the COVID-19 challenges has been focused on enhancing competency and quality services to our teaming members and our stakeholders through adoption and adaptation of high-level digital applications. There is no gain saying that there is no gain saying that the future of banking is digitization. I must, I must therefore, in, in this regard, thank, thank most sincerely the regulators of our industry, industry the Central, Central Bank of Nigeria, Nigeria and, and the Nigerian, Nigerian Deposit, Deposit Insurance Corporation, NDIC, as well as all banks in Nigeria, Nigeria commercial, merchant, development banks, microfinance banks, and, and mortgage institutions. institutions. For, for supporting our focus by financing this conference, thereby creating an avenue to make the participation free for all delegates. As you all may already know, 
The, the Banking, Banking and Finance, Finance Conference is an annual event of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, CIBN, usually held as a platform for professionals, policymakers, regulators, operators, academia, and other stakeholders in the financial services industry in particular, and the economic ecosystem in general, to share experiences and exchange ideas as contemporary issues affecting the sector and the economy as a whole. Let, Let me pause and make an apology here that, that I didn't formally recognize the special senior, the senior speaker assistant to the president on SDG, Princess Adi Puglieri, who is also the former uh, deputy governor of Lagos State. You are welcome, ma. So sorry for missing out. Yeah. Appreciation and recognition. It is, is worthy of note, note to appreciate our distinguished guest of honor. Mrs. Zainab Ahmed, Honorable Minister, Minister of Finance, Federal Republic, Republic of Nigeria, Mr. Mr. Mohamed Musa, Honorable Minister, Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Federal Republic, Republic of Nigeria, Nigeria. the uh, Honorable Minister, Minister of Federal Capital Territory, Territory, Mr. Mr. Mohamed Musa, ably represented by the Chief, Chief of Staff, May Bonu, and Dr. Issa Ali Pan, uh, Ibrahim Pantami, Honorary Minister, Minister of Community and Digital Economy, who received us warmly in his, his office yesterday, and, and of course, um, promised to send uh, a representative as has an engagement already fixed for today in Cardinal. The, the former Deputy, Deputy Governor of Lagos State, His Excellency Mr. Wajide Sanwolu, the Senior Advisor to the President, the President on, on, on Sustainable Development Goals, and former Deputy, Deputy of Lagos State. Princess Adik Jokia Orolugu Adifiri, and everyone who have been supportive since uh, the planning of this program commenced. We are most privileged and grateful to have you all in our midst today. We cannot but give special accolades to the leadership of the Central Bank of Nigeria, ably led by the Governor, Mr. Godwin Emefiele, CEO NFCIB, who is the chief host of this, of this conference. conference. Your, Your constant, constant support towards the activities of the Institute is highly commendable, commendable and, and appreciated. I use this opportunity to also commend the unfinished support we have always received from the leadership of the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation, NDIC, ably led by the Managing Director CEO, Alaji Umaru Ibrahim, MNI, FCIB. Let me also recognize virtually our, our keynote speaker, speaker Dr. Dr. Kechiku, Kechiku Enelama, Nigeria's, Nigeria's former Minister of Industry, Trade, Trade and, investment, and Investment, and currently the Chairman of African, African Capital Alliance, Alliance, whose address will set the tone for this conference. conference. It gladdens my heart to welcome an array of carefully selected resource persons with diverse experiences on the various subject matters, who will be sharing expertise from, from different locations, locations all over the world. world. These thought leaders will deliberate, deliberate on, on the sessions and provide implementable solutions that, that will further enhance the rapid, rapid growth and sustainable development of, of the Nigerian, Nigerian economy. economy. I, I therefore crave your indulgence to rapidly, rapidly listen to them as, as they speak. speak. The, the conference team. team. When, when we, we talk, talk about sustainable future, future what do we mean? Literature has a generous and wide array of interpretation of the The United Nations offers a comprehensive but concise picture of what a truly sustainable future will resemble. This picture is brilliantly captured within the 17 UN SDG which, which include decent, decent work, work and economic growth, growth industry, industry, innovation, infrastructure, gender equality, equality reduced inequality, inequality, just to mention but a few. Given the 17 SDG goals and, and implicit ones to targets, targets, we cannot, cannot only have a better, better understanding of the sustainable future to strive for, but the blueprint to achieve this. 
In the, in the quest, quest to achieve such goals, the banking, banking sector, no doubt, doubt has a pivotal role to play. play. Indeed, Indeed, banks, often called the lifeblood of the economy, are generally responsible for the efficient allocation of resources, which is a forerunner to world creation and, in turn, economic growth and development. Given the recent disruption caused by the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, the role of banks and other financial institutions have become more important now than ever before. But what exactly are the bank rules? This year's edition of the conference aims to uncover and articulate the roles of the banking and finance sector in achieving a sustainable future we so desire. Given the complexity and scope of this topic, the theme will be tackled along with the five sub-themes and two breakout sessions over the next two days. The specific topics to be addressed are as follows. One, an assessment of inclusive banking and the way forward. Two, an articulation of the risk of facilitating a sustainable future and positioning the banks in tackling such risks. Three, a discussion on how fintech is shaping the future through innovation and disruption. Four, a discussion on leadership and competence in the banking industry. Five, a discussion on green banking and economic growth. The impact of finance and emerging sectors spotted on MSMEs, manufacturing, Creativity and agriculture industry, that's number six. And, and of course, seven, the, the impact of finance on emerging sectors, leveraging digital by the banking industry. I earnestly look forward to the, the community of this event, which will no doubt be rich in content with insightful contributions and recommendations. Let me assert as usual that we take this process seriously, and, and the outcome, outcome document will be disseminated to policymakers, policymakers, regulators, and of course, all the participants after the event. event. What's our role and, and brand, imp uh, brand impact on the conference agenda? agenda. Before, Before I hand over to our esteemed special guests and, and resource persons, let, let me take a moment to intimate you as stakeholders on the efforts made by the Institute to strengthen human capacity and talent management of our banking community on the subject matter. Our notable achievements are, one, a webinar on enhanced sustainable banking, ESB model, in the event of major economic and business destruction, was held on Thursday, May 7, 2020. Two, CIBN signed a cooperation agreement with the International, International Finance Corporation, IFC, for, for sustainable banking capacity building and awareness creation in Nigeria. Three, CIBN collaborated with IFC in the development of an environmental and social risk management, ESRM, curriculum for sustainable banking in Nigeria, and has so far conducted a train the trainers program in preparation for the commencement of certification programs in sustainable banking. The, the challenge or the poster for resolution during this conference. conference. Permit, Permit me to conclude my welcome remarks around four posters for the seasoned faculty and, and delegates at this, this conference. conference. One, One given our current position, what, what are the current steps towards achieving further inclusive banking? Two, Given the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, are banks ready to undo other possible risks that may surface in facilitating a sustainable future? Three, what competencies are expected from our current leaders and the next generation of bankers? Four, what actionable steps should be taken to further promoting green and ethical investments. In conclusion, 
their their distinguished guests guests and and delegates. Let Let me conclude by appreciating the efforts of the team that that put these events events together. together. I specifically want to acknowledge the efforts of the Consultative Committee of the 13th Annual Banking and Finance Conference, ably led by Mr. Patrick Akimoto, SCIB, Chairman, Consultative Committee, and MDTU Ecobank Nigeria. Your efforts have ensured our ability to hold this historic and world-class event despite the challenges we are facing today. While we observe social distancing in our various locations, even in our homes, I urge all participants to fully observe and comply with the COVID-19 safety protocols. Let us take advantage of the numerous and talent opportunities in this uncertainty to sustain the financial sector and the global economy at large. I wish you all an enlightening and exciting conference. And once again, I welcome you all to this conference. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I am am obviously obviously still still standing on all the established protocol protocol, uh, before now. But But uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the president, president, chairman of of council, CIBN, Mr. Bayo Olubemi, FCIB, with with his welcome welcome address. Thanks Thanks for the round of applause. Now, Now, today today is a first for CIBN in a number of ways. We We are are having having this conference in three different locations simultaneously. Now, Now, it's it's fascinating. fascinating. I I often say that one of the things, things, one of the sectors sectors that stood stood head and shoulders above others when it comes to the challenges of the pandemic pandemic is the banking banking sector, sector, the finance sector. sector. I mean, mean, it it responded so quickly. It It had had this way of uh, just just keeping going going and actually setting examples for some of the other um, smaller businesses and smaller sectors and how to handle a pandemic. pandemic. So I have no doubt that those in the house today and those in CIBN are going to take us to the next level, COVID-19 or no. Can I get a yes? (laughs) Thank you very much. All right, moving swiftly on. It's It's time time for for me me to invite invite your chief host today with a goodwill message. It is my privilege and my pleasure to invite the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emiefele, GCON, FCIB, with a goodwill message. All All right, right. we We will do a rewind when when we get get to that that point. So So let's let's hear from from, uh, those who are joining us. We do have a Lagos Command Center. And uh, for the first time this morning, let's have them check in and speak to us. They are in the Command Center Banker's House in Lagos. I'm, I'm going to call, call on Mrs. Mrs. Mojisola Bakare Asiru, who is the Chairman Logistics Committee, to check in with us. The images you're seeing now are coming from Banker's House in Lagos, where this conference is also going on, um, parallel to this one. Good morning, madam.
All right, right madam, I'm, I'm going to ask you, your, your technical, technical people, people we, we are unable to hear madam at the, the moment. moment. Can, Can you please take, take a look, look at that? that? She's, She's speaking to us, but we can't hear her here in Abuja. Can, Can we, we make, make sure the, the microphone, microphone is on? All right, let's, let's say, say good, good morning, morning to those joining us virtually. Um, I do understand that right now we have over 3,000 people who have registered online for this conference. This is a first, 3,000 people. I think it does deserve a round of applause. That's, that's, uh, that is fascinating. Now, can we have one of our virtual participants Say good, good morning, morning to, to us, us please. Just, just so as we know you're there, there. One, one of our panelists who's, who's joining us virtually. Uh, make, make sure you unmute, unmute yourself, yourself, sir. You're, you're speaking, speaking to Abuja, Abuja and, and we can see you clearly. Good, good morning, morning, sir. All right, All right, I'm, I'm going, going to ask technical, technical to please take a look at the sound. We don't have sound from Lagos. We don't have sound virtually. When you're sorting, when you've sorted that out, please indicate and we can come back to this point. But for here in Abuja, we are going to move on and come back to, to um, those people in a little bit. We'll give you a bit of time. Now, as an MC, um, one, one of the things, things we do when it comes to hosting events like this is you go and you do some research. And uh, I always like to bring a little bit of a humorous angle to things, even though banking is a serious business. I mean, I had someone speak to me the other day about how you one person posts and then another person cross-checks and then there's a cash officer who cross-checks what the first person cross-checks then cross-checks what the second person cross-checked and then there's another person and it goes on and on and so it's really serious stuff and if you are a weak link in that chain where you cause there to be some sort of error the penalties can be quite severe so i know it's a serious business but it has a very humorous angle too I spoke, I spoke to, to 10, 10 different people, people. Some, some of them bankers, bankers some other stakeholders, stakeholders because they run an account. account. And, and I asked them to tell me the most bizarre thing that had happened to them in their banking life. You'd, You'd be amazed, amazed at some of the stories I got told. told. I will share some, some of the most bizarre ones in the course of today's proceedings. proceedings. Uh, can, can I remind technical that we're waiting on you to, to confirm, confirm to me that, that we have sound from Lagos, Lagos and from Abuja. Um, I'd, I'd like to get a signal when, when, when that, that is sorted. sorted. So, one, one of the things that I got, the most bizarre one was from a lady who works in customer service. service. Please, Please do not ask me which bank, bank because, because I will not say. say. And don't, don't ask me her name because I won't say that either. But what she did say is that, can, can I please say when you get there, she will tell our guys to, to find some way of putting in a handbook that customers should understand. That when you come into customer service and I'm being nice and polite and smiling at you and looking at you in the eye when I speak to you, it's just our training. It doesn't mean I fancy you. So, so please, please don't start, start asking me for my number and so on and so on. And, and these are some, some of the things they go through. These, these are some of the things um, they go through. I've got some, some other bizarre, bizarre stories as well. I'll touch on them. them. So, so I'll be able to go back to say to the young lady, well, we had, had those at the very top of the food chain, speaking banking uh, in the hall. And I actually did relay your story. And don't worry, I didn't tell them who you are. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege 
of inviting to address us the executive, executive governor of Lagos State, State His, His Excellency, Excellency Mr. Babajide Songo Olu. Good, Good morning, Your Excellency. Excellency. Good morning. Can you hear me very well? Yes, yes we, we can, can hear you very, very well, well, Your Excellency. Excellency. Okay, so I was beginning to wonder what is wrong with the technical issue. Well, well you know, he was, he's doing 3,000 capacity fiber network. So, Certainly shouldn't be having any form of internet activity because this is a need of us, all of us. So indeed, I'm happy that you can hear me and I can proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. First, let me acknowledge uh, your presidency, Abuja, President, the Chairman of the Governing Council of the um, FC, FC, IP, Mr. Bio, you with me. FCIB, who is, the, who is the president and chairman of the Chartered Institute of Africa in Nigeria. I want to acknowledge him and I want to wish him all the very, very best in his tenure as the president of the Great Institute. I want to also acknowledge the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and Planning. Um, Someone that I are very well, Daina, Damsuna Hamed. Thank you very much, Madam, for coming. Um, the the city governor in absentia. I'm sure he'll be joining us very, very soon. Um, my fellow Lagosians, two former deputy governors in Lagos State, Femi Pedro and um, Mrs. Adi Jokero Elope Ate Fulure. I acknowledge you. I acknowledge other council members, the great institute, um, the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Nigeria, all the other uh, great speakers, panelists, former ministers, um, and, and other participants, over 3,000 participants uh, joining this, this conference, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's a great honor sharing this platform with professional colleagues, and some of whom I have had the privilege of working with renowned days as I think it's reminiscent for me this morning that I see one or two faces that we've been friends for the past 30 years, still running the conversation of the great Institute. I want to personally congratulate the president and the chairman of council, and of course the entire management. Uh, for putting together this 13th annual conference, um, even with this very challenge of COVID-19 that all of us are, are going through, but well, even with that, uh, the block will be able to okay. put together this uh, to come to. So I want to congratulate the president and um, the chairman of council for putting together. I'm also pleased, you know, to note the forward-looking theme of this year which is facing the sustainable future, the role of finance and banking, the role of banking and finance. Amidst this most severe pandemic and what I've ever seen in our lifetime. Of course, there cannot be any greater, greater um, topic to be than what you have put together. Um, and even the reality that we found ourselves in the past uh, couple of months. Specifically in the last months, the entire world have gone through very challenging moments, emotionally, mentally, socially, and financially for indeed everyone. Indeed, this pandemic has taken a severe toll, not only on each one of us individually, but it has also taken a big toll on our businesses and our various work-life activity. I'm sure you can still hear me. Yeah. Abuja, can you hear me? Okay. okay. The banking and financial service sector um, has not been left out with this disruption and much of its collective focus on humanity 
has been surviving you know, on a day-to-day -day basis as all of us have had to be dealing with. Even though the pandemic is still very much with us, I'm sure that many of us will agree that we're all enthusiastic about moving on. We are eager to put COVID-19 right beside or behind us and to deploy the lessons the pandemic has taught us into building a new resilient models and systems of thinking and action. I do not think that there's anyone today, especially in Abuja and all of the other um, centers that are hearing me, that have not learned one critical lesson in the last seven, eight months. The lessons that you are all ready to put into practice going forward. How do we avoid the next pandemic? And if indeed, if we cannot avoid it completely, how do we prepare for it? This, in my view, I believe for us, even as bankers, the pandemic will have brought lessons about digitalization, about technology. It will have brought about challenges around creating innovative ways where we need to engage and serve our customers. How do we respond to new business continuity plans and so on? So these are some of the new normals that the pandemic has brought forward. And so we have a responsibility to create the kind of future we want for ourselves. A future that will impact all of us, regardless of whether or not we can take active and consonant steps to design and create that future. For these reasons, we must take very seriously the responsibility of envisioning and implementing the kind of future that we all want. A future that is built to cope with the evolving reality of the population growth, especially the one we have in Nigeria. A future that would also consider climate change. A future that would have a recurrence of pandemic. A future that would continue to see technological challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, and so on. And so for us in Lagos, especially for the government that we, we run here today, it's clear that the public sector cannot do it by itself. We cannot do it alone. One of our primary responsibility is to expand the space for you, the private sector, for you to put your money and your resources and your creativity into the development of our various states and cities. And of course, Lagos is inclusive. We must create an enabling environment for you to do what you do best. And as bankers and as financial service providers, which is mobilizing and deploying capital for solving societal problems. And indeed, I imagine, like the president of council did mention, um, all of the collaborative efforts he has had to deal with in the last couple of months. But more importantly, some of the things he's expecting to be the takeaway from this year's annual conference. And so to facilitate a sustainable future, it requires a financial service sector that is not only dynamic, but is globally competitive. It requires a financial service sector that is not only profit driven, but also willing and able to provide support for various sectors in our economy and will not see only the financial benefits in a short or medium term, but will be critical to providing a solid base for the future economic progress, prosperity, and improved quality of life for a larger percentage of our citizens. And I'm sure the Honorable Minister, who is in your midst, he's better suited to know and to appreciate how challenging that role has become for her in the past couple of months. But I dare say that she's doing a damn good job of that. At the end of the day, we all must be concerned about a society that works for all of us, where people can realistically aspire to, be, to have a better life for themselves and for their family. There is no doubt that our citizens are doing well, our businesses are on the right path of coming out of the pandemic, but we certainly still have poverty around us. We certainly still see that the need for us to take a sizable number of our people 
give them the opportunity to be able to take their families and their businesses out of the, the, the very difficult challenges of this pandemic and provide prosperity for themselves and their families as they go ahead. For us, we set an, academic, an, an agenda, an economic agenda in Lagos, which we had called um, the project teams, which and in six pillars, looking at transportation challenges, looking at traffic challenges, looking at our health education, looking at edu uh, technology as a strong enabler for developing and making Lagos a truly 21st century economy, looking at a sustainable governance. Security must always be one of the responsibility of any forward-looking government. And so for us, these are some of our economic agenda driving us. And I want to encourage you as professionals to endeavor to make yourself more familiar, not only with the Lagos State economic agenda, but of course, even the federal government's um, economic growth plan, which I'm sure the Honorable Minister will also be speaking to and be able to plug not only the institute, but the entire profession into being able to create the support and enable environment for businesses, for um, um, MSMEs, for everybody to, to be able to survive and survive well in this very critical um, um, sector, in this critical time that we find ourselves. And like the president rightly said, that he's expecting, taking away from this conference, four critical components. How has our leaders responded to COVID-19? What are the things that even as bankers, as professionals, you need to be doing that we're not doing right now? What are the comparative advantages that needs you know, for us to bring forward today to be able to um, have that um, um, ability uh, for the, not only the, 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 the institute to, to continue to remain relevant, but be able to create a business chain where um, we see ourselves as an enabler of that growth. I would want to um, sincerely wish the Institute and all of the participants, you know, um, the very um, best of, 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 of the next one or two days as you continue to express, you know, um, the willingness to do business, to do well, and the ideas and proposals that will be coming out of the um, engagement that you have in the next two days. I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to be part of this. I would have loved to be with you in Abuja, but um, Lagos also um, um, has on a daily basis the challenges that comes with the mega city status of our, of our state. So I want to wish you the very best and I want to yield the floor back to uh, the organizers in Abuja. And I'm hoping that I've, I've, I've been well heard because um, the system seems to be easy here. Thank you very much. Excellency, I can confirm that we heard you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency, Mr. Babajide Songwolu, the Executive Governor of Lagos State. Right, still we're waiting on our technical. Do give me an indication when we can speak to those on uh, virtual. We do have Lagos in order now. Can we go to Lagos House very briefly? And uh, hear from Mrs. Mojisola Bakari Asiru in Banker's House in Lagos. All right, we move. Uh, still with our goodwill messages, the next person I would like to call up with a goodwill message, please, let's give a warm welcome to Princess Adejoke Orelokwe Adefulire, the special senior special assistant to the president on sustainable development goals, Federal Republic of Nigeria.
Your Excellency is distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Permit me to stand on the existing protocol and they are established. Let me congratulate the management of the Shattered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, CIBN, and the organizing committee for successfully organizing this 13 annual banking and financing finance conference. Despite this, challenges of our time, and indeed, the theme of the conference, facilitating sustainable future, the role of banking and finance. This is a very suitable team, timely and aligned with the spirit of the Fusion 2030, the Fusion 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Excellencies, distinguished participants, please recall that in 2015, September, the world leaders gathered together and adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as a successful development framework for the Millennium Development Goals. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development envisions a present and a future that is economically sustainable, socially inclusive, and environmentally resilient. This future is expressed through the framing of 17 SDG goals, 169 targets, and 230 indicators. These indicators, key performance indicators, Implicitly, the SDG are a first call to end action to end poverty in all ramifications, safeguard the planet, and ensure that all people, irrespective of their religion, status, enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Evidently, the transformative promise of leaving no one behind means prosperity for all of us, and the Agenda 2030 is all about sustainable future. So, in conveying this good message, therefore, I would like to challenge participants and the organizers on the strategic role of banking and finance in facilitating sustainable development. Historically, the international community signed up to 0.7% of world domestic global product GDP, approximately 500 billion annual daily to spend on SDGs. But it is argued that even if all nations managed to raise 0.7%, this world will not be, this would not be sufficient enough realistically to finance SDG, the common future of all of us. Globally, some estimate gap of approximately $2.5 trillion annually could be raised to fund and implement the SDG in developing countries. The recent UN report estimates that Nigeria needs approximately $85 billion annually to sufficiently fund the SDGs. And unfortunately, just as we commence the decade of action, meaning that 10 years ago, for the implementation of SDG in Nigeria, January this year, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic across the world has now challenged the prospects of achieving the SDGs. Indeed, beyond the health hazards and human consequences of the pandemic, the social economic uncertainties and destruction come at a substantial cost to the Nigeria economy, which is likely dependent, dependent on oil and gas revenues. Evidently, public sector resources are insufficient 
to finance sustainable development. We need both human and financial resources of the organized private sector, banking inclusive. Indeed, in the early 2000s, our revered Professor Muhammad Yunus of Grameen Bank of Bangladesh has shown the world how bank can directly and sustainably finance development. Microfinance targeting women of the productive age is smart economy. Women use microfinance to engage productive, productively and contribute to the GDP of every country. Support their families and some instances send their children to school. And by extension, we believe that it will reduce also domestic violence in our homes. And the payment was reported to be nearly 100% for a long period of time. As a government, we have facilitated the establishment of the private sector advisory group for sustainable development in Nigeria in February 2017. And this is what was kind in Africa. The first to be inaugurated in Africa. The first and first established private organized private sector working with the government of Nigeria to accelerate the implementation of SDGs. Private sector is very strategic, is a very good platform for galvanizing ideas, mobilizing the expertise, and financial resources in support of achievement of SDG working with the public sector. All the banks in Nigeria, we call on you to join this platform. We are presently working in partnership with the United Nations Development Program UNDP to design and implement integrated national financing framework for sustainable development. And the chairperson for that platform is the Honorable Minister for Finance, Budget, and National Planning. He has seated and she has been championing this cause very, very well. We thank you, ma'am, for support. The Integrated National Financing Framework for Sustainable Development will be an operational tool for implementing the Addis Ababa Action Agenda for Financing Development and provide a clearer picture of the public and private financing landscape. Financing sustainable development is not just about mobilizing capital for strategic project and program. It is equally about ensuring the organized private sector becomes adapted to financing the sustainable development by altering the way in which private finance operates so that its own processes are both sustainable and support sustainability. As I conclude this golden message, I encourage Nigerian banks to pay close attention to financing micro, small, and medium enterprises. The, mic, the, small, the micro, small, and medium enterprises can increase the productivity capacity of the economy, generate the same job, and sustainably contribute to the economy of Nigeria. It will be useful to set up micro, small, and small businesses in a sustainable financing way and create this platform as a unit in every bank in Nigeria. To drive this process, my office is ready to work with you and collaborate with you so that we can support. I'm sure the bankers committee can easily facilitate this and we're ready to work with you. I think this partnership we work effectively and support the agitation of Mr. President, who promised, with your support, that 100 million Nigeria will be moved out of poverty by 10 years. Saying that, you knew we cannot do it alone. We require the support of everyone, and this sector is very critical in achieving that. I'm sure that will be put into consideration so that, so that we can support the government, government of Nigeria, Nigeria private, private sector, sector working with the public sector. That's the only way we can achieve sustainability and achieve 
agenda 2030. By 2030, I sincerely hope that this annual conference and this particular conference will reinforce our commitment to work closely together as policy maker, captain of industry, development practitioners, and concerned citizens in support of sustainable development in Nigeria. I thank you all for inviting me. I wish you all a very productive engagement. God bless you and God bless Nigeria. Still standing on established protocol and in keeping with my promise to move things along swiftly, we will be going to our next speaker, but let's hear it again for the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Sustainable Development Goals, Federal Republic of Nigeria, Princess Adejoke Orelokwe Adefulure. Thank you very much. Right. Straight, Straight on, on to our, our next speaker, speaker with a, a goodwill, goodwill message. It is your chief host today, Governor, Governor Central Bank, Bank of Nigeria, Nigeria Mr. Godwin Emiefele, GCONFCIB. Please join me in inviting him to the stage. Um, the, the Honorable, Honorable Minister, Minister of, of Finance, Finance, the Chairman, Chairman Senate, Senate Committee, Committee of Banking, Banking. I, I also, also see other distinguished Senators, Senators and Chairman, Chairman of Banking in the House of Reps. Um, the president of CIBN, uh, Mr. Adifulure, our chief executive here president, our colleagues from the Central Bank of Nigeria, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. First, let me apologize for coming here because uh, I realized that the Honorable Minister of Finance was here seated before me whereas I've been addressed as the chief host of this event, which meant that I had to be here, I needed to have been here to receive her um, at this event. My most sincere apologies because I was uh, busy at my office trying to prepare some presentations uh, for a villa meeting later this morning. My most sincere apologies, please. It is indeed a pleasure to once again address the banking community at the 13th Annual Banking and Finance Conference being organized by the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria. I always look forward to speaking at CIBN events because it presents significant opportunities for me to address critical stakeholders in the banking and finance industry on events that are shaping our economy and the policy measures that we have embarked upon to support greater economic growth and continued stability of our financial system. Let me especially thank the leadership of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, led by its president, Mr. Bayo Ulubuimi. I also, I also appreciate, appreciate Mr. Sheya Wojobi and, and members of the Secretariat and his team for the relentless efforts in ensuring the success of today's event. I likewise, likewise extend profound gratitude to chief executives and representatives of banks that are here today. And once again, 
a chairman, banking, a the Senate, and the House of Representatives who are here today to grace this event. I also welcome my colleagues, like I said earlier, from the Central Bank, our Deputy Governor, and other senior management of the bank that are here. And to everyone attending this event in person or virtually, I'd like to thank you for attending. The theme of this conference, Facilitating a Sustainable Future, the role of banking and finance, is apt when we take into account recent events such as COVID-19 pandemic, which began in Wuhan, China in December 2019. COVID-19 has been a profound, has had a profound effect and consequences, adverse consequences on the Nigerian economy and the global economy, particularly in the first and second quarter, as it created a dual challenge for policymakers. We had to address the public health challenge while trying, trying to also reverse a significant downturn in the economies. Today, I'll, I'll be addressing the important role that the banking community can play in restoring stability to sectors significantly impacted by the virus, while also supporting investments in key sectors of the economy that would have a multiplier effect on the growth of our country. COVID-19 and the Nigerian economy. Prior to the onset of the coronavirus in Nigeria, the Nigerian economy had been on a positive growth trajectory. We had witnessed 12 consecutive quarters of positive growth following the 2016-2017 recession, also with significant foreign capital inflows due to improved fundamentals of the economy. The GDP grew, growth for 2019 stood at 2.29%, supported by the strong growth of 2.55% in the fourth quarter of 2019, and capital flow of about $4 billion during the last quarter of 2019. So what we would say, as we came out of the recession of the 2016-2017, we had progressively, progressively began to see an upward trajectory in growth and output numbers. All macroeconomic variables were trending upwards and everything looked so nice and we felt happy and deep sigh of relief. Then unfortunately, COVID-19 struck, coupled with the drop in crude prices and we are where we are today. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in the first half of 2020 and the measures put in place to contain the spread of the virus caused a significant shock to our economy. The downturn in economic activity, which was particularly significant during the second quarter of the year, was driven by a series of external factors in addition to the lockdown measures imposed in order to curtail the spread of the virus. Although the lockdown had a significant effect on economic activity, it had to be done necessarily in order to prevent an uncontrolled spread of the virus and the potential health calamities that we saw. While efforts were being made to improve the capacity of our healthcare institutions to deal with the potential surge and fatalities in the country. Consequently, the Nigerian economy contracted by 6.1% in the second half of 2020, down from a positive growth of 1.87% recorded in the first quarter of 2020. While these results were not positive, it was well below the forecast of many analysts who had projected a steeper contraction of 7.4% for Nigeria. But that means that it was also better than the contraction that had witnessed in other advanced and emerging market economies, such as Great Britain, United Kingdom had a contraction of 20%, India had a contraction of 24%, South Africa on an annualized basis contracted by 51% in the second quarter, of 2020. 
the late and expected downturn in the economy was due to collaborative efforts between the monetary and the fiscal authorities, the impact of the crisis. From a sectoral perspective, COVID-19 pandemic along with the restrictions on movements had a significant effect on a wide number of sectors. And I'd like to elaborate on these impacts for a few of the sectors concerned. Impact on the lockdown. First, the closure of schools, hotels, and restriction on movement, just to mention this few, led to the contraction in the transportation sector by 49%, Accommodation, accommodation, hotels, and tourism by 40%, construction contracted by 32%, and the educational sector contracted by 24%. Other sectors such as financial services and telecommunications grew by 28% and 18% respectively. These sectors which have the ability to leverage on digital channels witness strong growth as Nigerians relied on these tools to communicate and conduct business activities and their financial transactions. The agricultural sector continued to record positive growth of 1.6% supported by the productivity gains in the sector, intervention by government and improved demand for local produce, and crude oil prices. Restrictions on global travels by land and air, along with slowdown in commercial activities, led to a significant reduction in the demand for crude oil. These factors contributed to 65% decline in crude oil prices between January and May 2020. Indeed, at some point, crude price had dropped to below $10 a barrel in the month of sometime around February and March. This decline in prices, along with OPEC reduction of our production quota, led to a significant decline in our foreign exchange earnings, along with a more than 60% decline in revenues due to the Federation account. Today, crude oil prices have hovered from its low of $19 per barrel in April 2020 but it is yet to return to pre-pandemic levels of over $60 a barrel in January 2020. And we are not hopeful, we are not hopeful at all that for the rest of 2020, that it will go above 50. If we are lucky, it will hit 50, but we do think that it may just continue along the current levels of the 40s. The global supply chains. Significant disruptions in domestic and global supply chains as a result of lockdown measures in key markets in Asia and Europe between March and May 2020 affected the delivery of input and machinery to firms in Nigeria, and this contributed to a slowdown in manufacturing activities by 8.8%, and I meant a contraction here. Capital flows. The impact of the pandemic and the resulting slowdown in economic activity led to a significant outflow of funds from emerging market economies. Uncertainties on the scale at which the virus could spread and the impact it could have on economic activity in the absence of a vaccine led investors to withdraw over $100 billion worth of funds from emerging markets between February and, and April, April 2020, 2020, just three months. These funds were subsequently invested in safe havens assets, such as the US Treasury bills and the Japanese yen, and in some cases, the gold assets. The drop in flows between February and April was unprecedented and surpassed the decline in flows witnessed during the global financial crisis of 2008. The increase in outflows from emerging markets also led to a corresponding depreciation in the currencies of several countries such as Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, and Turkey. Nigeria was not left out from a drop in flows as capital importation in the country declined from $6 billion in the second quarter of 2019 to $1.2 billion in the second quarter of 2020. 
and an exchange rate. rate. The, the drop, drop in crude oil earnings, as, as well as drop in foreign portfolio flows, flows significantly affected the supply of foreign exchange into Nigeria. Nigeria. In order to adjust for the decrease in supply of foreign exchange, the Naira adjusted at the official window from 305 to 360 and to 380. These adjustments along with increased efforts to restrict undue speculative activities has led to a growing unification of rates across all the FX segments. In addition, the band between the parallel and the official exchange rate over the past month has narrowed somewhat significantly due to some of the measures taken by the CBN to curb illegal FX transactions in the country. With the decline in our foreign exchange earnings and subsequent adjustment in the value of the Naira to the dollar, the CBN has continued to implement a demand management framework that is designed to support improved production of items that can be produced in Nigeria and further conserve conservation of our external reserves. These measures have helped to prevent a significant decline in our reserve. Our external reserve currently stands at 36 and are sufficient to cover up to nine months of import of goods and services. On inflation, inflationary pressures persisted in the first and second half of the year due to several factors. In addition to the disruption to global and domestic supply chains as a result of COVID-19, inflation has accelerated by the increase in VAT rates, extra rate adjustments, and seasonal food supply shocks due to the onset of the farming season and other structural bottlenecks. In any case, we do think that there may be some inflation may continue to, to tick upwards maybe up till around October, November, and December as we begin to see the positive effects of the harvest. But they are not, um, we are not comforted by the fact that with the depreciation that we have seen in the currency this year, as well as the price, the increase in price in energy for those who are wealthy and the manufacturing companies, that, that this will no doubt result in imported inflation, inflation because our economy still remains somewhat significantly import dependent. And, and so, no doubt, this will further accelerate the level of inflation in the country. What, what is the response from us? us? Given, Given the impact of COVID 19 on, on key economic variables earlier mentioned, the monetary and fiscal authorities took unprecedented measures to prevent the economy from sliding into a tailspin. Our first objective was to restore stability in the economy by providing assistance to individuals, small and medium enterprises and businesses that had been severely impacted by the pandemic, as well as by the lockdown measures. Some of the measures we took include, one, a one-year extension of the moratorium on principal and repayment for all civilian interventions. We also called on the banks to restructure and extend some moratorium and provisioning regime to companies whose businesses were also adversely impacted by the pandemic. Two, regulatory forbearance was granted to banks to restructure loans given to sectors that were adversely impacted. Three, Reduction of interest rate on civil interventions from 9 to 5 percent. Four, mobilization of key stakeholders in the Nigerian economy through the Kakobit Alliance, which led to raising over 40 billion naira, which were expended, out of which 23 billion naira was expended for purchasing relief materials and food items to affected Nigerian households and the establishment of 39 isolation centers across Nigeria. Five, strengthening of the loan to deposit ratio policy, which has resulted in significant rise in loans provided by financial institutions to banking customers. Loans given to the private sector have risen 
by over 21% over the past one year. One year. And, and we're talking in absolute sum, sum close to almost about 3.5 trillion naira over the last year. Six, creation of 100 billion naira targeted credit facility for affected households and small and medium enterprises through the National Microfinance Bank. We had initially um, planned for 50 billion to be disbursed. And as we saw that there was more and more need from households and small businesses that were impacted by the pandemic, the CBN took a decision to increase the size of that intervention from 50 to 100 billion. And to date, close to almost about 69 billion naira of this fund has been disbursed to over 140,000 households and businesses. Seven, creation of a 100 billion naira intervention fund to pharmaceutical companies and healthcare practitioners intending to expand and strengthen the capacity of our health institutions. Out of that 100 billion, close to almost about 40 healthcare and pharmaceutical companies have been supported to the tune of almost about 45 billion, and, and we still do have some of these funds available for drawdown by those who need the support. Eight, creation of a research fund which is designed to support the development of vaccines in Nigeria. The body of experts that are currently chaired by the DG of NAVDAC are working, and they are looking, looking into all the empirical data that have been provided by researchers and, and we, we think, think that, that by the time they come up with the outcomes, we should, the Central Bank of Nigeria should be able to support the government by providing some form of research grants to support these uh, researchers in vaccine and drug formulation. Nine, a one trillion naira facility in loans to boost local manufacturing and production across critical sectors. So far, almost close to about 255 billion of this amount has been disbursed. And you would, would observe that up to around last month, the purchase, the purchase managers index has been contracting downwards. But as a result of some of these interventions, following the easing of the lockdown, we have seen that the purchase managers index has begun a positive trajectory again. But we are also calling on manufacturing, manufacturing companies. Those also in the agricultural processing industry should please jump on the train and take advantage of this. Because it's only by so doing that we can ensure that the productive activity of this economy is improved, improved again. And then we can begin to see output numbers going positive and perhaps ultimately avoid a recession. The impact of these measures help to prevent larger contraction in second quarter GDP growth as projected by analysts. With the first withdrawal of lockdown measures, resumption of tour travel by land and air, improvement in crude oil prices from 19 in April 2020 to the average of $44 per barrel in August 2020, continued implementation of our interventions in the agri and manufacturing sectors Along with significant pickup in economic activities, we do expect that GDP growth for the third quarter will reflect a significant recovery relative to the second quarter contraction that we saw. In the financial system, some of the measures instituted by the CBN in the banking system were taken to prevent an economic crisis from spilling over into a financial crisis. We protected the interest of depositors by ensuring that banks made adequate capital provisions to cover for unexpected losses. We were also able to support viable businesses that had been affected by the pandemic through access to intervention funds. And also, we enabled banks to restructure loans granted to sectors affected by the pandemic. While these measures will help to provide the stability to our economy, restoration of a full economic activity remains uncertain until a cure or relevant treatment option is found to contain the spread of COVID-19. Nonetheless, we have seen the resilience 
of the Nigerian economy as stakeholders have adopted new business models to adapt to the pandemic. Restaurants have begun to implement takeaway options as an additional measure and as a revenue line item. And hotels, entertainment centers, and airlines have developed new safety protocols in order to provide some sense of comfort to prospective and current customers. I believe, I believe that, that we, we will continue, continue to see more adaptations by businesses as we work to curtail the impact of COVID-19, stimulating growth. While the news of the continued growth in the banking and financial sector in the second quarter of the year was encouraging and gladdening, the ultimate strength of a financial system will depend on three key factors. One, Ensuring that banks have adequate capital buffers to withstand the stimulus of the pandemic. Two, developing adequate internal controls that will be able to identify potential risks and putting in place measures to contain that risk. And three, being able to adapt your business models to changes taking place in the business environment today arising from this pandemic. The last point is vital. This last point is vital. As COVID-19 has demonstrated, the impact externally induced disruptions could have on all economies. Supply chain disruptions and concentration of production in particular countries has highlighted difficult challenges countries could face in the event of a major pandemic. It is therefore imperative from an economic as well as security perspective that our banking and financial system work to support growth in sectors that have significant growth potential and can enhance the resilience of the Nigerian economy in the face of external shock. On agriculture, a key area of focus that the banking sector should increase its support for is the agricultural sector and the CBN will do everything possible to ensure that our deposit money banks or participating financial institutions, they flow with us in making sure that we drive extensive agricultural growth and transformation of the Nigerian economy. We have witnessed disruptions of COVID-19 has had on global supply chains and food supply. In some cases, countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, and India imposed extensive restrictions on export of our Greek produce and indeed medication. If measures had not been taken earlier to improve cultivation and processing of staple crops in Nigeria, Prior to the onset of this pandemic, we would have had to deal with a major food crisis in the country. The banking sector therefore has a significant role to play as a facilitator of growth through its intermediation function. Over the next four years, the banking sector should consider ways on which it could increase its loans to the agricultural sector from four to at least 10% by 2024. Some of the opportunities in the agri sector that banks should take should explore include addressing some of the existing gaps in the agricultural value chains, such as storage centers, transport logistics, and technology platforms that can enable rural farmers to sell their produce directly to the markets. Information technology. Another sector which has emerged as a significant source of resilience in the face of the COVID-19 COVID on the economy is the information and communications technology. During the second quarter of 2020, the ICT sector made contributions of over 17.8% to GDP, 20% higher than its contributions a year earlier. It is important that we leverage ICT as an enabler of growth in the key sectors of our economy. ICT, ICT startups 
I imagine to support SMEs, farmers, and in providing quality learning to students affected by the shutdown in schools. It is important that the banking sector consider viable IT firms in these areas that have potential to not only serve the needs of the local market, but are also able to export ICT-related services to countries across the globe. The central bank is seeking to leverage ICT in order to improve access to finance for Nigerians, improve access to finance through deployment of an inclusive and interoperable payment system would help to reduce the cost of payment services for individuals. It will also enable small, micro, small and medium enterprises to reduce the operational costs. Now, in closing, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me add that whereas COVID-19 has brought on, several, brought on all several challenges to our economy, and indeed the banking sector, it offers a unique opportunity for us to build a more resilient economy that is better able to contain external shocks while supporting growth and wealth creation in key sectors of our economy. Proactive steps on the part of stakeholders, particularly the banking and financial sector, in supporting the growth of, our, of all sectors such as agri, ICT, and infrastructure, will no doubt strengthen our ability to deal with the challenges that have been brought on us by COVID-19 and stimulate the growth of our economy. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emiefele, C-O-N-F-C-I-B. Uh, MC's day's work is never complete except there's a foot in the mouth moment. Mine happened, I don't know whether everybody caught it, but I have done that correction. It's C-O-N and not G-C-O-N. Can I recognize very quickly the presence of the deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mrs. Aisha Ahmad. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's a crucial moment in today's proceedings. Representing the President, His Excellency President Mohammed Buhari, GCFR, President and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It is my privilege to invite Mrs. Zainab Shamsuna Ahmed, Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, Federal Republic of Nigeria, to give an address of our distinguished guest of honor. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Senator Ahmad Lawal, the President of the Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, ably represented today by my brother, distinguished Senator Dr. Obasani, Chairman, Committee on Banking and Other Financial Institutions of the Senate, His Excellency, Nabajiji Shamulu, Executive Governor of Lagos State, the Honorable Minister of FCT, represented by the Chief of Staff of the Honorable Minister of FCT, the Honorable Minister of Communications, Dr. Isa Ali Pantami, also ably represented today, Princess Adegoke Orelukwe, Senior Special Advisor to the President on Sustainable Development Goals, the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefele, the Deputy Governor, my sister Aisha Ahmed, the President and Chairman of Council of the Charity Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, Mr. Bayo Ulugemi, FCIB, other members of Council, 
the Registrar of the Council, FCIB, Otumba Femi, Federal FCIB, former Deputy Governor of Lagos State and Chairman of uh, uh, CIBN, members of the press, the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked to come here to represent His Excellency Mr. President. So Mr. President conveys his warm greetings and congratulations for this event. I'm indeed very honored and privileged to be here in your midst today to mark this 13th Annual Banking and Finance Conference. The choice of the team facilitating sustainable future, the role of banking and finance for this year's conference is apt and timely in view of the protracted economic and public health menace of the coronavirus pandemic. The financial system plays a key role in the smooth and efficient functioning of any economy. It is also one of the most important institutions and functional vehicle for the economic transformation of any country. The banking sector is reckoned as a fulcrum and a barometer of the financial system as it plays a predominant role in the economic development of any country as, grow, as a growth facilitator. Its resilience is therefore a major precondition for sustainable economic growth and stability. As you're all aware, it has been nearly six months, actually over six months, since the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus disease as a pandemic. Since then, lockdowns of various degrees and durations have been implemented in different jurisdictions in the world, some more successful than others. But while a few countries have reported some successes in fighting the spread of the virus, resurgence of COVID-19 cases continue to be seen in many parts of the globe. Consequently, business activities have been disrupted and the global economy is set to contract in the year 2020. The International Monetary Fund and its re report released in June 2020 ex expects the global economy to shrink by up to 4.9%, worse than the 3.0% projected earlier in April this year. Nigeria is not spared. As an economy, Nigeria is projected to go into a negative growth also by the end of 2020. And this is already seen in the second quarter GDP report, which reflected a negative growth of 6.1%. This is against the backdrop of the real GDP decline from 2.55% in the fourth quarter of 2019 to 1.87% in the first quarter of 2020 reflecting the very earliest effects of disruptions in the global supply chains caused by the pandemic. Overall, Nigeria's GDP is projected by the MBS to relapse into a second recession in a four-year period from the third quarter of 2020. We expect that the contraction by the close of 2020 could be between minus 4.2 to minus 4.4 percent. So amidst this uncertainty created by the pandemic, we are confident that the Nigerian economy will bounce back strongly within the near term with the right policy responses to the multi this multidimensional crisis. Since we cannot simply wait for things to get better on their own, we have had to formulate policies, appropriate policies to implement them steadily in order to address the challenges head on. So far, the federal government of Nigeria has implemented a wide range of fiscal, monetary, and as well as prudential monetary measures that squarely address four key necessities. One, ensuring sufficient liquidity in part to support government programs for saving lives and livelihoods, two, maintaining stability of the financial system, three, 
ensuring continued delivery of financial services to the public, and for shoring up confidence and pushing economic activity. The banking system, which is very critical, which is a very critical component of the financial sector, is also not immune against the potential impacts of the current economic situation, as banks have had to restructure potentially bad loans in every sector of the economy. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it will be recalled that in response to the current health and economic crisis occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal government had rolled out both fiscal and monetary stimulus packages in the form of domestic interventions. And I must say that the central bank government has very eloquently described some of these uh, monetary measures. But let, let me just add that, or let, let me just emphasize that there was a 500 billion Naira targeted credit facility that was rolled out to affected household and MSMEs. And the central bank has reported that they have had to quickly increase that to 100 billion. And I'm glad to hear that the uptake is up to about 60 billion today. It also, we also had this um, 100 billion intervention specifically for the healthcare sector in the form of loans to pharmaceutical companies and healthcare pra practitioners. This was intended to expand and build capacity of the healthcare system in the country. In addition, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, availed the country a facility, a rapid financing facility in the sum of 3.4 billion US dollars this is meant to support Nigeria. This is meant for Nigeria to support the health sector, to protect jobs and businesses crucial to support economic revival. Similarly, moratoriums have also been given in respect of all federal government loans, funded loans issued by the central bank, by the Bank of Agriculture, by the Bank of Industry, and also by the Nigerian Export Import Bank. This stimulus also was extended to the states in terms of deferment of loan repayments, and this has helped to create more better fiscal space for the states. As part of the concerted effort aimed at bridging the transition to a post-COVID-19 era, the federal government in July launched a 12-month economic sustainability plan. This is a stimulus package in the sum of 2.3 trillion naira. This amount is being funded 500 billion from federal government special accounts, 1.1 trillion from CBN structure lending facilities, as well as 303 billion from other funding sources. This was done against the backdrop of the recently designed, recently designed 2021 to 2023 medium term expenditure framework and fiscal strategy paper, which is currently before the parliament and also the medium-term and the long-term plan that we are currently work on, working on. The present administration recognizes that a strengthened implementation framework is needed to achieve the objectives of the medium to long-term plans, hence the need to put in place a process of broad-based dialogue with all stakeholders. This framework is meant to accommodate changing economic realities drive the economy on the path of accelerated growth, and also serve as a reference point for economic planning. While the fiscal strategy paper highlights macro macroeconomic objectives of the government over the period 2021 to 2023. The policy measures that are to be implemented are clearly enumerated in this plan. Today, as bankers and as fund managers, you stand in a position to partner with government in its efforts to diversify the economy, reposition the country for a sustainable future. Therefore, you must redouble your efforts to mobilize domestic resources, to attract foreign investment, to create quality job opportunities for achieving youth, and to lift a lot of Nigerians out of poverty. Actually, Mr. President made a commitment to the country that 
He has plans to ensure that up to 100 million Nigerians are lifted out of poverty over the next 10 years. With the current partial lifting of the lockdown measures, there are positive indications that there are some, that there are some businesses that are getting back to pre-pandemic levels. However, the uncertainty over the duration and the intensity of the pandemic, as well as its impact on the economy, on the economy continues to be a cause for concern. In the wake of the pandemic, the government in concerted efforts with regulatory authorities have stepped up various liquidity measures, monetary prudential and supervisory measures in the form of interest rate costs, higher structured and durable liquidity, moratorium on debt service and forbearance on assets provision. This framework has been planned to take in uh, has been planned in consultation with various stakeholders, and it is aimed at striking a balance between protecting the interests of depositors and maintaining fiscal stability. And also, that's on one hand, and preserving the economic values of viable businesses by providing durable businesses with relief that is needed in this critical time. We expect efficient and diligent implementation of the restructuring measures by the banks, keeping the, the key objectives in mind. While the moratorium on loans was is temporary, is a temporary solution in the context of the lockdown, the restructuring framework is expected to give durable relief to borrowers facing COVID-19 related distress. It is expected that post-COVID-19, the financial sector should return to normal functioning without relying on regulatory relaxations and other measures as the new norm. Just like boosting immunity of the population is also important to tackling pandemics, the key to long-term financial stability will be to foster tangible improvements in the resilience of banks to withstand exogenous shocks like the current pandemic. Accordingly, the core of resilience banking is made up of good governance, effective risk management, and compliance culture. This is not to say that the Nigerian banks do not have sound uh, corporate governance uh, or they do not have good risk management systems in place. There is always scope for improvement. And there are areas which need greater attention going forward. The banking sector has been a responsible player and it still has a responsible role to play, not only as a facilitator of growth of the economy, but also to improve its own profitability. Let me use this opportunity to congratulate you for organizing this year's event even in the face of the ravaging COVID-19 pandemic. And to also commend you for concurrently running this event in two different locations in the country. I have no doubt that at the end of this conference, decisions to reinforce the ethics of the banking profession would emerge for greater performance and ultimately the general good of the country. On behalf of His Excellency, President Muhammad Buhari, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, I wish you all a fruitful and insightful deliberations. Thank you very much. Well, I've been asked to carry out the second assignment for today. And let me again say, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, once again, I wish to wish you, I wish to reemphasize that as bankers and fund managers, you are required to partner with government in its determined efforts to diversify the economy and reposition the country for a sustainable future. As noted in the short speech that I have just presented in the course of the program, putting the economy on the path of sustainable growth and development has been a priority of this administration. Therefore, the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria must work in conjunction with other relevant stakeholders in the financial system in pursuit of this valuable project. 
One, One thing you cannot take, take away from this administration is its resolve to lead millions of our people out of poverty. There is no doubt that from your role as an investment banker, as managers of unavoidable risks and, as, and advisors, you surely remain a strong link in the chain of wealth creation for the economy. It is in the light of this that I, on behalf of His Excellency, President Muhammad Buhari, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, declare this conference, this year's conference of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria open. I wish you successful deliberations. Thank you very much. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to give us one more minute, please. Can I have everyone in the front row please join us on stage? I'm also inviting past presidents. I am uh, inviting the deputy governor of the Central Bank, the national treasurer, CIBN, to join us, the registrar, CIBN. Now we are going to do this socially distanced, please. So, so madam, if we have, if we have you here, the idea is to have one person. Yes, we're going to have you in the middle, madam. So if you can come around this way. And let's try and maintain two feet apart at least. Can we please have you in the middle? So, so we're, we're going, going to ask the photographers, photographers and members, members of the press to uh, please take, take your, get, get your best angle so that no everyone shows properly. We're trying, trying to do it in a way that uh, does, does recognize, recognize social distancing. distancing. Now, now while this is happening, happening we do hope that those, those joining us virtually and Lagos House, House are, um, are with us this morning. morning and have been enjoying the conference so far. This is a, a photo up moment, but we're not winding down. We are still getting warmed up. We have a number of very interesting sessions that we'll be moving into a little later on. So um, please do stay tuned. We'll be going over to Lagos soon and uh, having a word with them. We'll also have those, those who are joining us virtually say a word or two in process. process. I think this, this works. I think it's really a testament to the resilience and indeed the vibrance of Nigeria's banking sector that uh, in spite of the pandemic, and post-pandemic, we have up to 3,000 people registering for this conference online. Up to 3,000 people. So if you're looking around the hall today or you're looking at the images online and you're wondering, okay, it looks a little bit scant. Well, you know what's going on. Don't be deceived. Over 3,000 are hooked in and involved in this conference fully right now. The theme for this year, 13th Annual Banking and Finance Conference is facilitating a sustainable future, the role of banking and finance. It has facilitated us up to now, and we're going to lean on it to take us into the future. And that's the theme for this, this year's conference. conference. Let's skip over, over to Lagos, Lagos now. now. If we, we can go, go over to Lagos. Lagos. Right, so we, we have, have 
Lagos on screen and ask the Chairman Logistics Committee, Mrs. Mojisola Bakare Asiru. Let's go to you now and uh, have a word or two. If you can join us, please. We do have Lagos on screen. Good, Good morning, morning, madam. All right, right. We, we, we can hear you, but it's, it's, it's rather faint. faint. So, so if at your, your end or our end, the volume can be increased. We're excited to be here to the Internal Banking and Finance Conference from Lagos, the Banker's House. Can you all say hello? We're excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. We hear you loud and clear. Thanks, Thanks so very much. much. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen we, we are moving, moving on. We'll, we'll soon, soon be coming to a tea break. break. The, the conference, conference has been declared open, open. So, so officially we're, we're in the business. business of our 13th Banking, Banking and Finance Conference. Conference. So, it's, it's been, been a very interesting morning by all standards. I'm, I'm sure that there will be no dissenting voices there. Tea is served. If you walk through this door to my right, or you go through the door at the back of the hall and walk to the right, tea is served. We will reconvene and start our first session at 11.50. That gives us roughly half an hour for our tea break. So if you'd like to walk through this door to my right, if you go through the doors at the back, it's, it's also to the right. right. You'll see where T is laid out, but do know that in 30 minutes time, we will, 30 minutes time, we will be reconvening and starting with our first session this morning. All right, I'm, I'm told, told that, that we, we will cut, cut it rather short, short. So, so we'll have 20 minutes for our tea break and reconvene at 11.50. We'll have 20 minutes for our tea break and reconvene at 11.50. When we come back, we will go straight into the business session this morning with session one. Now, session one is inclusive banking where we are and the way forward. Inclusive banking. May I crave the indulgence of delegates? Forward. I will be introducing the session chair, the speaker, and your panelists when we come back at 11.50.
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, still standing on all established protocol, can I ask you to please make your way back into the hall as uh, the tea break is over and we are about to continue with our program today. Can you please start to make your way back into the conference hall? We are about to commence and continue with today's program. Hello, Liz, can you hear me? Is, is that Lagos? This is Lagos. Yes, um, please stand by. Okay. Please stand by, you will hear me do an introduction and then, um, then you proceed. We are waiting for the hall to Fill that in again, again from the tea break. Okay, as well as in Lagos, we are still having them, 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 them. I didn't get that. Hello. 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 We're, We're getting, getting echo from, from your end, so if you. And uh, make, make sure, sure there's, there's nothing, nothing, no, no other, other, other electronic, electronic equipment close to your, your microphone. microphone. Are we good? Are we good? Are we good? Lagos, please stand by. We are waiting for people to come back into the hall from the tea break, and you will hear me introduce you. Ladies and gentlemen, please make your way back into the hall as we are about to continue with the program this morning. I'm calling, calling on all guests to please make their, their way back into the conference hall as we are about to proceed. I'm going, I'm going to, to allow, allow just five more minutes, minutes and, and then we will, will proceed this morning. Can, Can you please make, make your way back into the conference hall here in Abuja? Lagos, please stand by. We will take the, the, our keynote address and then a vote, vote of thanks. Then we will commence Session, session one, inclusive banking, banking where, where we are, and, and the way forward. Thank <laughs> you. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, can we take our seats, please? We are commencing with our program this morning. To give our keynote address this morning, before we move on to session one of our business session, inclusive banking, where we are and the way forward, can I ask you to join me in inviting Mr. Dr. Okechuku Enalama, former minister, federal minister of industry, trade and investment, and the chairman, African Capital Alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please confirm if you can hear me. Uh, Dr. Analema is joining us virtually. Uh, so uh, please do bear with us and settle down so as we can hear him nice and clear. If you come into the hall, please quietly take your seat. We are taking our keynote address. From, from Dr. Dr. Okechuku Enalama, former minister, minister Federal, Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and, and Investment, and Chairman, African Capital Alliance. Alliance. Doctor, Dr. over to you. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, and um, before I share my screen, let me thank you all for, you all for having, me this morning. having me this morning. Your Excellencies, Your Excellencies. His Excellency, the President, the President the represented, the President represented by, by Honorable Minister of Finance. Is the line clear from there? We can, we can hear, hear you loud and clear, clear doctor. doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. His Excellency, Excellency President Muhammad Buhari, Heavily represented by Honorable Minister of Finance, of Finance. the Senate President, Senate President. heavily represented the Governor of Lagos State, State. State. Honorable, Minister. Honorable, Minister. Honorable Minister, the Central Bank Governor, Central Bank Governor. the Deputy Governor, Mrs. Aisha, Aisha. the President, the and, President Chairman and Chairman of Council, of Council CIBM. CIBM, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity you for to the speak opportunity to you today. today. I congratulate I the leadership and organizers of the 13th Annual Banking, Banking, Banking and Finance, Finance Conference. And uh, with and your permission, I'll now share my screen to, um, to make uh, the presentation I have for us. Please confirm that you can see my screen. Um, we can, can see your screen, screen doctor. doctor. Nigeria, Nigeria, what it, it takes. takes. Excellent, excellent. So that is the theme of my presentation, which ties into the, 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 the theme of the conference, facilitating a suitable, a sustainable future, the role of banking and finance. So with your permission, I will go straight into the presentation. I know we've lost some time already. So uh, the, outline of, the outline of my presentation is that I, I've divided into four parts. I like to put things in context, in terms of the context of Nigeria, 
and then deal with what will it take to achieve this sustainable future of our dreams. And then I'll zero into the role of banking and conclude with some thoughts. But before I go into um, the context, I, I like to begin with the end in mind. Let's start with the vision you know, of Nigeria. Um, some of us will remember this, this um, lead article in Newsweek at the beginning of this year, where, where he basically said that Nigeria will be Africa's first true global power. It was a prediction in effect, sooner than you think. And many of us, if not all of us will agree that this is a good vision for Nigeria. Nigeria is the next superpower and Nigeria being Africa's true global player because Africa does need a global player. No other country has a better set of credentials or positioning, if we can get our act together, than Nigeria in terms of who can represent Africa in the Olympics or the Global League of Nations. And therefore, I think Newsweek caught the point when they had this um, lead article at the beginning of the year, despite the pandemic and all that has happened. But to achieve this vision, I do believe that there are at least four significant but not insurmountable obstacles to our greatness. You know, if we're going to achieve this vision, there are at least four obstacles we need to overcome. You know, the first one, which is obvious, because we talk about it all the time, but it just needs um, hand to handle it is infrastructure. You know, the reason I find infrastructure fascinating, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, is that infrastructure, if we get it right, will solve several problems in one go. It certainly will attract massive investments. It certainly will attract massive investments. It certainly will attract massive investments and create lots and lots of jobs. It will improve productivity, you know, in ways that are that are that, that, that will be quite um, significant. And certainly, infrastructure and enabling environment go hand in hand. You know, for those of us that pray, you could almost think of infrastructure as a prayer that answers other prayers. Some of us that are students of um, scripture will remember the prayer of Solomon where they said he asked for wisdom and that led to everything else that people desire. That's why I look at infrastructure. That if God or even we can an answer our own prayer of you know, infrastructure, honestly, it will make a huge difference. The question though is what stands in the way of this robust infrastructure? And if we tell ourselves the truth, you have to agree with me that by far the biggest challenge we face is the agency problem. The agency problem simply means that like, in trying to deal with the problem of infrastructure, probably in no other sector does it have as much issue as you see in, um, in, in infrastructure when it comes to the issue of corruption. You know, we have to face the agency problem if we are to solve the infrastructure problem because you know, the problem of agency means that we don't always address the problems we face in a way that you know, people are not um, getting ahead of themselves in terms of the general good. And like I point out on this slide, the problem of agency can be addressed if we face it squarely, you know, with incentives, you know, if there are adequate incentives and penalties for doing the right thing and penalties for doing the wrong thing, I do believe that we can address the agency problem. But the agency problem leads to the implementation gap, but it's not the only cause of the implementation gap. There's also the issue of, you know, competence, just who is the best, who is best able to deliver robust infrastructure. And then the other one is that infrastructure takes time. You know, we need time and therefore we need continuity. Every time you have these continuities, it does affect things that require time to, to take shape. If we get infrastructure right, I think what it will lead to is what we call enabling environment. In other words, our environment will be one that is easy to do business, one that, you know, where the economy can actually thrive. So against that background, let me then go into the context of Nigeria itself. Where is Nigeria today? I'm sure that there is nothing on this slide that will come as a surprise to, to, to our audience. You know, Nigeria, while it has evolved from an agriculture-based economy to one that is dominated by service in terms of the GDP, as you can see on the pie chart, is still largely a subsistence and survival economy. We're not flourishing. We're not punching at our weight or even uh, at the levels we can punch at. One indication of this is the industrial sector, the manufacturing sector, where it's still 9% of, of the GDP. You know, and you agree also that the over-reliance on oil is a problem, as we have seen in this um, situation we find ourselves in now. So there is a lot more that is needed when it comes to this central issue of creating jobs. You know, the way I like to think about it is that we can be propelled by adversity. You know, 
There is no question from the earlier presentations by the central bank governor, by the Honorable Minister of Finance, and by the, all the earlier presenters that we have faced a perfect storm in Nigeria. We have dealt a pandemic. We, we have faced a pandemic that is once in a century. The last one of its kind was, you know, um, was in 1918 or so. Uh, we've had the second oil price downturn in five years, and a recession looms, as we have been told. But history is replete with countries that were propelled by adversity to greatness. You know, examples include Germany, you know, after the Second World War, Japan, similarly after the Second World War, and of course, more recently, Singapore. You know, and of course, we can also talk about China. You know, that is what the Newsweek was talking about, that we could be the China of Africa. You know, so our view is that like, you know, there, there, there are rays of hope now. You know, it's almost as if out of this adversity, some things are beginning to change. You know, uh, the ease of doing business reforms will get a major boost from the new uh, legislation on Kama, Companies and Allied Matters um, Act that has just been passed, the revised one, the downstream deregulation could free up the petroleum sector. Of course, the petroleum industry bill is also in the works. And also the issue of power, as you know, and just having a cost reflective tariff is one that is, is incredibly important. The question therefore for us is that, could this be another chance, you know, to create the right ecosystem enabling environment to, to move Nigeria forward? And of course, what role can the banks play and the financial services sector? That's what we're dealing with today. That's what we want to focus on. But let me talk a bit about our demographics because when it comes to Nigeria, we agree that like, our demographics, our demographics, our population, and the and the makeup of that population is the biggest challenge we have, but it's also the biggest opportunity. Some people talk about the demographic dividend, you know, because of our population. But if you had to deal with one issue when it comes to demographics, it has to be the issue of jobs. If you look at the unemployment rate, particularly if you combine underemployment and unemployment, it's quite high, you know. Um, um, analysts tell us that we need at least 20 million jobs if Nigeria is to get to a place where you might call, you know, either full employment or, or acceptable employment levels. So we have 20 million jobs that need to be created and created, in, you know, fairly quickly. The question is, how, do, how are we going to do that? And I believe there are three levers that will help us do that. Not surprisingly, right at the top of that pyramid is infrastructure. But infrastructure will be heavily supported by technology and capital. I think those three levers taken together are necessary and sufficient to address our problems, particularly the job problem, the employment, unemployment issue, which is a, arguably the biggest issue we have as a country. Let me just um, look into those, these levers briefly before we go to some specific solutions. Talking about infrastructure and capital, the good news is that infrastructure and capital are mutually reinforcing. Personally, I believe that like, if we made the massive investments that are required to address our infrastructure, those investments, by definition, uh, will also be mobilizing the capital we need. You know, there's no question that the savings rate in Nigeria is low at 12% or less. Uh, the domestic investment rate is low at 23% of GDP. And the foreign direct investment has also come down quite a bit. Like the central bank governor told us, it's dried up even further from 2019 to like 1 billion or so in the last quarter or maybe the first quarter of this year. You know, and according to what we know from the Nigerian Integrated Infrastructure Master Plan, you know, we need upwards of $100 billion, you know, to meet our infrastructure gap. Some will argue you know, we need that annually. But even if we did that in five years, frankly, it would be game changing. The key is how do we move from talking about it to mobilizing the kind of capital that we need. And that's why I talk about the implementation gap and the agency problem that stifles implementation, which we need to address. But I have no doubt that, you know, if we are to take on this challenge, we can solve it. Let me talk briefly on technology. We all know that, and we have been told again today by the central bank governor and the minister of finance, that technology is an enabler. It's certainly the defining driver of the 21st century, you know, and it's one, one, one driver that can leapfrog, that can help us leapfrog stages of development, you know, and, if you look at the impact of technology, you know, you, you hear things like Apple as a company being um, having a market capitalization that is bigger than the FTSE 100 or the entire London Stock Exchange. That's quite mind boggling. You know, and if you come closer to home, financial services, there's no question that fintech and its emergence as an alternative payment system and even the digital currencies, which are now being recognized by our regulators, you know, are game changers. 
one thing I would like to point out is that if we if we harness technology and leverage technology enough, what we will find is that it will improve access to finance, as we know in banking sector. That's how you reach the unbanked. That's how you reach, you know, the people who are in the rural areas. It certainly will increase capital formation because there's lots of money outside the banking system, and ultimately it will lower the cost of finance. Therefore, there is every reason and every need to focus on technology as an enabler and as a catalyst. And I hope that um, we will do that. But the interesting thing about technology, again, this was pointed out in the earlier presentations, is that technology can be Nigeria's growth catalyst as well. If you look at the GDP and how it's, um, how it's changing, uh, it's being driven by ICT, as we were told earlier today. ICT is the largest contributor to Nigeria's GDP growth over the last two years. 58% of our growth from Q2 2018 to Q2 2020 has come from ICT, the ICT sector. And that is not counting the contribution um, as an enabler to other sectors, you know, like, like um, you know, whether it's uh, agriculture or healthcare or all the other sectors that also leverage technology. Therefore, we need to embrace technology. We need to accept technology as a new way to go. And certainly, it's the one thing that can help Nigeria leapfrog to where we want to go. So that also that all provides context to what will it take for Nigeria to emerge as Africa's giant and get into this sustainable growth that is our that is our dream and it's our vision, you know. And I would like to now uh, focus on that and just begin to talk solutions to get more specific on solutions. First, I'd like to remind us that whatever solutions we we'll come up with, you know, must embrace infrastructure, technology, and capital as the key levers. And the key problem we're trying to solve is to create lots and lots of jobs. As um, one of the US president, uh, presidential candidates of the past put it, is the economy is stupid, he said then. Here we'll see it's jobs, jobs, and more jobs that we need. But I would like to focus on five opportunity areas or five priority areas that if we were to address, frankly, we will create the jobs we're looking for. One has been talked about today, which is the agriculture and agro-allied sector leading to agro-allied industrialization. The second one is on education, particularly the kind of education that is in collaboration with industry and where government acts as a convener or as, as a, um, as, as, as a co-collaborator, as a collaborator, you know, just to create the jobs we need so that we're not just training people for training sake, but we're training them, you know, for work. And of course, the digital economy is the third area I'd like us to focus on. And then I'd like us to look at opening up new growth pools in the economy and, and new growth regions in the, in the country beyond Lagos and, and a few other places. Then finally, if we can embrace the partnership that can exist between the public and the private sectors, I believe we'll get, we'll get our act together. So this is a, um, um, an illustration of these five sectors that we've talked about. I'm going to go into them in more detail, so I'll just move on in the interest of time. The one point I'd like to make is that you'll find that in, in going into these five sectors or five priority areas, I do emphasize the importance of infrastructure, technology, and capital, because I believe that these three levers apply to all five opportunity areas. Infrastructure is a bedrock for industrialization, for trade, and for job creation. Technology is the key to productivity and innovation. And capital um, flows will facilitate a diversified and sustainable growth, which is the theme of this conference. Therefore, I believe that like, these three levers are the levers we need to unlock Nigeria's potential and create the shared prosperity that we deserve or that we, we aspire to. So with that, then let's go into the five opportunity areas, you know, just do a bit of a, um, a deeper dive into these five areas, starting with agro-allied led industrialization. This has clearly been a priority of this government and again, the central bank governor, you know, um, emphasized that in his address, you know. But the question is, why have we been slow to gain traction, even though we keep um, we keep putting up a lot of resources into it? And how can we deliver on this high priority area? My belief is that the solution lies in leveraging these three levers we talked about: infrastructure. If we can build industrial infrastructure, if we can build the special agro processing zones we've talked about for a long time, and you know, just rural roads and rural infrastructure to help farm to market access. I believe that like, you know, we'll begin to get the traction we look for. You know, technology of course is at the heart of all this. We have to leverage technology to do it. And the capital that is now flowing must be combined with private sector capital. 
we believe that while it is important to have these interventions from the government led by CBN and other, other parts of the government, the private sector, you know, some people at times call private capital smart capital just because it has more ownership and less of the agency problem. As you know, the agency problem has to do with this idea that like, you know, something that belongs to all of us belongs to nobody. And as much as we like to view government as, um, as, as, um, as a key source of capital, the problem to solve when it comes to things that government provides is the agency problem because it belongs to really the entire nation. That's the role of government. So the question is, how can we mobilize private sector capital and incentivize some of the big players, some of the you know, large scale agro processing players or investors to come and partner with us who have done it in other places. And this is something that I know the government is working on. And some of the policy direction is headed that way. What about education? Education, brother, education obviously is a big deal because if you look at what it takes to create jobs, Education is right at the heart of that. But it has to be the kind of robust education that is in partnership with industry, where government is also a collaborator. You know, even education as an investment in itself can lead to the upscaling of our labor force. It certainly can slow down population growth and lead to uh, help us address this uh, problem of out of school children, which, as you know, is a, is a major problem for Nigeria right now. You know, and I believe that, like, if we can implement this idea, of an education industry government collaboration. What do I mean by that? If you study countries like Germany and Switzerland, and I know that these are very advanced countries, but we can certainly learn from them because what they do is that they have this tripartite arrangement between industry, the training institutions and education, and the trade associations and also government, you know, coming together to just define the things that are needed in industry and then to work together to make sure that those things, uh, uh, those training needs are met by the training institutions. This is the major thrust of industrial policy. So when we talk about industrial policy, we need to focus on this. And I do believe that this will then begin to address the issue of vocational and technical education as well. You know, and it will build the 21st century educational infrastructure we need. Because when we talk about infrastructure, it's not just hard infrastructure, it's also soft infrastructure, skills, know-how, and the things that you need them. The other question we need to address is the issue of inclusion. As technology comes in more and more, how do we make sure that people are not left behind, people, particularly people in the rural areas or where people that are less tech savvy? This is something that I know that um, we also need to address. That then leads me to the, 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 the subject of digital economy. You know, how do we build a 21st century digital economy? If you have to do one thing, it has to be broadband, broadband access. And I know the ICT companies and operators are willing to do this. The question is, what is the problem? And the largest problem appears to be the regulatory bottlenecks in terms of right of ways, and you know, and just um, and just and you know, the cost of um, you know, what you might call uh, multiple tariffs and the cost of providing these things, because as you know, it's done at the state level at the at the various um, because if you want to get broadband to penetrate the entire country, then we're going to have to work with the states and work with even the local governments. You know, I, there's been a lot of talk around science parks and tech industry parks. I think we just need to move from talk to action. You know, when it comes to technology, because technology is global, the question is, how should Nigeria play technology? Can we identify some specialized areas where we can fit into the global digital system rather than trying to be all things to all people? And when it comes to capital mobilization for digital economy, while we are off to a good start because the tech ecosystem is attracting capital living from foreign investors, but much more needs to be done, particularly around industrial infrastructure, and around just you know what you might call broad-based capital investment in technology, which will go beyond you know fintech and some of these niche areas to cover the entire economy. What about the issue of geographic spread, which is the, fifth, the fourth area I want us to address? Geographic economic diversity. If you look at these countries that we we want we aspire to be like, whether it's countries like the United States or China, you know what you find interesting is that like different parts of the country are active in the economy in different ways. In a place like the US, you have the commercial uh, finance hub in around the you know, New York axis. You have the ICT hub around the California West Coast axis. Then you have agri uh, agriculture around the Midwest. In China, the different provinces are strong for different things. You know, we can do that in Nigeria. So if you look at you know, um, our food baskets in the, in, the, in the North and North Central areas, if you look at commerce in Lagos, as similar areas, you know, can diversify away in terms of industry 
to bring other parts of the, of, the, of the country into it, and ICT as well. The question is, we're going to need to embrace the next lever, which is this, um, this um, issue of infrastructure, technology, and capital. These three levers are needed because it is infrastructure that would help to diversify the economy in, geographically. And we have to leverage technology. And of course, it will require investment. So you find that these three levers are recurrent. And I believe that the banks and the financial services sector have been at the force, forefront when it comes to leveraging these factors. And I think the key is, and you, you, you are also better implementers, which is why I believe that like this is the appropriate platform and forum to be having this kind of dialogue, honestly. Because if the banks were to uh, accept a greater responsibility in this area, I think the country will benefit from it big time. Already you are doing a lot, but I think more can be done. Let me complete these um, five opportunity areas by talking a bit about the public-private partnership and collaboration. You know, there is no question that if we're going to solve the infrastructure problem, that government cannot do it alone. You know, what CBN is doing is welcome. The CBN is about to raise a massive infrastructure fund, and CBN certainly is better qualified than any institution in the country to do so. But I believe that as big as that and as ambitious as that effort is, it's not enough. You know, we're going to need, you know, the private sector to get involved. We're going to need other players to get involved. Which then leads to the question of what sort of incentives do we have to provide for the private sector players, including the banks and the financial sector, you know, to mobilize domestic capital. If you look at the pension fund industry that now has, um, you know, I think um, over 30 trillion, you know, in terms of the savings that they have made. You know, if you look at all those sectors, how can we make sure that some of that capital is going into, is going into infrastructure? You know, if you look at the money that is stranded in terms of dormant accounts with the banks, you know, is there a creative way to use it like they've done in places like, um, like the UK and, and Japan? You know, can we do something about that? You know, what about the role of banks specifically, which is why we are at this conference? You know, how can we support banks to support us to mobilize lots and lots of capital? Because that's what banks do. You know, they are, like somebody reminded me once, they are stuck in trade is capital. How can we make sure that they have more stock, more, more capital? That can be put to work. And this then gets into the role of policymakers and regulators. What sort of policies and regulation is needed that will not resort to micromanagement or stifling the players? You know, and then that leads to some questions which I'd like you to deliberate on as we go into the panel discussions. You know, and that, the, the questions revolve around what is the role of government? What should government do? You know, where, where should the government play? Where should the different tiers of government play? Where should the not subnational governments play? Where should we work with the states versus the federal government? And you know, where does the government need to collaborate with the private sector in a partnership? And where what are the areas that we should reserve for the private sector? These are things where we need to have a dialogue in a forum like the one we are in today and reach some agreements. Fortunately, you know, the banking sector has been at the forefront of public-private collaboration as you have in the Bankers Committee. And I'll return to this in my concluding thoughts. So let's now, with that, then go specifically into the role of banks. What should be the role of banking and the banking sector when it comes to creating this um, um, sustainable development and, and this making Nigeria the, 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 the giant of Africa as well as achieving the economy of our dreams? First is to look at where is banking today? You know, banking clearly like has been said earlier, and finance is an enabler of the wider economy. So it doesn't necessarily need to be very large, but it certainly is a catalyst. And as you know about catalysts, they tend to be smaller than what they're catalyzing, but they're very powerful because they make change happen. And that's where we look at the banking and the financial services sector. The combined, the combined financial services sector, including not just banks, but asset management insurance, it's about 3% of GDP. And banking sector assets uh, contribute uh, about 30% of GDP, just in terms of the quantum today for the two trillion. You know, but the key to keep in mind is that the banking system can be better supported to mobilize the investment that we need. That's really where the conference should be going and the, and the discussion should be going. The question is, how can we position the banking sector and the financial or finance sector to do more? And I would like us to really focus on that question. We know that the role of banks is really as, you know, intermediation, right? As intermediators or intermediaries. Banks play a major role in the mobilization of both domestic and international capital. But we're now interested in project finance, not just debt, you know, plain vanilla debt. And the reason is that like we need project finance to drive infrastructure. 
you know, and I believe that banks are probably as well positioned as any to do that. You know, we also need banks to play in this whole emerging continental free trade area agreement, because honestly, it's going to require a lot of capital, a lot of infrastructure, and a lot of change if Nigeria is going to be effective, and even if the whole agreement is going to be implemented in the right way. So I think the overall question is, can banks support the you know, stimulation of large, sustained, non-debt, non-recourse project finance capital for infrastructure. But like I said, infrastructure is the one thing that if we get right, will help, um, will help um, us achieve our dreams. Let me now begin to conclude with some thoughts. You know, my concluding thoughts are as follows. You know, if I had to focus on one thing, it would be collaboration. And it would be the power of partnership between government and the organized private sector, and even the broader private sector, and I would say the international community as well. And if you think about that, where is a better place to look for a case study than what you know, uh, is happening in the banking sector? You know, Of course, you have the central bank, and then you have the banks, which are essentially private sector players. You have the other financial services players as well. You know, Of course, at times, you meet under the platform of the Bankers Committee, or CIBN, as an industry association. But the important thing is that this is an example where this collaboration is actually happening. It may not be perfect. I'm sure there's a lot that can be done to improve it. But I do believe that now is the time to say, can we use this as a case study to learn from the experience and ask ourselves, how can other sectors learn from it? And secondly, what can we do to improve what we're doing? So to make sure that it's more, of, more, more catalyzing and more enabling and not in any way stifling. You know, of course, the objective that we're after is the power of cooperation, the power of public-private collaboration and partnership. As I close, permit me to borrow from a famous quote from Bill Clinton that says, of course, he applied it to the US, to America. I want to apply it to Nigeria. There is nothing wrong with Nigeria that cannot be cured by what is right with Nigeria. I can even say there is nothing wrong with our banking system or our, 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 our economy that cannot be cured by the players in our economy today of which the banks are chief of which the financial services sector is central. So I hope as you deliberate today that you will, uh, you will embrace this challenge of partnership, you will embrace this challenge of being a catalyst, you will embrace this challenge of being problem solvers, and that this will not be a talk shop. Already, even the way you've coped with this COVID um, crisis by you know, opening up multiple channels for engagement, from two meeting venues in Abuja and Lagos to all the people who are dialing in or, or who are tuning in virtually, it's actually very impressive. And I must say, I am personally, I'm, I'm impressed. And I want to say congratulations once more. Let me conclude with this slide, which is a vision of what Nigeria can be. And it was said by an objective independent player, Newsweek, said Nigeria you know, represents Africa's best hope. They predicted, like I said at the beginning, that frankly, if you are going to see a giant emerge from Africa, it's going to be Nigeria. And the question is, what will it take? Why can't we do it? And what must we do to do it? And I hope that like, as you go through your deliberations, you will come up with some solutions that when we, when we adopt them or when we take them on, will lead to results we are looking, uh, we are looking for. I like that quote. Nigeria will be Africa's first true global player sooner than you think. Take that as a motivation. For where there is a will, there is a way. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. wow. I, I, I think, think uh, uh, the, the applause evidence is that that was absolutely fantastic. fantastic. A keynote address from, from former Minister, Minister Federal, Federal Minister of Industry, Industry Trade and Investment and Chairman, Chairman African Capital Alliance, Dr. Okochuku Enalema, who um, I, I seconded because he joined us virtually and uh, still got the room to really, really respond. So that, that was great. great. Um, if, if you're waiting, waiting for us to move into the business session, session apologies. apologies. We did start slightly late, so running slightly late as well. Please do be on standby to begin the business session with session one, inclusive banking, where we are, and the way forward. Before I call for the vote of thanks, let me say very quickly that we would like to do a social experiment. experiment. Now, now, if, if you're, you're joining, joining us virtually, uh, for those here in the house in Abuja, and for our counterparts in Lagos, please do the following. Indulge us. Just whip out your phone, 
and, and take, take a, a selfie. selfie. Mm -hmm. All right? We, we want, want to, to impact globally, globally right, right now. now. We've, We've just, just finished speaking, speaking about the influence, influence that technology can have and how we can lean on technology going forward in the, in in fi in the financial sector. sector. Now, now we're going to put it to the test with a social experiment. experiment. Just, just bring out your phone, put it in, in selfie, selfie mode, mode and, and take, take a shot. shot. Now, now when, when you take, take that shot, shot please upload it. It, it could be on Twitter, Twitter Facebook, Instagram, Instagram whatever, whatever it is, but use the following hashtags. I would, I would like you to use the hashtag sustainable future and hashtag 2020 banking and finance conference. 2020 banking and finance conference. Start that, that simple. Your, your phone, a selfie, selfie upload, upload it on Instagram, Instagram Facebook, and Twitter, if, if you're on all three. Uh, if, you're if you're like me and, me and you're a dinosaur, dinosaur you, you might, might not be on all three. three. But anyone will do. Please don't, don't forget, forget the hashtag sustainable future and the hashtag 2020 banking and, and finance conference. conference. If everybody does this, it will be like stamping right across the globe because we have those registered for this from the, across the entire world right now, up to 3,000 people registered online and climbing. I would love for us to put that footprint out there. So please do indulge us. Right, while that's happening, can I invite, it's my privilege to invite the chairman Conference Planning Committee and, and the Managing Director, CEO, Ecobank Nigeria, Mr. Patrick Akinwonton, FCIB, to give a vote of thanks. It is me to give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Uh, my job is quite simple, direct, uh, to express a deep appreciation. Uh, first, to the pre His Excellency, the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammad Buhari, GCFR, who graciously uh, declared this conference open and was ably represented by the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Mrs. Zainab Shamshina Ahmed. I would also like to place on record and appreciate the goodwill message from Mr. Governor, Mr. Babajide Sanwolu, the Executive Governor of Lagos State, who joined us online on Zoom uh, to recognize the goodwill message delivered by the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Sustainable Development Goals, Princess Adejoke Oredoke Adefumire. I should place on record our appreciation to the representative of the Senate President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Senator Uba Sani, the Chairman of the Banking uh, committee of the Senate uh, to recognize and thank Otunda Femi Pedro, former Deputy Governor of Lagos State, to recognize and appreciate all the office holders, 
all the dignitaries, all the chief executives of banks, all our distinguished guests that have registered online from every part of the world, more than 3,000 of them, uh, to recognize the hosting, the effective hosting of this conference by our chief host, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefile, CON FCIB, on behalf of the President and Chairman of Council of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, Mr. Bayo Olubemi, FCIB, and the entire Council, including my colleagues on the Consultative Committee planning this conference to thank God for this opportunity of a hybrid conference which is groundbreaking in many respects and has allowed true inclusion in terms of the ability of everyone from every part of the world to participate globally on this critical subject where we look at how we facilitate sustainable future using technology and bringing all the players in the banking and finance sector to discuss with policymakers, the millennials, entrepreneurs, analysts, businessmen, today and tomorrow, towards placing Nigeria at the forefront of economic development in Africa. Just before I came on stage, we had the keynote speak speaker, Dr. Okechuku Enelama, do absolute justice to the subject matter, ending on a very positive note that there is nothing wrong about us that cannot be made right by what is good about us. And on that note, on behalf of my colleagues, I say a big thank you. This is the beginning. We have exciting panel discussions now kicking off. Food is served digitally. Drinks are served digitally. We urge you to stay safe as we stay safe Nigeria, stay safe sustainable banking and finance and go forward to make a difference for our country and the continent of Africa. Thank you very much. So here, here we, we go. go. We're, We're moving swiftly on to our very first session. Um, Lagos, I trust you are with us. Our session one is inclusive banking, where we are and the way forward. I will introduce our panelists. It gives me great pleasure because it's a privilege to invite the session chair this morning, Otumba Femi Pedro, FCIB, former Deputy Governor, Lagos State, and Chairman, Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency of Nigeria, Smedan. Please join us. We have our session chair. Now, now moving on, on to the session, session speaker who is joining us virtually this morning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adeshola 
Adeshola Adeduto, FCIB, Chief Executive Officer, First Bank of Nigeria. I would, I would also, also like, like to invite the, the panelists, panelists now. now. Starting, Starting with Dr. Uh, my, my, my apologies. apologies. Our, Our speaker, speaker, Dr. Adeshola Adeduton, is represented this morning by Executive, Executive Director, Public Sector Group, First Bank, Bank Abdullahi M. Ibrahim, please give him a round of applause. Apologies. Please. Our next panelist is Mr. Namdi Okonkwo, also joining us virtually. FCIB, Mr. Namdi Okonkwo, MD, CEO, Fidelity Bank PLC. A round, round of applause for him, please. Mr. Namdi Okongo, can you indicate that you are with us and can hear us clearly? All right, while we're waiting for that, I will move on to our next panelist, MD CEO, ASEAN Microfinance Bank, Mr. Taiwo. Joda, HCIB, MCIB. As, As I, I announce our panelists, please let's, let's encourage them with a round, round of applause. All right, let's, let's uh, here, here we, we go. go. We, we do, do have um, in, in Lagos, Mr. Taiwo Joda. And our last panelist, also in Lagos, is Mr. Ishiobase Momo, who is the Chief Technology Officer, Coronation Merchant Bank. Now, before we proceed, let me make a last call for the MD CEO, Fidelity Bank PLC, Mr. Namdi Okonkwo, FCIB. All right, we will proceed. I will hand over to... Hello. I believe I'm on this panel as well. All right. Dr. Jumoke Oduole, do forgive me. The Thanks. special advisor to the president on ease of doing business Federal Republic, Republic of Nigeria, Nigeria Dr. Dr. Jumoke Oduole, please welcome Dr. Oduole to the panel. So these, these are, are your panelists. panelists. I will now be handing over to the session chair, Otumba Femi Pedro, FCIB. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. The president, chairman of council, the man of the moment today. Let me quickly say congratulations. Uh, past, past presidents of the institutes, members of the governing board, council of the institute, the guest speaker representing our guest speaker, Abdullah Ibrahim, executive director of First Bank, the, the panelists, the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me formally welcome all of us to this first session of the 13th Annual Banking Conference. The topic of discussion today is inclusive banking, where we are and the way forward. This is uh, indeed a contemporary subject, matter of very topical relevance. I'm happy to be here today, and I'm also happy that the Institute have assembled an array of experts and technocrats to do justice to this subject matter, which to me is most relevant in contemporary banking of Nigeria today. I have here with me the guest speaker, 
Dr. Addison Ladi Duton, FCIB, MD of First Bank of Nigeria Limited, who is simply represented here today by Mr. Abdullah Ibrahim, Executive Director of Public Sector. I have no doubt that I will do justice to the subject matter. I know Mr. Ladi Duton very well, and I know that this particular subject is a very core in banking and very important to him as a banking professional. Uh, we are eager to hear him and listen to him exhaustively. And uh, we have uh, an array of uh, panelists. And this gentleman, all of them, or most of them I know personally. So I'm very, very sure that their contributions will be worthwhile today. I'm also eager to listen to them uh, this uh, particular topic, in fact, I said it is contemporary because we are talking about inclusion. In fact, that is the matter for today and into the future. Uh, we know that Nigeria is still very largely on the bank, and we know that we have deployed technology of late you know, to capture quite a lot of people outside the banking environment, and they have been brought in into the banking system. We still have a long way to go. So I expect this topic, I mean, this subject to open our eyes and uh, the guest speaker to be able to give us more insight to this subject matter. So without much ado, because the time is fast spent, let me invite Mr. Abdullah Ibrahim, Executive Director of Public Sector, First Bank of Nigeria Limited to talk to us on inclusive banking, which will also include financial inclusion, impact of the new normal, uh, impact assessment on government policies, fintech solutions, and agent banking. And of course, uh, there's also a new dimension to it, that is female empowerment initiatives in this subject matter of inclusion. So Mr. Abdullah Ibrahim, over to you. You have 30 minutes. minutes. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much uh, uh, Chairman. Um, with your permission, I would like to stand on the existing protocols. Uh, given that, that time, time is fast spent. spent. Um, I have, have a couple, couple of slides which I would, which I would like to share. share. I don't know whether the, the, the slides, slides are ready. So while we are working on that, um, I would like to say that, that the Chairman has already done the slide is ready. Yes, yes, okay, good. I'd like to say that the chairman has already done a very good summary of what I'll be presenting this afternoon around financial inclusion. The major you know, highlights of the presentation he has taken us through, which are financial inclusion, impacts you know, on the key government initiatives, the impact of uh, new normal, the fintech solutions for today and the future, and also agency banking, its impact on financial, on financial inclusion and economic uh, advancement. Now, it's important that, that we understand, you know, the concept of financial inclusion and why is it important and what are the benefits of financial inclusion both to the individuals and, you know, to the economy at large. Now, financial um, inclusion is defined, you know, generally, you know, as ability for individuals to access affordable financial products and services to meet their needs. So, so that, that is basically what financial inclusion is all about. Why is it important? Financial in, uh, inclusion is important because it enables individuals, you know, to grow. It enables individuals to meet, you know, financial needs. It enables them to save so as to expand, you know, their businesses and also fall back in times of need. It enables them to have access to credit so that they can grow their businesses and get, you know, new market into new markets and new product offerings. And, and all, all of this, this has multiplier effects, you know, on the global, uh, on the economy at large. So if we can go to the next slide, you know, it's important that we look at how, you know, you know, the, in the um, financial inclusion globally. It is it's worthy of note that global um, financial inclusion, you know, is prevalent in advanced economies, and therefore you see from this slide that. You know, regions in the Middle East, Africa, and parts of Latin America, you know, have 
lower financial inclusion, largely on account of education, poverty, poor infrastructure, and a number of other things. So if we go to the next slide, also, we'll see that a number of factors have been identified as being responsible for low financial inclusion or poor financial inclusion. One, One of which is you know, social, social exclusion. So people who you know, are not you know, gainfully employed you know, and, and do not have any steady means of income are bound to be you know, financially excluded. And those, and those who are also digitally disengaged, so those who cannot adapt to the rapid change in technology would also, are also bound to be you know, financially excluded. Same with those with uh, low literacy levels who are, you know, have low education and are not you know, adaptable. Those, again, are part of those who are likely to be you know, financially excluded. Same with those who you know, in the low income brackets, those who are you know, those with the low paid in Pay, you know, cash, cash in hand, hand jobs, jobs who are paid either daily rates or monthly rates, or on a monthly rate, rate, but in no formal manner. manner. And, and then, then convenience and access. access. So, so these are largely the main factors. There will be others, others but, but these have been identified to be the major factors, factors militating against you know, the growth of financial inclusion. Now, now if we go, go to the next slide, we try to look at financial inclusion in Nigeria, Nigeria to see you know, how, how we are faring you know, across the various uh, you know, political zones. zones. As we all know that there, there are six political, political zones. The, the highest financial inclusion or exclusion, exclusion that, that we have are in the, the Northwest and in the Northeast, with 62 and 54% uh, uh, respectively. You know, and, and then, then you know, we could also see that, that you know, Southwest you know, has the highest you know, in terms of financial inclusion, financial inclusion financially excluded in that region, about 17 or so percent. You know, followed, followed by, by South, South, South and then South East. East. So clearly there is room for growth and, and you know, this, this can, can be achieved through a number, number of things that we'll be discussing in the course of this uh, presentation. So, so if we can, can go, go to the next, next slide also, we would uh, we'll see what, what we have tried to do here to look at, at you, know, you know, know, the high prevalence, prevalence of financially excluded people in Nigeria, Nigeria has been directly linked to the, the general low level of income, income generation capacity and um, pervasive um, poverty, poverty levels, levels in the country, unfortunately. There are a number of initiatives aimed at addressing this, one, one of which is financial inclusion. So clearly, you know, know poverty, poverty and lower earnings, earnings you know, know are a, a key driver, driver of financial inclusion in Nigeria. Nigeria. I, had I had mentioned low literacy level. level. I, had I had mentioned the lack of valid identification documents. documents. So, so although there, there, have been, there has been some progress in, in that, that direction, direction which, which has allowed for sharing of you know, savings, savings accounts, accounts and, and therefore people who were financially excluded in the past for not, not being able to provide you know, acceptable means of identification can now have access to financial services. And, and then you know, insecurity also in some parts of the country has also been responsible for this because you know, banks in, in those areas have had to shut down and have also not you know, built new you know, Channels or outlets in that, in that, in that, that, that you know, so, and, and therefore, the consequence of that is also, you know, lower than, than you know, expected financial inclusion in, in that area. So, basically, these have been, you know, been the key drivers of financial inclusion in Nigeria. So, if we go to the next slide, we we'll see, we we'll see how, you know, the, 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 the number of the factors, you know, and the you know, the, to drive increased levels of financial inclusion and promote inclusive economic growth, government agencies and regulators have a, an important role to play. I did mention in part, you know, at the earlier part of this presentation that there is a need for collaboration between both government and the private sector and the regulators because at the end of the day, the overall economy is the main beneficiary of financial inclusion, apart from the individuals who would have been financially included. And therefore, there is need for education, improved literacy level is important for people to appreciate the need for financial inclusion and pursue it. Okay. It's important to also develop a unified database. So identity management system, INEC database, 
and all, all other databases, databases in the country should be harmonized and brought together so that, that banks can have a credible and an acceptable platform for identifying would be customers. That, that also is going, going to go a long, long way in, in helping financial uh, you know, inclusion. inclusion. And then, and then collaboration, collaboration with banks, banks and financial, financial service providers, providers. So, so fintechs, very, very important. And also regulatory policy initiatives from time to time, also, time. also very, very important. A number of interventions have uh, happened in the recent past. As you all know, you know, agency, agency banking, banking has been licensed as a new initiative that, that has gone a long way in driving financial inclusion. And I will see how, how it has been able to achieve that. that. So, so let's, let's go, go to the, the next slide, slide please. Very, very quickly. So, so again, this is talking about how government agencies, you know, and, 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 and banking regulators have come, come together, you know, to, to drive financial inclusion, including women empowerment. Because, because again, if you look at, you know, the statistics around financial inclusion, women also contribute a large chunk of the financial aid excluded. So, so some, some of these interventions, you know, of government and the regulators have gone a long way in driving, driving financial inclusion, and, and also, you know, know women empowerment, empowerment, which is a very, very important part of what we are focusing on. on. So, so if we go, go to the next slide, slide. The, next the next slide basically... Yes. So, so this, this is talking about, about the COVID-19, the new normal. normal. If, if we all look, look at how, how we are seated, seated. Last, last year, year if you were at this event, event you would have noted that the seating arrangement was like, like this. People were sitting next, next to each other. So, so this, this is becoming, becoming a new normal. This, this event, event is taking place concurrently in two venues. venues. Again, it's a sign of the new, no the new normal. normal. As, As financial, financial institutions, we have also had to look for ways of reaching our customers under this current, current situation, where we, you know, know, there's a limited number of people that, that can be allowed into bank branches, branches for a long, long time, there was lockdown, and, and people, people needed to have access to their funds. funds, they needed to continue to make payments, and, and therefore the banks had to come up with creative ways of driving, you know, know the, the adoption of other channels other than, than you know, know, the brick and mortar channels, channels that we are all used to. And, and therefore, we have seen a significant increase in the use of, of other electronic or digital channels, you know, by customers. customers. So, so a lot, a lot of a lot, lot is going on. So right now, customers, customers can open accounts remotely on their telephone. They, they can move money. They, they can receive payments. They can pay bills. bills they, they can do all, all of that. All on account of the new normal. normal. Life, Life has to go on, business has to continue, and, and therefore, you know, banks, banks have taken, you know, this, this opportunity to drive, you know, this product. And, and in the course of doing so, so financial, financial inclusion has also benefited significantly, you know, from, from this new normal, normal you know. So, so next slide. slide. Again, this, this is talking, talking about fintech solutions. solutions. How you know, know banks are partnering with fintech also, you know, you know and, and regulators to see how we can reach out to the underbanks under banks or the unbanks under banks using fintechs. There, there are, are so many fintechs today that are in the market, market that are offering a number of financial solutions that are being enjoyed, enjoyed you know, by, by the populace. Some, some do not, not some, some you know, citizens do not have formal bank accounts, accounts, but they, they have. You know, formal, formal they have relationships with these fintechs, and through, through the products and services that are offered by these fintechs, they are able to make payments, they are able to receive payments, they are able to do so many other things. things. They are able to buy insurance, and so on and so forth. So, again, fintechs, you know, have a major role to play, and they are actually playing their role in driving financial inclusion. So, if we go to the next slide, Talking, talking about, about agency banking. banking. So, so basically, basically, agency banking, agency banking is, a, a, you know, a system, system that enables other third parties, other than parties, other the banks, banks to, to provide financial bank services, you know, to the team of populace. So, so these services are not limited to cash in and cash out. 
they, they could, could involve payments, payments do payments, payments, payments you know, apart from transfers, you know, open an account, account you know, and, and so, so many, many other things. things. So, so those services, services are today available, available at close to 350,000 agents outside of banking halls, of the, the deposit money, money banks and, and other microfinance and other, you know, banking, banking institutions. So, so this, this has, has gone, gone a long, long way also in driving financial inclusion. And, and all, all these agents, close to 350,000 as we speak, are all, all over, over the country. country. They are in the 774 local, local governments. And, and the benefits, benefits of agency banking, banking are not far-fetched. They, they, are, they create an additional revenue stream for banks. banks. And, and for, for the agents, agents because, because the agents are usually either supermarkets, filling stations, whatever, pharmaceutical stores, or whatever. They already, they already have an existing business. business. So, so this, this being an, a bank, bank agent, agent you know, know, offers a new stream of income, income you know, for that business. business. You know, you it's know, also provides both direct, direct and indirect employment. employment. So, so we have 350,000 agents. agents. They, they also, also have, you know, know staff that, that work with them. them. So, so indirectly, you know, know the, the number, number which, which we we'll see, you know, in subsequent slides, slides is astronomical. So, so agency banking, banking, you know, is, know, is, is very, very important in driving financial inclusion. It's important in driving employment. It also, also helps to boost the credit rating of the, you know, of the, of the agent. So, so if we go, go to the, the next slide, we'll see how it has impacted, you know. know. So, so this is, you know, to show how, you know, the agents are spread across the length and breadth of this country. You know, so, so in, in, in the first, first bank, you know, our, our own agency, agency banking, banking is branded first, first money. money. We, we have over 70,000 agents of the 350,000 that are currently operating in Nigeria. Ours are in 772 out of 774 local governments, you know. And the, the network, network has processed over 364 million successful transactions, valued at over 7 trillion naira. Over 7 trillion naira. These are transactions that have been processed by agents outside of the bank. So you, you can, can see how important it has now become, become as, as a major channel of reaching out, you know, to bank, bank customers and you know, the underbanks, you know, population. Next, Next slide, please. please. Now, now, in, in addition, addition to, you know, to, to the volumes, volumes that, that we have seen, we have also seen the, you know, the, 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 the population, the number of people that, that have been gainfully employed on, on account of agency banking. banking. In, in first, first bank, bank this year alone, up until August, we have paid out over 10 billion naira as commissions to bank agents. Over 10 billion naira. That's a whopping sum of money. So, again, apart from the multiplier effect, apart from the overall benefits of the economy, the agents are also making a lot of money for themselves. So, the average, the average agent will make about 70,000. Some, Some make a lot, lot more than, than that. that. So, so clearly, it is a, a channel. It has become, become a channel that has, has, has proved to be very useful and, and will be, can, can be leveraged to, to drive financial, financial inclusion and economic advancement. Next, Next slide, please. Okay. So, so basically, basically, this is to show you some, some you know, typical you know, agents, agents and agent agent locations. locations. I'm, I'm sure, sure this picture, picture was taken before COVID, COVID because even, even the agents, agents do uh, social distancing and ensure that they're social distancing, social distancing when their customers come to transactions with them. them. Now, now, the, the other, other channel, channel is the USSD channel. That, that is the 894 hash. hash. It's, it's a very, very important, important channel for us because it's also another, another channel of reaching, you know, know the, the, the underbank population, population and, and especially those who have feature phones, phones who do not, not have smartphones, smartphones who, and therefore are not likely to be able to download, download you know, banking, banking applications. With this code, they, they can open an account, they can move money, money they, they can receive money, money they, they can make bill payments, payments and, and so many other, you know, financial, financial you know, services. 
As, As we, we speak, speak in First Bank, Bank today, we have, have over 10 million, million customers that are using the service. And, and what, what we process on a monthly basis via our USSD channel is about 270 billion naira every single month. And this is largely by the, by by the, the other bank. bank. And, and the, the average, average transaction you know, volume, volume is about, you know, on a monthly basis, about 80, 80 million. So basically, you know, if we go to the next slide, um, yes, this was what I was talking about, you know, 10.2 million customers, 270 billion process on USSD platform, that's an average of 80 million a month. Can we go to the next slide? Because of time. Okay. Now, there, there have been, been some challenges, challenges you know, this is very, you know, know very important banking channel, which is the agency banking, banking. as so enumerated, you know, on, on the slide. So, so in the adequate capital, capital, you know, for agents, even though not much capital is required, but you need to set up, you know, the cash, cash management is also an issue because at the time they are out of cash and their customers want cash, you know, in that way, knowledge of digital, uh, digital finance services. Network, network connectivity uh, is also an issue from, from time, time to time, so because it is heavily, the Asian network is heavily dependent on, you know, IT and uh, network infrastructure. So where that, that is down, it affects the quality of service. And then, you know, security, you know, perceived security risk, you know, because the agent locations, because the handling cash, you know, they are perceived to be, you know, but so far so good, we have not had any, any, you know, any incidents, you know, at any agents. The location on account of this. So, if we go, go to the, the next slide to conclude, this is a presentation. I'll say that uh, financial inclusion is a very important, you know, to us as a country. And you know, the better we get at it, it will have a direct impact on economic growth and advancement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please, for Mr. Abdullah Ibrahim. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Um, this, this is uh, a, a very, very robust presentation, presentation and, and I'm sure we've taken a lot out of uh, what he has told, told us. us. Uh, rather, rather than start, start to make comments, comments let, let me quickly jump into, into inviting our panelists to, to give their own viewpoints on what uh, Mr. Ibrahim, Ibrahim has just presented, presented to us. Uh, I, I hope, hope they are already standing by. The, the first, first person I will call is Dr. Jumoke Uduwole, the special advisor to Mr. President on ease of doing business. Uh, Dr. Jumoke Uduwole, over to you. You have five minutes to so give us your own insight into this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Excellency. I suspected you would do exactly that. <laughs> oh, you course, you just, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you very much for that excellent presentation, uh, the Executive Director of First Bank. Um, I think I'll just go straight into, um, because I have only five minutes. So for me, I work on ease of doing business. Financial inclusion is particularly important to MSMEs, we all know that they account for about 48% of GDP and about 84% of jobs in Nigeria are with MSMEs. So they're a very important demographic to us. Now we know And it's quite uh, concerning for an economy of our size and where we hope to go to. Uh, we also know that even those that are in the financial sector are on the bank largely they don't have access to credit and the presidential and Indian business environment council has spent time working on legislation for that with the um with the national assembly access to credit having the credit bureaus have a legal framework we worked on the credit reporting act in 2017 but coming back to more recent developments in financial inclusion efforts it was good to see, from where I stand, good to see the CBN uh, reduce charges in uh, December um, of 2019, reduce down, downwards the charges 
for ATMs and for electronic bank transfers. Uh, also seeing the reduction from the Finance Act of 2019 again in the, the threshold for stamp duties, or rather the increase to uh, 10,000 Naira uh, for stamp duties charges. Looking at the impact that we're hoping to have, basically to attract the bottom quadrant of the population into the financial sector, so to expand the pie. So we now have the billion light, uh, which will, will attempt to reduce the cost and burden of data collection as expected to boost financial inclusion. We have the national identity uh, number that's also going to be streamlined with the BVN, also to uh, overcome challenges of access. Um, the NCC is also working with this universal service provision fund to get uh, mobile network operators to go into the rural areas and, and create more service. Uh, the federal government also has worked with the National Social Investment Program to get a lot of people that were not, hitherto were not in the financial sector to at least get them BVNs, electronic purses, uh, bank accounts, and BOI, as you all know, has worked on the Jeep program. Uh, and we're expanding that, uh, uh, we're trying to De risk uh, to strengthen the BOI right now in the COVID response so that they can give more of a support to SMEs at this time. So these are all the things that have been going on in recent times towards financial inclusion. But where do we need improvement? Basically, I'll just say it like it is. I'm with the bankers today. If I was on another side, I would say, but let me just say I'm a former banker um, as well. There's weak collaboration. I just have to say it like please and, and have an appeal. Yes, you're a catalyst, but I'm here to represent the about 40 million Nigerians who are unbanked and what it means to them in their everyday lives. So we need to improve this collaboration. We need to make sure that the, the segment, uh, the market players and their regulators don't work in silos. We need the entire ecosystem to not be fragmented. We don't want policies working at cross purposes. If I take, for instance, because the earlier speaker mentioned it, the USSD banking services, uh, the charge uh, by, the, by the telcos is now definitely going to impact negatively on achieving the 20% exclusion target of the CBN for the end of this year, even COVID apart. And that's, like I said, 40 million people. They're extremely cost sensitive. Even 10 Naira is a lot to them. And none of us on this call can say that 10 Naira is a lot to us, but it's a lot to them. So I'll just make a plea that it's not either or, it's both the entire ecosystem, uh, the telcos, the banks, and all the other players. We have national security issues at stake. We have our economy at stake. We also Q4. Uh, 6.1% uh, reduction in our GDP. We all know what's going on across the country in terms of national security. So we really do need financial inclusion to be front and center. And I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to the banking community today and to make this plea to just, let's charge forward. It's not either or, let's just find a way and just make space for each other and compromise as other economies around the world have done. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Please give, give a round, round of applause. applause. Thank, Thank you for bringing a different perspective to this as it affects MSMEs uh, space. Uh, in in fact, the fact, fact that you mentioned, I hope uh, the MP of First Bank had you very clearly, that your charges on the USSD uh, is a major issue when it comes to national inclusion, particularly in the rural areas and the low-income community. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Wale. Uh, may I call on Mr. Nandi Okongo, FCIB, MDCEO, Fidelity Bank, PSC. Uh, Mr. Nandi Okongo. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Yeah, um, yeah. I take your permission to stand on existing protocol. My name is Martin Sizuwe. I'm representing the MDC of Fidelity Bank. I'm sorry I came in late, but not 
that uh, I did it on purpose, there was a bit of a technical challenge, you know, by the organizers. I was actually there when it started, but not on the right platform. Sorry about that, sir. No problem. Okay, so I, I listened to the conversation that has taken, or the presentation done so far, and um, interestingly, this is one issue that banks have been grappling with, and I can tell you that all the Nigerian banks are in it and they're actually interested in driving this financial inclusion. Now, taking a cue from the presentation, there are a few things that we need to point to. Uh, one of them is actually taking off from where the last speaker stopped in terms of collaboration. And that actually speaks to government. There are some interventions that we have seen in this government that will actually help to drive financial inclusion. But whether that is done is a different matter altogether. Okay, so we all know about the end power. We know about the conditional cash transfer. And then lately, we, we hear about the special works program handled by the Ministry of Labor. I think that these are very possible means through which these individuals that are excluded can actually be brought in. So that collaboration and not working in silos, you know, is what I'm actually speaking to. That it is important that when some of these initiatives, you know, comes in, so we just have to look at the facilities available, the structure we have in place, leverage on them, and be able to uh, do the kind of thing that we want to do. The second point, you know, during the presentation by the lead president, the MD of uh, First Bank, represented by the ED, I saw something there about security. The truth of the matter is that we have two levels of security that we have to contend with under the present dispensation. I think you mentioned about physical security, talking about a particular uh, segment of the country or part of the country. But I can tell you that there's also the issue of a cyber security, which is real. When we talk about using digital means to drive financial inclusion, we all know that what is happening in the IT space, in the cyber space, is actually scary. So we have people doing phishing, then even talking about uh, using the uh, USSD, you know, to carry out transaction. We also need to be sure that the right campaign awareness is created, you know, so that we don't create fear or allow these people that we're trying to bring into the financial system, you know, to run away out of fear. Because you will hear people call on the, on the phone asking you one, get, trying to get one information or the other. If the person is not aware, He's likely going to give that information. And if you just get somebody on board there, and the next thing he sees is fraud, of course, you will not be there in that community when we begin to spread the news that this is not the way to go. So I think there is need for proper awareness education with respect to cybersecurity, because it's also another problem that is uh, threatening the very existence of uh, financial services. But of course, there is none of this cannot be handled if adequate measures you know, are put in place. Then we, there's also the need to collaborate, like I mentioned earlier. There are startups that are coming up with solutions that can help us deal with some of the challenges that we are contending with. We talk about having a consolidated database where you have identity of people so that it becomes very easy. But we have seen startups doing um, identity management and verification. We have one or two, I can specifically mention, I don't work for them, but of course, they've. from what I've seen, they've done, these are organizations that we can work with to help us deal with this problem, verify me, you know, for example. So these are institutions that many people may not even know what they are doing, but of course, if you partner with them and get into what they are, uh, they are doing, you probably see that this problem of identification, you know, can actually be dealt with. The last comment here, so that I don't exceed the five minutes given, is also taking advantage of the asset and resources that uh, that we have available. When we talk about access points, you know, talking about like 500 as a target for this year, I keep wondering, Nigerian Postal Service, for example, knowing where they are, it is not about Nipos being in Victoria Island or somewhere in Abuja. Even in my village that is very remote, there is a Nipos there. So if you talk about leveraging on what is already existing in terms of access point. I think there is need for proper collaboration with this is a government agency that should be able to provide a platform for us to be able to reach out to, to these uh, individuals 
you know, that have been excluded in the financial services sector. I said, let me leave it at that point, then maybe I'll have the opportunity to come back again. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Martins, Martins and uh, I appreciate uh, the different perspective again. And uh, I just also want to re-emphasize the point you made on security. Uh, knowing very well that most of the people we are talking about are not very digitally literate. And uh, a lot of other people can, can take advantage of that. that. But if I will talk about USSD and, USSD and some other technology solutions to, to, to be able to, to reach out, out particularly, particularly to customers in the rural areas. areas. So, so I know, I hope uh, the bankers are taking note of this. We need, we need to strengthen our security infrastructure to, to protect the customers, particularly those who are not very, very literate digitally. Let, Let me quickly call on Mr. Saiwo Joda, uh, MDCEO of ASEAN Microfinance Bank, uh, one, one of our panelists, to give us another insight into this subject matter. Mr. Mr. Saiwo Joda, over to you, you have five minutes. minutes. I think, I think you need, need the volume. 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 Thank you very much and good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Let me 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 uh, what are the reasons for this, and how can we bridge the gap? Especially when you look at it from the microfinance ecosystem. And um, I, I like to give two broad categories, and that is um, one is affordability, the other is the institutional exclusion. And I think institutional inclusion constitutes a significant reason why why it's a number of those who are financially excluded have not really, are not being banked at the moment. And what do I mean by institutional exclusion? So we have issues of irregular income, unemployment. Um, we have issues where some organizations still pay their staff in cash instead of making transfers to banks. Salaries are still paid in cash, and these people just prefer to hold it and spend the cash. And the unemployed says, anyway, I don't need a reason for a banking service. Uh, you also have the, the cases of it is expensive to have um, a bank account. And um, we're talking about digital at the moment. And um, a, a cost free look at what is happening still shows that digital is very expensive in Nigeria, especially the cost of data. Thank God for USSD, but the efficiency of USSD is also reduced to payment transactions. If you want to do a little more, then you need to have data on your phone. Um, some countries have been compared to Nigeria um, in terms of financial inclusion. We have the likes of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Thailand, and we have Nigeria. But on top of it, if you compare the cost of one gigabyte of data, one gigabyte of data in India is nine cents. In Nigeria, it's about a dollar twenty-five cents. In the other places, it ranges between sixty-nine cents to seventy-one cents. So, even that cost, I mean, a lot of MTOs have come up with um, reasons um, why this is so, bordering on infrastructure, bordering on the number of usage. But it doesn't take out the fact that um, to drive digital, uh, to drive financial exclusion, on a digital platform, then data is also a critical thing to look at. Then, of course, I talk about the institutional exclusion. Banks are too far. I cannot read. The, uh, we've mentioned financial literacy. We've also talked about digital literacy. Um, a lot of people come too much documentation when you want to open accounts. Um, and I'm happy what CBN has done with the tier one, tier two, tier three accounts. Well, the microfinance customer wants to take a loan, 
or 50,000, 200,000, whatever loan you have to take, you have to fill, fill some documentation and to step back or balk at the idea of trying to drive financial inclusion. So you see a lot of, a lot of them driving the informal sector rather than the formal position of it. Of course, there's also the attitude and perception of those who are financially excluded. And of, when, when you look at that, and uh, some people just say, I prefer cash. Um, I was in Kano last week. I still went to the single market and I see people bring out cash from under the praying mats, huge amount of cash. They still want, they still transact cash. There's still huge volume of cash that is moving around. And we need to look at a way of curing this attitude if we must drive financial inclusion. And um, for no reason, some people just say, look, I prefer to hold cash. I, I want to hold cash, of course. We still see people spray a lot in parties. Um, for that reason, to want to hold cash. So if you look at it, um, a lot has been done. Um, they have stated that for the Southwest, the South, South and Southeast, the projection of the government on financial inclusion for 29, but not so for the North Central and, and, and the North East. So we need to focus more uh, also in area, on areas where we need to drive more purpose in driving financial inclusion. Um, the other bit of it that has not been mentioned that it relates to the microfinance bank is liquidity. Um, between um, 1996 and 2018, the volume of loan from the deposit money banks, which is a critical supplier of liquidity to the microfinance sector, grew barely from 0.6% to 1.3%. Meanwhile, loans made available to SMEs dropped from 24% to 1.3%. And so you see a shift in focus to light ticket transactions rather than the um, very little ones. And, and there's huge opportunity. If we talk about 60 million Nigerians or 59, 60 million Nigerians that are excluded, you can imagine the aggregation of this, the catalyst that will form for economic growth if we are able to ring fence and bring them into the ecosystem. And of course, um, we, we, we have different nominations. We call them the poor, but potentially productive. We call them the bottom of the pyramid. We call them the economically active, but they are poor. But the important thing is that they do economic activities. And if access to finance is created, the government also becomes a winner in the essence that you create a larger tax bra bracket and you're able to bring a lot more people who are productive even into this um, um, tax bucket. And at the end of the day, the economy benefits from it. Uh, I will pause here for my five minutes and uh, I hope I'll have the opportunity to make some other contributions later. Thank you. New insights. Uh, we still have, have a long way to go. And I'm, I'm happy that you are a CEO of the microfinance bank. bank. That industry or that, that subsector is the greatest tool we have today to improve on financial inclusion. But that's why you are micro. You are supposed to reach out to the micro segment of uh, the financial services industry. And I'm happy you brought out an important point. Credit from, from the, the main banking, banking sector to the microfinance sector is very, very low. And, and that is the main source of liquidity for you to service the low-income MSMEs and the unbanked. So I really want to see a stronger and better collaboration between the main banking sector and the microfinance sector. It's indeed very, uh, very critical. When, when we are talking about financial inclusion, we cannot but pay attention to the microfinance sector. Yes, it's new and it's growing very fast, fast, but they need a lot of support. 
if you want to improve the financial inclusion we have today, we want to reach so many on bank Nigerians in many parts of the country, uh, particularly in the northeast, the south, south, and so many areas, in the rural areas, we need to be able to support the microfinance sector. Thank you very much. Finally, let me quickly call on Mr. Etiobase Momo, the Chief Technology Officer for Coronation National Bank, uh, uh, the last person, but not the least, panelist here today, to give us his own insight into this subject. Mr. Mr. Momo, over to you. You have five, five minutes. minutes. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, what, what I would really say is that, you know, from where I see it from a technology standpoint, it's very clear that technology has um, been a significant enabler of driving financial inclusion in Nigeria. Uh, but if I want to define financial inclusion, and I think this is where um, we need to look at about reaching the unbanked and on the banked. But I look at it more as enhancing the financial health of the Nigerian citizen. So the question is, if I have reached the underbanked or on the um, or the unbanked, the question is, how well am I providing this product such that I am giving these citizens a chance to have a sustainable future? Am I just providing products such that I can gain some revenue and then I can be seen as um, a profitable organization? I think the answer should be no. We need to look at enhancing the financial health of our citizens. Now, um, another part I would need to talk about is based on a recent survey that was done in Kenya. It's, it's already clear that um, Kenya was like the reference point when we started this whole journey about financial income. And in Kenya, it was seen that you know, 90% of the adults today have mobile phones, but 60% of adults have access to electricity, which is very interesting. It just tells you now that the advent of mobile phones um, has now become a basic necessity. So you can say food, shelter, shelter, clothing, and a mobile phone. That's where we are going to now. And the fact that you know, a number of Nigerians have already begun to adopt this technology without knowing the power behind what they have. You know, it creates a large, a big opportunity for us, you know, in the financial ecosystem to create products that are driven, you know, to enabling these people have access to services. Now, today, we only talk about payments. We talk about transfers but we've not really seen much in the space of loans. We've not seen much in the space of um, insurance. We've not seen um, pensions. These are areas we have to start building platforms uh, to, to ensure that we can reach out to these people. Yes, these people can transfer, but if we are not able to provide platforms that will enable them access these kinds of facilities without necessarily contacting the banks, which they are far away from, then we, we, we still have a long way to go. But today, what are people doing? If we look at what financial um, organizations are doing, we have three uh, areas. One, we have financial institutions coming up with you know, digital platforms that are aimed at reaching the unbanked and underbanked. We also have cases where um, financial institutions are partnering with fintechs to provide these products. And then you also have a case where Fintechs are also coming into the space. Now, these three are happening, but they are happening in a way, in silos. Where should we collaborate? And I think that's the essence of what we've been talking about. There's a need for a collaboration between all these parties in the ecosystem, you know, to come up with platforms that will reach these underbanked um, individuals. The more we do these things in silos, the more we create problems. Now, let me mention one part I think that has not been mentioned um, because of time, and that's the area of pricing. Now, today, you have banks that provide these services, agency banking, at a price. But guess what? You can have a fintech come up tomorrow and, and say, I want to provide this service. 
Now, the regulator has placed a cap, but there's no minimum. So it means I can come tomorrow and say, if the price is 100 Naira, I can come in at 30 Naira, and I drive all the agents to myself. And then when my revenue grows, and because I am not really mature, something happens to my organization. Then what I've done is I've basically collapsed the whole industry. So it's very important that we provide a level playing ground, especially from the regulator point of view, for, every, for a healthy competition between all the parties. It's very important. Another area I would just mention is the part of product definition. And I'm saying this from a technology standpoint. You have people rolling out so many platforms that eventually go obsolete. And that's because you don't have effective collaboration between the fintechs and the product teams of banks, microfinance banks, you know, and the likes. And that's why you come up with products that do not really bring about the overall customer experience. Because in this whole thing, I feel we are not even looking into the customer experience part. It's very important to note that up, as part of the underbanks um, population, you have the youth. There are a number of youth or teenagers in Nigeria today that just choose not to bank. And it's not because they cannot afford these services. It's because we've not provided platforms that appeal to the kind of experience they like to see. So it's very important from a technology standpoint that we find a way you know, to collaborate such that these people can actually benefit from, you know, what we are trying uh, to achieve. Um, at this point, I would pause here. And um, in the event that any other discussion comes up as it relates to technology, we can also talk about it. Thank you very much. collaboration among the players in the ecosystem. Collaboration certainly will strengthen performance and will improve inclusion. So I want us to take a very valid note on that. And while we are talking about collaboration, I even want collaboration to extend beyond the players in the financial ecosystem. Government also has a role to play. There are a lot of government agencies who have data and information about potential customers of banks in five long areas in Nigeria. All we need to do is put all these things together and we'll be able to tap into it. Let me quickly mention one. I'm chairman of Smedan Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency of Nigeria. We are presently doing a national mass registration of small businesses in Nigeria. We know statistically we have over 40 million small businesses. But, but there is no data, data anywhere, anywhere in Nigeria that, that can pick and be able to say that, that this is how many number of textile manufacturers we have, how many people are in trading, how many are in construction, where they have geographical location. That's, That's what we're, we're doing. doing. And when, when this database, database is completed, completed, it will be very, very useful in expanding the space when we're, we're talking about financial, financial inclusion. I want, I want to say a situation where banks, banks will have access to this data. When, when they, they are dealing, dealing with new customers, customers or existing customers, we want to check, you know, what, what information government has about them. And, and this has nothing to, to do with tax. It's just, just primarily, I mean, preliminary information that can be useful and tapped into. into. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Momon. At, at this point, we are at the point of questions and comments by our participants from all over the world and those who are here presently. Um, Mr. Mr. Moderator, MC, MC, I don't know how you are going to moderate this. Uh, we, we have, have a system. system. Are able to, um, I'm, I'm just, just going, going to remind yeah, uh, that um, the, 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 the Q&A icon, icon on your screen, okay. this, this is what, what you should use for questions. questions. I understand we're already getting some engagement. Um, so, so just, just use that. that. All, All you need to do is to click, click on it. And, and if, if you do want, want to raise a question, question there's also a raising hand facility there that, that you can use. There's also the chat box that's available if you have any technical support issues. 
while that is going on. on. So, okay, uh, for those who are here physically, let, let's give them uh, the privilege of asking the first question or making the first comment. Anybody in the house, house wish to make, make a comment on this subject matter or add value or ask questions? Yes, yes, please. Please, please make, make it quick, quick identify, identify yourself. yourself. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. My, My name, name is Roger Zwoke. I play in the microfinance space. space. Um, I, I want, want to briefly comment on the issue of financial inclusion for the role of microfinance banks in the country. In December 2005, we launched the microfinance policy. The thinking, I believe, was to drive financial inclusion through a, an alignment, through a linkage program between commercial, commercial banks, banks and microfinance banks. banks. That has, has been abandoned. And my, my colleague, Kai Wojoda, raised the issue of access to credit. If every citizen of Nigeria can save money in commercial, commercial banks, no matter how little it is. And, and if anybody, anybody wants to save money today, even those, those in the rural areas, areas they are told to, to go to the commercial banks because they are bigger and stronger. So. The first, the first banks, banks, the big, strong, reliable union banks, banks all the commercial banks have products that attract the smallest savings products when, when it comes to the liability side of the balance sheet. But when, when these same people want money, money they, they told them to go to the microfinance banks. The, the question, question is, where is the liquidity? The worsening part is that even, even the intervention funds the central, central bank of not today told us that they have increased the intervention, the COVID-19 from 50 billion to 100 billion. But even that is being disbursed through National Microfinance Bank alone. My comment sir, is that we should empower the microfinance banks. Mr. Chairman, you have said it. That is the strongest tool for financial inclusion in Nigeria. Thank you, sir. Thank, 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 thank you very, very much. much. Let, Let me quickly say something about like this. Um, it's, it's a two-way two traffic. traffic. Um, first, first of all, all the microfinance bank, bank needs to strengthen themselves, themselves competency-wise and capital-wise, to, to position themselves in such a way that, that they can play this role very well. well. You, know, you know, the bottom, bottom line, again, is credit strength. strength. Uh, but but a, a bank which to extend facilities a microfinance bank, bank but, but the bank, bank also has, has to protect, protect itself. How it safe is this credit to the microfinance bank? bank? If it, it does, does not meet all the criteria, it's an issue. issue. That's, That's number one. one. The second one, one is that, again, the CIBN used to need to, to also focus not, not only on, on the traditional, traditional banks, but, but also the microfinance banks. banks. You, you need, need to help them as a lobby group. group. The, the point you raise, raise is very valid. valid. Uh, the CBN governor, governor came here today and said that, that the COVID intervention fund was extended from 50 billion to 100 billion naira. 69 billion of it has been disbursed, and all this is disbursed through only one microfinance bank. And we are there are microfinance banks all over the country that can reach all segments and all aspects. So this is the kind of thing that I would want the institute to play a role in convincing the central bank. To so extend this facility not to, to one microfinance bank, bank but, but to several. And it made a valid point. point. There, there are two sides, sides of the balance sheet, sheet the liability side, side and the asset side. side. The, the saver wants, wants to go to the institution that are really safe to it, it. So, so it goes, goes to the traditional, traditional bank. bank. But, but when, when it comes to borrowing or taking loans and facilities, facilities they, they come to the, the microfinance bank. bank. The microfinance the bank are able to meet their needs because, because they don't have the resources to meet their needs. They are saving goes, goes to the traditional, traditional banks. banks. So there is, there is a gap there. Yeah, we need to find a way to, to close this gap. gap. Maybe the institute we need to maybe organize something to strengthen the microfinance bank. Maybe the next step, step is to focus on them and see how we can, can bring them up to par so that, that they can play that role, role of, of driving financial inclusion in our financial system. system. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Uh, with, with, with your, your permission, Chair, Chair, I do see another, another hand up, up in the room. We'll take one, one more question from here, then we were going virtual, and we'll have a question coming from, from Lagos. Lagos. Sir, Sir, if you can please um, approach my microphone. Thank, 
Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my, my name is Mohamed Suleiman, um, the Director of Financial, Financial System, System uh, Strategy at FSS 2020 uh, Central Bank of Nigeria. Nigeria. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to respond to Jadimah's uh, uh, submission, uh, alluding that, that um, uh, the Central Bank, Bank uses only one macro finance, finance bank, bank, that is the Nassau Macro Finance Bank, for the enforcement of uh, COVID uh, intervention. Um, uh, it might interest you to note that uh, at the beginning, uh, we're looking at a 9% interest rate uh, for such interventions, and then the central bank government will receive 5%. Now, the question is this, how many microfinance banks in Nigeria are willing to participate in that uh, intervention, extending the credit at 5%? Because uh, recovery is uh, on there to do. So most of them think it, it doesn't pay uh, to, 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 to participate so, 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 I mean, I mean it's, it's not because, because central bank doesn't want to use them, them but because, because a lot of them are not willing uh, to participate uh, in, in such intervention, intervention extending the credit at 5%. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank, thank, you, thank, thank you, you very much. much. We will we'll take, take note of, of that. that. Uh, we will we'll not debate, debate it, but um, I, 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 I just, uh, Director, uh, I just want to take this issue back. It's very important. In spite of the point you have raised, we should make concerted efforts to involve them. If one microfinance bank can do it, I'm sure there have been several, several others too around the country can do it. And it will make them stronger. And they will be able to play this role of national inclusion. Please, more questions from... All right, we have um, a question in Lagos. Lagos, please stand by. I'm going to go to this one, which we have received online virtually. It comes from... Olaro Timi Ajani, and he says, talking about financial inclusion and ease of doing business, the situation where CAC imposes a minimum of 20 million authorized shares as set by SEC for finance company as precondition before a small MFI doing business with as low as 1 million naira could be allowed to register is a serious issue and might serve as a discouragement to, to driving financial, financial inclusion. inclusion. Honestly, Honestly, I don't understand that question. Can you repeat it again? Let, let, let me take, take it again. It, it says, talking about financial inclusion and an ease of doing business, the situation where CAC imposes a minimum of 20 million authorized shares as set by SEC for a finance company as precondition before a small MFI doing business with as low as, as, low as 1 million naira could be allowed to register is a serious issue and might serve as a discouragement to driving financial inclusion. Okay, okay thank, thank you very much. You're talking about finance companies and the minimum capital required, which is an impediment to driving financial inclusion. That's right. Yes. Um, well, I mean, from my own perspective, Finance companies are not, a, are not major players in this matter. Finance companies are really more like wholesale financiers of projects and deals. They are not microfinance banks, so they are very different. So I don't really see an impediment there. Yeah. The fact that you have to be well capitalized to play in that field is because you are taking more risk ventures. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, I want shop business, business. don't have branches. Do you, Do you know, know any finance, finance company in Nigeria that has branches, branches in the rural areas? They, they mostly operate in the this thing. thing. And uh, let, let me just, just quickly say something. something. Uh, Kama has, has just been uh, amended. amended. And uh, Kama has now made it a lot easier for micro businesses to, to register their, their business with the Corporate Affairs Commission. commission. You can, you can even have one director, one shareholder, and have a limited liability company. company. Before, Before it used to be extremely difficult. You don't, don't need to have a company secretary. secretary. You don't, don't need to have a, a registered auditor to, to be able to have a limited liability company. company. So, so it's, it's part, part of the ease of doing business, business. And, and it will also aid in this inclusion, inclusion we're talking about. about. We want to open a corporate account you are asked to provide your certificate of incorporation. If you are a very small company somewhere in Nungiru, before the amendment of Kama, it's very difficult for you to do. But now it's a lot, a lot easier.
All right. All right. Alaruti, I hope that answered your question. Let's, Let's go, go to Lagos, Lagos now, now, where I understand, understand we have a question standing by. by. Can, Can you go, go ahead, please? We understand, we understand you have a question coming from, from Banker's House in Lagos. You, you have, have the floor. floor. All right, so, so while, while we're waiting for Lagos, Lagos where, where we understand the question was coming from, if there are any other questions here in Abuja, um, we'll take them. If not, Chair, I'll hand back to you. My name is uh, Wumi Adini um, from Lagos. Um, the issue was raised during the presentation by the lead speaker, talking about the uh, confidence of people within on the industry. And I think major issue, and somebody also said that for um, financial include, financially excluded people to be financially included, they must have access to funds. And major issue about that, that they have to fill a long range of forms before they are uh, they are granted facility. I think major issue is the identity issue we have. Yes, Mrs. Um, Dr. Mrs. Udu Ali said um, there is an integration between the BVN and the NIMC, the national identity. But this has not come to real effect. If we have a proper identification process, uh, a pro proper identification platform, then the issue of KYC and CDD will be um, extremely made easy. And then financial institutions will have confidence in granting um, people loans. The second issue is about the strength of the microfinance banks. Um, at a point, we had almost 1,800 microfinance banks, and suddenly, they were disappearing one after the other. I think that will also create the issue of confidence. I, I, I think the industry, um, um, what else do we do that we have to strengthen this um, area of our financial services industry? And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim, do you want to make a comment, make a comment on any of this issue? Well, <clears throat> what, what I'll say here is that, that um, in terms, terms of uh, financial inclusion, collaboration, Nigeria stands at a very good chance of an accelerated financial inclusion um, effort or initiative. If you look at the NCC data, we have about 198.9 million active lines as of July 2020. Mm. So, so that, that itself tells you that our people are ready because there are more active lines than the bank accounts. And, and therefore, that gap, gap can quickly be closed. And, and by so doing, financial inclusion can be enhanced. So it's, you know, it's something that can be done. And that I think, I think we should set up ourselves as a nation very aggressive targets so that, that we can attain that, that desired level of inclusion, which would enable, enable us to begin to see the rapid economic transformation that we are aspiring for. Thank, Thank you very, very much. That's, That's a very good point. point. May, May I ask uh, any of the panelists we wish to add, uh, make, make additional, additional comments? comments or respond to some of the questions already asked. Any of our panelists wish to make any additional? Okay, um, okay. this time will. Okay, I might just say one or two things on collaboration, uh, especially okay. with the fintech companies. Uh, from my perspective, um, I think we're actually collaborating at the moment is to take it to the next level. So let me so, give an example. You cannot do with a fintech of me without having a bank account anyway. So the first thing they ask for is your account number and your BVN number to be able to transact business with them. So it means they need the bank and the bank needs them. 
and what you need to what we need to drive is to leverage on the customer centricity of the fintech companies um, to improve on our services to improve on the deliverables and especially when you need to serve a customer remotely so i want to agree with mr momo on the panelists that uh, collaboration is very key and it's very essential to drive financial inclusion in Nigeria. Uh, the second comment I want to make will go back to funding. And this goes to the deposit money banks, really. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of buzz and activity around deposit money banks trying to reach out to the last mile. They financially excluded. Um, trying to reach out to the SMEs. And, you know, the question that keeps coming up is, why are you trying very hard to do what you are not suited for? Because it's easy for them to make the funds available, partner with microfinance institutions, um, to be able to reach the last mile, because over the last 14 years of the evolving of the involvement of microfinance institutions, they've been able to understand the risk They've been able to understand the methodology. They've been able to understand the dynamics of the bottom of the pyramid. So rather than trying to turn that microfinance bank needs to be strong, yes, they need to make the... But the truth is, deposit money banks are currently taking that risk which is on a very low level. They're taking the risk already. They're vulnerable already to, the, to reduce your risk and work with a few microfinance banks who understand the risk in that market to reach that last mile. And I would say that the collaboration between deposit money banks and microfinance institutions will really drive a lot of mileage driving financial inclusion, and for the country to be able to meet its targets this year and next year. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. So, so it's been really established again that, that we need to strengthen collaboration between deposit money bank, microfinance institutions, and the fintech subsector. <coughs> In the presentation of the MD of First Bank, he showed us uh, a table that showed the rate of financial inclusion in different zones of the country. And you can see that in the Northeast, we have, I think, less than 20% financial inclusion. And what that tells me is that, of course, in the Southwest, we have the highest. What that tells me is that most of the financial institutions, the agent banks, I mean, the agencies, the uh, fintech companies, the microfinance banks, are concentrated in the urban centers. And when we are talking about inclusion, we are almost saturated the urban centers. What are the strategies going outside the urban centers? Into the agro, agro communities, the rural areas, in the far flung parts of the country. You know, I haven't heard that today. Nobody has given us any strategies to how we can do that. Much of the financially excluded in the country reside in these areas. And we don't have any strategy, strategy yet. yet, maybe the FD of First Bank, Bank can enlighten us a bit about that. that. I, I remember, remember many years, years ago when we first started, started banking, there was, was this rural banking, banking program. Banks, Banks were forced to open, but, but now that has been removed, nobody, nobody is forced to go anywhere. anywhere. So, so it's more than, than likely that many of these areas have been ignored, ignored because, because they, they are, are not commercially viable for the private sector or profit-driven banking institutions. Very so much, uh, uh, Chairman, for that question. Now, now for, for us, uh, in First Bank, Bank we, we have over 700 branches. A large, large number of those, easily 30% of those that are in rural areas, areas and they're still operational. That, that is one. one. Secondly, Secondly, I also made mention, mention of the fact, fact that, that, that um, we have over 70,000 agents in 772 of the 774 local governments. governments. And, and therefore, therefore means that, that inclusive of all the rural areas, areas we have agents providing the kind of services that we offer in our branches. 
because the agents are an extension of the bank. So we are we have a strategy for you know, rural areas and we are implementing that strategy and the number of agents is growing astronomically on account of this. Thank you. Let me implore all the other banks to at least use the agency system to reach out to far-flung areas, rural areas, and ensure that banking services are extended to these areas. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I think we should be rounding up. The day is fast. Do we have any more questions? Let me just say very quickly for those joining us virtually. Uh, let me remind, remind you that the, the Q&A icon, icon on the screen should be used for questions to be addressed by the facilitator. And, and all questions should be typed in, in the Q&A box on the virtual platform. Each participant should just click the raise hand icon to signify that they'd like to contribute to the sessions. Once you're acknowledged by the host, facilitator and access will be granted for you to speak. That's the process. So if you do have a question, please follow that protocol and we'll be able to hear you. Thank, Thank you very much. I think uh, we are bringing this session to an end. Uh, it's been very illuminating, uh, very exciting, very interesting. Uh, quite a lot of ideas have come up. I know this session is being recorded. Uh, I'm sure the CIBN will take the recording and review all the contributions. And maybe the final position paper will reflect some of the recommendations that have been made here today. I just don't want this to be a talk shop. We talk, 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 and we go, and the next year we'll come back and repeat the same thing. I want us to be able to do follow-up and implement. So that by next year, we, we are referring to this year's session as being productive because financial inclusion rates in the country has, has increased from this percentage to this percentage. That's, That's how we're able to measure progress. progress. So let me commend the guest speaker. Thank, Thank you very much. You've thrown more light to this subject matter. We appreciate your contribution. Uh, please extend our best wishes to the managing director of First Bank. And then may I thank uh, our panelists, distinguished uh, team of panelists, Dr. Jumoke, Uwole, Mr. Alman, Yokoko, um, Mr. Ajada, and uh, Martins, representing, who represented Mr. Nandi Okonkwo. Thank, Thank you very much for your robust contribution. We have taken note of all the points you raised, and they are all they have been recorded. And then those who ask questions, we appreciate you. And let me finally thank the President, Chairman of the Council, Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria, who have been sitting through this event, listening very attentively, taking notes. We appreciate you, sir, Mr. President. This is your day. This is your conference. And it's been hugely successful. Let me also thank all the past presidents. They are seated. I can see all of them. And the chairman of the organizing committee, my brother. Thank you very much. All distinguished attendants here who are here who have actively participated. We appreciate you. Thank, Thank you for your contribution, and God bless you all. Thank, Thank you. you. If I may, Your Excellency, if I just may, I didn't get to uh, recognize the president. Right. Well, well that concludes session, session one. Um, our... our... Now, now, let's uh, join them for a photo, photo op very, very quickly. Can I have the first row? row. Everyone on the, the first row, please do join us. Uh, Mr. Mr. Registrar, please do join us up, up here as well. All past presidents of uh, CIBN, please join us on stage for a photo op. Can, Can we have, have uh, members of the press, press very, very quickly take uh, a few shots? shots. This, this is session one, inclusive banking, where, where we are and the way forward. We will be moving straight on to session two before breaking for lunch at 3.15. That will be half an hour and then we'll return at 3.45 for session three.
Thank, Thank you, you very, very, very much. much. I'm not, not too, too sure about you, but, but every time thing, um, a speaker does come up in whatever capacity, I take notes and certain things stand out for me. And while we had um, Mr. Joda speaking, an idea hit me. I'm going to share it openly here, but if, if uh, these tech whiz people go, go and do it, it. Uh, I'm, I'm saying openly here, yeah, I will be coming for my 10%. Percent. Because we were talking about, uh, he was speaking about cash and, and, and banking and so on. And I was thinking to myself, you know, what if there was an app? I mean, there's an app for everything today, really. But what if there was an app where if you went for an occasion, a wedding or whatever it was, and it came to spraying, all you needed to do was whip out your phone and you enter what, whatever it is you enter, then it comes up on a screen just like this one, and it shows the currency you're spraying in, and as you press it, it keeps showing how much is going directly into the account of whoever it is you're spraying. I think that would work. So if you go do it, I will come for 10%. I'm watching like a hawk. We're going to move on very, very quickly to session two. Like, like I said, said, session two will last till 3.15. At 3.15, we, we, we will break for lunch and, and then resume at 3.45 with session three. Um, session two is risks of facilitating a sustainable future. Are banks prepared? I will be inviting the session chair virtually. He joins us virtually for this one. Please... Join, Join me in welcoming Professor Kenneth Amishi, Professor of Business and Sustainable Development and Director, Sustainable Business Initiative, University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom. Good day, Professor. Good day. I will then move on to inviting, also virtually, the speaker of this segment, who is represented. Ms. Falakemi Fatobe, who is represented today by Mr. Paul Onibodu of the Central Bank. Mr. Paul Onibodu of the Central Bank representing Ms. Falakemi Fatobe. Good day, everyone. Let's move on to our panelists for this session. All joining us virtually today. I will welcome the Special Advisor to the Lagos State Governor on Sustainable Development Goals and Investments, Mrs. Sholakwe Hammond. Good afternoon. Also joining us is the Executive Director, Citibank, Mrs. Fumi Ogunlesi, HCIB. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Next, Next is, is Mr. Kola Lawal, Executive Director and Chief Risk Officer, Stambik IBTC. Mr. Kola Lawal, Executive Director and Chief Risk Officer, Stambik IBTC. Good, good, after, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. And finally, Dr. Benson Uweru, partner and FSRM leader, West Africa, Risk Advisory Services, Ernst and Young. Dr. Benson Uweru, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. We can, we can hear you loud and clear. I can, I can confirm, confirm that all on this session, we can indeed hear you. I will, I will now hand the session, session over to the session chair Professor Kenneth Amishi. Thank you very much uh, and good afternoon everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be with you this afternoon and I stand on existing protocols. Uh, I must commend uh, the last session, it was kind of a, um, a class act and uh, I think a difficult one to follow. But we do our best to see how far we can go with it. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome every person to this session this afternoon. And we are talking about the risks of facilitating a sustainable future. And the question there is, you know, are the banks prepared? 
So we talk about sustainability, sustainable development, um, risks, they can mean different things. And um, the last session focused a lot more focusing on the financial inclusion as an opportunity. Uh, I remember, I mean, I recall the, the, the uh, panel chair asking questions about why banks are not going into in the, the rural areas? Why are they concentrating in the urban areas? And what struck me at that point is that the, the fact that the risks involved are to a large extent not emphasized. So banks will move where they, where they see the opportunities. And, and banks, uh, you know, they, they have a good nose for money and they know where the opportunities are. So um, as much as banks need incentives to go into these areas, they also need to be cautious and ensure that um, they are not taking on risks more than they can cope with. So um, this session this afternoon will be looking, exploring the implications of financing um, the SDG, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we look at the risk involved, but at the same time, not losing sight of the possible opportunities. But risks and opportunities quizzes, and some people have argued that where you have higher risks, then you also have higher returns or the opportunities are huge. So well, how do banks balance um, um, the opportunities against the risks? And how do they ensure that they remain relevant to society? Because financing the SDGs is about contributing to a better society. So that's what we are, uh, that's what we would explore this afternoon. And we have a fantastic uh, panelist that would be able to um, deal with some of these issues um, thoroughly. So I will start by um, inviting the keynote speak, uh, um, speaker um, who is representing um, Mrs. Folakemi Fatwe, the Director of Risk Management at the Central Bank in the person of Paul Bogi. Uni uh, Oki. I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. So, if you can give your presentation for say 20, 25 minutes, um, and I know we are running tight on time, and then I can invite um, other panelists to contribute. Uh, they give five minutes of their time, and then at the end of that, we open it up to uh, public participation and, and questions and answers. And we hope that this will be an, an interesting session and also interactive. Uh, it can also be provocative because I mean sustainability and the risks involved with them, especially in the banks, following my engagement with the banks um, has always been a very interesting one. So um, Mr. Paul uh, Onibogi, I invite you to give your talk. Thank you very much, this, this session chairman. And uh, I'm going to start on the service for good call. Uh, I'm here to represent Ms. Folakemi Fatogbe who is also engaged in what I call important assignments at this time. What we're looking at is the risk of facilitating a sustainable future. And the question is, are banks prepared? Talking about future, we are going to be asking some questions. I have a presentation on there, so we'll follow that. Setting the tone for this discussion, we are. There are about five questions here presented, and the questions are, what is a sustainable future? How has COVID-19 impacted that future? What is the role of banks in achieving that future? What are the attendant risks and challenges? And are banks prepared? Now, looking at these questions, we'll see that as bankers, one thing that is paramount in our mind is that we want to render service while maximizing the shareholders' fund. That's the wealth of our shareholder. How does sustainability come in? So let's, offer, let's look at what that sustainable future means and how banks fit into this. Let's, uh, let's slide this. Yes. So what is a sustainable future? Sustainable development has been defined as development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That means while we're doing, whatever we're doing today, we're taking advantage of the present resources, we're taking advantage of the present uh, asset available. We're also taking cognizance of what's happening in the future and what is likely to happen in the future to us. We have generations yet unborn that are going to be cared for and what provision do we have for them? 
So in line with that definition, we want to look at a future that can sustain continued development, not just for us, but for the generation yet unborn. And in talking about this, we talk about financial services that integrate the environmental, societal, and also governance into consideration while making that business is investment or decision as it concerns their own activities and that of their clients. Now, how can that be done? If we move on to the next slide, here yeah, we're going to see that financial intimidation that banks engage in is actually meant to help the economy as a whole. And how can this be done? It can be done by having internal daily operations. It can also be done by looking at the interaction with the external stakeholders, our clients, our environment in which we operate. And we can even look at the kind of project that we are financing. All of this helps to define the kind of finances that we do and the way we do those finances. So within the context of sustainable banking, financial institution perform its, its uh, activity to make profit, yes, but also look at the societal impact and the environmental impact. Now, what are those things that should be considered when we are looking at this? The next uh, slide shows us that we need to look at things generally that affect corporate performance. Some have said that, oh, my major reason for, for being in business is to make money. But when we make money at the expense of the environment, what happens? It comes back to haunt us. So we have that implementation of sustainable financing and we have that initiative. It costs money, but while it costs money, we must also realize that it has its benefits and put on the scale, the benefit actually outweigh the cost. What benefit comes from implementing sustainable finance? It benefits the society as a whole, it benefits the environment, it improves the productivity of the institution. That investment itself benefits because it's able to continue for a foreseeable future. In the long run, it reduces costs for the investment as well as the financier. It also helps us to meet up with regulations and create a lot of other opportunities. So studies have shown that investors' confidence and reputation improves in institutions that actually imbibe sustainable financing. So it's right then for companies to focus on achieving good sustainable financing by reducing costs improving workers' productivity, mitigating potential risk, and creating revenue-generating opportunities in the activity. And we, are going to, we, have, we have noticed that recently we have innovative products. These products target certain population, the future population, the young ones, the youth, and those that are here to not well served, that is the vulnerable ones, especially women and people in the rural community. So that helps us to be able to focus our attention on things that we know that will grow the economy, will grow the sector with time. Now, we also have products like a green card and uh, uh, even green bonds that countries are coming up with that have their attention focused on financing projects that contribute to the economy. Now, what has been done? It's not just in Nigeria that we have projects, talks, documents, and plans. The next slide will tell us about things that have been done globally and even here in Nigeria. One of that is the framework that came up in March 2015, that's the Sendia framework. We have the Addition Ababa Action for Financing Development, and most notably, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with the 13 Sustainable Development Goals that all countries 
over 150 countries have actually killed into. That is on the global scale. In our country here in Nigeria, we have also done so much and we've prepared ourselves. The Bankers Committee in 2011, even earlier before the SDD goal, actually came up with arrangements for Nigerian sustainable banking principle. And in that same year, 2012, we had the adoption of the sustainable banking principles. That were, we have a circular issued on that, that the banks have fit into. And we have the SGDR, SGDP, SG, SG, the Economic uh, Recovery Growth Plan, that's the EIGP that was also uh, initiated in 2017. That aligned with the SGD goals as well. Here in Nigeria, we have the federal government issuing green bonds, first in 2017 and in 2019. All of these are actions that show that the future actually belong to sustainable financing. Now, we're going to premise this discussion on two of these uh, plans, which is the SGD and our whole internal uh, sustainable banking principle in Nigeria. If we move to the next uh, slide, yeah, we're, we're going to see the next slide that uh, here we have the, the nine principles of the Nigerian Sustainable Banking Principles. And if we look at these principles, we'll see that it actually prepares us for sustainable financing and sustainable future. The first being our activity should take note of the environmental and social risks, and we should manage that so that we do not use negative impact of what we're doing to destroy the future. So we'll avoid and minimize or even offset negative impact of our decision today. Another thing, the second principle talks about our operations on the environment and social footprint. We also want to make sure that what we're doing in our local community, in our work, does offset the negative of our own business. So the footprint that we create. Human rights consideration is the third principle. We know that there are businesses that involves uh, underage, child labor and the rest. We want to be careful that we don't engage in that or we don't finance such ones because we are also interested in the future of such ones. And number four is of particular interest, women economic empowerment. When we promote women's economic empowerment, what we do is we are having an inclusive workplace. That is our own work in, our, in, in the financial institution where we are. We are creating a workplace that is conducive for all gender, especially women. And the product that we have also take note of the women gender, our business activities, and even our finances. A lot of banks and financial institutions have actually developed products that satisfy the women environment, women uh, own businesses and women manage businesses. This is good. Another important uh, focus of the sustainable development principle is the financial inclusion. We've talked so much about financial inclusion this uh, morning and afternoon, and uh, both on the side of regulators and on the side of operators, we've seen that a lot of people are thinking about how to get financial products into the hands of the underbanked in terms of technical provision, in terms of uh, financial literacy in terms of even technology that serves the unbank. This is something that we can see that we have developed over time since this uh, plan was made up to this moment. What of the environmental and so uh, social governance, the ERS governance? This is the sixth principle. The seventh principle be capacity building. Principle eight is collaborative partnership, and nine being reporting. That's about the sustainable ban uh, banking principle. We're going to talk more about how, what risk does this potent and how can we address this risk? The next slide talks about the SDG goal, the sustainable development goal. This sustainable development has 17 components and more than 150 world leaders adopted it in September one. 2015, which includes our own country, Nigeria. While we're looking at these goals, a lot of companies have made progress. 
but not so many. Yes, a few countries have made progress. But one thing that is of concern now is why we're trying to make progress in these goals came the COVID-19 pandemic. And many progress already recorded by COVID uh, prior to COVID-19 pandemic have been wiped out by that pandemic. So how can we achieve this? A few of these uh, goals, here we talk about uh, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, having clean water, uh, decent work environment, sustainable cities, uh, climate change, and even responsible consumption and production. If you look at all of these, talk about gender equality, quality education, these are things that we know that will help us, not just for today, but will help us in the time to come. We are now going to look at what has happened globally. If we move on to the next slide, we'll notice that um, over time, people's projection, the world projection for development has actually been uh, reversed. And we can we also explain that we are bankers, we know what has happened in the last uh, quarter, especially of the negative uh, growth that we had. It's not just about Nigeria, it's a common uh, denominator to most countries of the world. I mean, with this, what then can we do? What challenges stress us at the face? If we look at the next uh, slide, we are going to see that a few items have been identified about the impact of COVID-19. But not, we are not just looking at COVID-19 now. We are looking at the risks generally because all of these issues have been with us even before COVID-19, but they have been separated by the COVID-19. Let's now look at them because from here we can see some of the risks that we are likely going to face going forward and think about around what can we do as industry to help ourselves. One of such is the high risk of economic recession. We already had a negative growth. And what does that do? Economic recession tells on poverty. It draws people back into poverty. Remember that one of our goal is to take people out of poverty. So a risk has been created. How can we come in to ensure that more and more people have taken away from the poverty zone into prosperity zone. We have the oil crash, price crash, that affects the uh, economy as a, of the nation. Then the rise on in unemployment. That itself is a very huge negative to the economy. A lot of people that had job are losing their job. And a few just have to settle for job that are below their competencies. How can we help the economy? What challenge does this present? Now, another issue here is even healthcare. Healthcare, having good healthcare is one of the goals of the uh, sustainable development goals. But people have poor access to good healthcare. Uh, Mr. Paul, is, is it possible to wrap up, wrap up in the next two, three minutes? That'd okay. okay. I'll, I'll, run, I'll run through that. So we need to look at the health and well-being. We need to look at how to provide food for people. We need to look at financial inclusion. A lot of high percentage of people are not banked. What can we do as a nation? What can we do as an industry? There have been steps. If we look on to the next uh, slide, we'll notice that throughout the world, people have made steps to curtail the negative effect of not just the COVID-19, but the dwindling fortune of the economy. China, United States, the Eurozone, and here in Nigeria. Earlier in the day, we've mentioned the issue of uh, uh, COVID-19 loan by CBN, other intervention by CBN, the SME survival fund coming on by the federal government, the temporary forbearance given by CBN to banks so that they can uh, uh, look at their loans and actually see how to help the, uh, the borrowers and even the uh, review of the 2020 budget. Now, where do we come in as a bank or as an industry? 
we want to look at all these challenges that are facing us. Are we prepared to meet with the challenges? One thing that is important and which the session chairman did mention is the issue of recognizing the risks and the reward. The next slide talks about what we need to have. What is important at this point is that we should have good corporate governance. If we have that and we are sure we know what we are going, that can support effective risk management system. And what is risk management? Risk management is we are looking at the risks and looking out for the opportunities that comes along with. Because every risk also provides a form of opportunities. So it is true that when we're looking at sustainable development goals and future, we have costs associated with it. But underneath that cost lies a lot of potentials that can help the banking industry, that can help the unbank, that can help the environment, that can help the unborn generation. Now, when we move, add good governance to evasive risk management, that unlocks social economic development opportunity. Now, what we now need to do is to find a balance between our intent as a bank to maximize the, uh, the, the shareholders' fund and providing for the future. There are questions to ask ourselves. The next uh, and last uh, slide. Here we are going to see how can bank facilitate sustainable future. COVID-19, among others, has put the spotlight on the need for inclusive and sustainable development. We need to get everybody on board. We need to include those in the right area. We need to include the women folk. We need to include the young ones. How can we think about the future? Bank also have key role in play to play in financing the needed investment and reallocation of resources that will help to achieve that desirable, sustainable future. Bank too, should therefore strive to promote sustainable practices as escalated in the Nigerian Sustainable Banking Principle and the SDG. Some of the areas where bank need to intensify effort today is to provide for the unbank and the vulnerable group that, as we said, with access to banking service and credit facility. Environmental and social impact should also be put into consideration in designing bank businesses and operating model. And also, it's important that we should develop capacity in the, in the industry to enable the opportunities for sustainable future. This is in addition to the business we do as social. We want to look at the future, we want to look at everything. Now, the question we should ask ourselves are, or is, are banks prepared to facilitate that journey to a sustainable future? That's a question for all of us to consider, for institutions to look at, for all of us to develop capacity to identify opportunities that lie beneath the risk that we've identified and see how we can harness it for the benefit of the institution and the economy as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Onibogi. Uh, I think that's a, a, a good summary of the issue at hand here. And, you know, that last question, I, I would put it in the another way, you know, the, which will be, is the central bank and the banks prepared? So if you put it together, and it's something I would like to explore, on, yeah, um, once we, if we have the time to think about how the central bank in itself is playing a role in pursuing the sustainable development goals in Nigeria beyond just the Nigerian sustainable banking principles. You talked about sustainable development and you defined it broadly as about taking um, the needs of future generation as we do things today, taking those needs into consideration. And that's the broad line definition of sustainable development, which encompasses um, most of the things we are talking about today in the form of sustainable development goals. And if you break them down, you're thinking about the economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability. But most of the time we pay attention to the economic development uh, or economic sustainability to the detriment of the other ones. So, uh, and you also talked about the ESG, that's the environmental social governance, which is the language that the financial um, institutions understand because it plays very much into the whole talk about sustainability in the financial services sector. So I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Solakwe Hammond to also give us a sense of where the government is coming from, especially Lagos State, and what she would like to see the banks do in relation to the sustainable development goals. So uh, Ms. Ms. Solakwe Hammond, you have five minutes to respond to that. Yes. Thank you very much. 
Meshi, and thank you very much to the CIBN for bringing me here. It's been a very exciting morning. I was able to catch the previous session and it was very, very enlightening for me and I've taken one or two things away. Um, just to set a little bit of context, I actually started my career in banking in risk management, which I did for three and a half years. And then I did risk consulting for five years, developed uh, the risk management framework and Basel II frameworks for probably three or so banks. So this is not a strange topic for me. Um, certainly in the context of where we are uh, globally and not just Nigeria, this is obviously very key. Uh, I think, I, I don't know if anyone could have, even if they had a crystal ball, could have predicted 2020 and it continues to surprise us. Um, and so this is a very, very apt topic. Um, I think from yeah. the government, government, from the side of the government, I think uh, a lot has been said already. And I think Mr. Onigogi uh, did a fantastic job with Mrs. Fatogwe's presentation. Uh, talking about the sustainable development goals, talking about the responses Nigeria has made, uh, talking about the uh, the banking framework, the ESG framework, which I wild, wildly applauded when it came out. So I don't think I need to set context any further. I think what we would, what I would like to talk about first would be how um, this year has impacted Lagos State uh, in terms of preparation and just showing us, you know, uh, looking at things from a risk perspective. So as a state, uh, typically uh, planning is one of the things Lagos State does very, very well and at very uh, many, many different levels. Uh, as a state, Lagos State has a, a development plan, an economic uh, plan, uh, which is typically a 10 to 15 year plan and which then leads to the creation of a medium term framework, uh, which lasts for three years. So uh, planning is part of what we do. Uh, the planning takes uh, into account, not just, you know, again, we don't sit there, predict and provide, but it takes in the viewpoints of all stakeholders of Lagos. So for those who've heard of the AIMBETI summit, that's really what it is. It's the Lagos State Development uh, Summit, which started about 20 years ago and is really a platform for all stakeholders in Lagos to come together and talk about what is important and create resolutions and then try and implement those. And those go into the, the development plan as well as the annual uh, implementation of programs. Uh, Lagos also has town halls, also has consultative forums, uh, fora, and uh, also a corporate assembly for businesses. So there are many platforms through which people can come together to share their insights and be part of the state's planning. Lagos State, again, with the uh, support of the Rockefeller Foundation, became one of 50 cities in the world to create a resilience strategy. And so Lagos has a very effective resilience strategy, which is very widely, uh, is widely available uh, on the Lagos State website or the Lagos State Resilience Office website. Uh, and so we've also um, worked to look at, you know, just governance as a whole and the state as a whole and identify what our issues are, are and talk about what our responses should be uh, when things happen, whether they're planned or predicted or you know, totally unpredicted, such as COVID has been. Uh, so all of these things gave us a really strong um, sort of framework to fall back on. And of course, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, which I champion. Uh, Lagos was very actively involved in the uh, in the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which was the pre pre predecessor, predecessor to the Sustainable Development Goals. And we've always been actively involved. But last year, that became a cabinet level role, looking at the Sustainable Development Goals and ensuring Lagos is focused on that. Uh, and so, were able to leverage all of those frameworks to respond to the crisis. But even then, there were many things that came to the fore. The first was that identity was very clearly an issue. We couldn't identify everyone, and so we couldn't help everyone. Um, we had a social register, which we had started to build along with the national program, but we didn't necessarily have all the information for everyone who was vulnerable, and we had newly vulnerable people. And so we had to build new systems. And those are things that we actually did working with people in the with uh, different types of companies in the sector. So banks were able to support us from there with their framework, with their data. Uh, power companies were able to support us. Telecoms companies were able to support us. And for me, that just highlights sort of where we should go for solutions. We all need to work together, which was something that came out clearly in the last session. The other thing um, that became very, very clear apart from identity um, was that, you know, we needed to focus more on a few sectors. And for us, our themes agenda actually held up very, we had highlighted that turned out to be the things that were key. So solving the problem with transportation um, and you know 
became very, very clear when people couldn't travel in close proximity. Solving the problem around health and environment, very critical for COVID. Food security, very critical. You know, so all of the things that we had actually put in our planning bucket did pay off to be the things that were important to focus on and were able to leverage our themes agenda and build on that and emphasize some of the areas like health that we need to provide even more support for. Education, of course, also critical and technology, which we leveraged. Um, but for me, I think the most important Yes, I'm almost done. The most important thing for us was that sustainability is not sustainability is not a CSR uh, initiative. It's not something that you do with a little bit of money. It requires refocusing, retooling, reinventing entirely how you approach business and what your purpose is. And for us, it's very key that we mainstream it. It's good to identify the goals and know what they are broadly. But if we don't incorporate that and all that we do set centralize it around that, we will end up not achieving the sustainable development goals. And I think for me, that was the big takeaway from the COVID crisis. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, and it seems you don't have uh, a lot of expectations from the banks, which is helpful in this regard. Um, I, wanted, I want to invite uh, Mrs. Fumi Ogunlesi of um, Citibank. You know, when we talk about um, sustainable development and the, um, especially the Nigerian sustainable banking principles, um, oftentimes in most banks, um, that function tends to sit with the risk department. I'm just wondering um, if you could reflect on what you've had so far in terms of what the CBN is expecting of banks, and what the Lagos state also is expecting of banks in, in that regard, and in the context of risk management as well, and how your bank um, deals with um, added opportunities as well as the risks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So, um, I first of all, to thank um, the CIBN and the organizers. And as Sholakme said, I also caught part of the previous session. Very, very interesting. It's clearly a very successful event. Um, I, um, Mr. Chairman, thank you for um, your, your question. I will bring it to the sustainable banking principles. I like what um, Mrs. Fatobe said, you know, very eminently um, spoken by Mr. Onigogi about the pandemic being prosperity negative, but planet positive. So, you know, the economic lockdown, because I think we should look at things um, on the SDG front from pre-pandemic, which as Sholakwe said is unprecedented, to post-pandemic. What are we going to do? What are we doing intra-pandemic and at the end of the pandemic, whenever it comes? Um, and the question is, you know, she said uh, parts of it are planet positive, parts prosperity negative. And the question I would like to ask the banks and uh, myself and ourselves included is how do we turn the post pandemic era of Nigeria's banking industry into a balance of the two? That is, it's both prosperity and planet positive. And the sustainable banking principles, which uh, Mrs. Fatogbe alluded to, they're not new, um, I believe since 2012. In 2011, as she presented, the Bankers Committee came up with a framework, which was then um, espoused and confirmed in the sustainable banking principles in, you know, as way back as 2012. And I would like to look at principle eight of the Nigeria's sustainable banking principles, which was agreed by everybody in the Bankers Committee. There, there are nine principles, and all of them are extremely laudable. But in terms of the how, I think principle eight is useful. And again, Sholakwe uh, Hammond very eloquently alluded to this. And it is that we, it says it's collaborative partnerships. That's principle eight. We will collaborate, we said, across the sector and we will leverage international partnerships to accelerate our collective progress and move the sector, banking sector as one, ensuring our approach is consistent with international standards and also with Nigeria's development needs. So in line with the question that you have posed, Mr. Chairman, and the question that was posed by Mrs. Fatogwe at the end, are the banks prepared and how are they? Well, we, there are certain milestones that we can note and which we should be proud of. One of the milestones on Nigeria's environmental financing landscape, for example, was the Nigeria's domestic uh, green bond, the debut green bond, which was launched in 2017. I had the privilege of working on the green bond framework committee that was set up by the then minister of environment, um, Honorable Amina Mohammed, Honorable Minister Amina Mohammed, 
who is again, one of our very um, notable exports. She's now Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and the chairman of the UN Sustainable Develop Development Group. And it was Amina Mohammed that actually put together a framework and insisted that Nigeria issue and work towards, it took us about a year to, walk to um, work towards Nigeria's debut green bond, which was launched in 2017. And by the way, that debut green bond was the first sovereign bond launched by any country in Africa uh, up until that time. And so that's a milestone that should be celebrated. But the thing is that we need to leverage off this uh, promising start. We have so much goodwill out there, not least with uh, Deputy Secretary General that chairs the SDG group in, for the UN. And so how do we leverage the framework, the, the banking principles? How do we leverage the international context, our local context, some of the milestones we've had to move to the next level? Well, back to principle eight. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Collaborate with Lagos State. Collaborate with Sholakwe. She and I are on another committee <laughs> for uh, Ehingbeti. And we're looking at what can we do? What can the banks do? And I'm not the only banker on, on her committees. Sholakwe is a Rottweiler. She gets everybody <laughs> involved. So we are all there working at her bidding, basically to collaborate and say, what can we do? Now, Lagos, I'll use Lagos as an example, is a poster child for how even my uh, modest um, 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 execution can make maximum impact. For instance, the day that the blue line or the red line in Lagos is inaugurated, that day emissions, carbon emissions in Nigeria, the story, there will be a tipping point in terms of the story. Because I know many, many thousands of people who are just waiting, they've seen the framework, they've seen the infrastructure, and they are just waiting to be able to get onto a train in Lagos, leave the, 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 the small 10, eight, six crowded buses, get onto a train and go from Okokomaiko to Marina. Can you imagine the carbon emissions that would be reduced in such an achievement? So the day they cut that ribbon, sir, then you will know that we are really in business. So okay. I would like to end with just one case study. The AFDB's COVID-19 bond was mm -hmm. launched in April, 2020 to form a pandemic response facility. Again, AFDB, that the you know, president is one of our most notable exports. They, wanted, they were looking to raise 2 billion, they raised 3 billion in that, that tranche alone. And I just want to mention that City, I have to <laughs> say, City was privileged to be a co-lead on that transaction along with several banks, collaboration. I also want to mention briefly, the international green bond market today, just Green Bonds International, is 900 billion in terms of stock um, strong. Nine, that's nearly a trillion dollars. And year to date, 2020, in green bonds, the world has raised close to $250 billion. Just investment looking for green bond projects to move into. The, the stars are aligned. It's over to us. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay great, great. I mean, that, that's, those are uh, good examples. And there's always been this tension between green bonds and social bonds. I'm happy you raised that. And the, you know, some people have argued uh, whether Africa needs more of social bonds than, than green bonds. But I think it's, it's a fair question to ask and, and we see how that pans out at, at some point. So um, permit me now to invite um, Mr. Kola Lawal. And I, want, I still want to go back to the point that, I mean, I've done work with some banks and I've also, interacted with most of the people who lead sustainability in banks. And one of the things I hear is that the banks are not ready. So and I think we need, to be, we, need, we, need to, we need to hit the nail on the head here and begin to uh, tell ourselves that naked truth, you know, in a way. The banks are not ready, the CEOs, the leadership of banks, some of them are not keen, they're not interested unless they are pushed. So I want you to, to reflect on this a bit and, and see if you can help us understand why a good number of banks are not keen. And if it has to do anything with risks that, um, or any stumbling blocks that will need to be removed first before the banks can then fall over themselves to get involved in this issue. Thank, thank you and um, thank you for, for having, having me. Um, interesting um, conversation so, so far. Um, I, I don't think it's an issue of, of banks and CEOs not being keen. 
or sustainability sitting you know in risk uh, rather than some other function within within the bank i think it's a matter of steps and progress um, in my mind, I think uh, banks are starting to make progress. And if you look at Nigeria, not, not, not just in Nigeria, across Africa, because we cannot look at this um, issue of sustainability and cut ourselves off um, from the rest of Africa, um, especially. So if I look at um, the uh, SDGs 7, 11, and 13, for example, that speak to sustainable energy, sustainable cities, and climate uh, action, I think this is a clear area where I think banks have started to think about, and more and more banks are starting to prepare um, for this in terms of financing sustainable energy um, as we go into a future less reliant on dirty energy and fossil fuels. Um, some countries are obviously ahead of, 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 um, of Nigeria. So if you look at South Africa, uh, for example, 10% of the energy that they provide is from renew renewable energy, so from both wind and, and solar. Um, the largest wind farm in sub-Saharan Africa sits in Kenya. Now, all of these projects um, were financed by banks. Um, the Standard Bank Group, um, of which Standard is a part, has been heavily, heavily involved in financing quite a lot of these um, renewable energy pro uh, projects across uh, Africa. We have started to look at some projects um, in Nigeria, uh, but I guess we face a bit more of a challenge than some of the countries um, um, in, 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 you know, in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of having the enabling environment, having the legal and commercial framework that supports this type of, of financing. But we have started to take the baby steps. Um, uh, look, from a risk perspective, we saw what happened when you know banks in Nigeria went into financing of the, what I would call the first um, round of financing in power um, across the um, initial private uh, partial deregulation of power. But that hasn't, you know, um, meant that you know banks have stopped um, so there might have been a pause but you know I've spoken to different um, banks different risk professionals different um, commercial and investment bankers in Nigeria who continue to look at opportunities across um, renewable energy the opportunities are few and far um, um, at the moment but they're coming through um, and, you know, we continue to discuss, you know, putting uh, in place the right frameworks, putting in place the right, you know, legal frameworks, the right technical framework, the right, you know, um, risk mitigation strategies to support this area. Um, so that's on the one end. The other area I think banks are looking at is if, if you look at the, the um, um, balance sheet of, of the Nigerian banking sector, 30% concentration to oil and gas. Um, whether we like it or not, the world is moving away from, from, from oil. Um, only yesterday, BP noted that um, they believe oil demand will be down by 30% by, 20, uh, by 2030. Um, recently, Norway's 1.1 trillion um, sovereign wealth fund have noted their commitment to move away completely from oil and gas exploration. So given Nigeria's dependency on oil and gas, which flows obviously into, into banking, we need to start to think about this. Um, or else that concentration that we run, you know, um, in, in that sector, as, it work, as the world is moving away from, you know, dirty fuel and you know, the environmental issues that, that this, um, um, this causes will catch, will catch up on us. So we are thinking about it. Progress may be slower than, you know, we would like it, but some work is going on. People are talking, banks are engaging, and I believe that um, it's only a matter of time before the progress, the level of progress that we would like to see will come through and become evident. I think I'll, okay. I'll stop there in time. Okay, okay. I, I hope, uh, you know, that, that movement uh, we can stop a bit, but uh, it, it's a good reflection of what is happening. Um, so I invite uh, Dr. Benson very, to, to probably reflect on um, his experience working with the industry and also probably what he hears from his clients uh, uh, in relation to the risks involved in this area uh, and possibly the opportunities if that's uh, also there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ken. Um, and also let me start by saying a big thank you to my fellow panelists. It's good to see Sholakbe Hammond again. Um, Mrs. Fumi Ogunleshi of uh, the Citibank, uh, Mr. Kola Lawal, 
Uh, let me also thank uh, the chairman of this session and congratulations to uh, CIBN on this very uh, auspicious event of the 13th annual banking and finance conference. Uh, I think my colleagues have touched very clearly on some of the key principles on the Nigerian sustainable banking uh, principles. Uh, I think uh, very clearly Sholakbe and uh, Fumi have talked about collaborative uh, partnerships, which is key. But I'd like to talk about governance, uh, which is around transparency, participation and inclusion, as well as accountability in the conduct of businesses, either by government or by private institutions and the banks particularly. Uh, implementing very robust and transparent governance practice is key uh, when we talk about uh, the ESG goals. Uh, for us in EY, uh, I, I like to say that sustainability is core to us. Uh, we have a global commitment this year for particularly 2020 is our carbon neutral year. So by the end of this year, 2020, EY has an ambition uh, to be carbon neutral. Uh, and it is a front burner item for a few years now. But uh, it's interesting to know that the pandemic has accelerated our commitment uh, to become ca carbon neutral. Uh, and because of the pandemic, there's been travel restrictions all over the world. Uh, and we anticipate that with these restrictions, we are going to be able to meet our target because travels have been restricted, like we see. Uh, this session, I think, is very important because all of us are connecting virtually, which actually uh, aligns to the theme of this conversation we are having today. So there's a need for more transparency in business conduct and, and also in business uh, decision-making processes. And for us in EY, we are committed to sustainability. Uh, we have actually been recognized, you know, based on our commitment to sustainability by Vendantix. Uh, and we also publish our reports on the uh, UN Global Compact Progress Report, which you can assess in terms of our commitment. I just like to say that listening to uh, Kola and listening to Fumi, uh, the bankers, I think that there's a lot to be done. Like Kola mentioned, progress is being made. But there's a growing sense of urgency that banks must prepare now. Uh, in 2020, for the first time, the top five global risks in the World Economic Forum's global risk report were related to climate change. Uh, and in our EY report and also in our, our survey, we found that 52% of banks view environmental and climate change as a key emerging risk over the next five years. Uh, and this is very critical as we think of the impact of sustainability. I'd like to also just mention that looking at some of the good case studies in terms of corporate sustainability and financial performance, finding the correlation, which is often the challenge with most of the banks, you find that the question is, can banks achieve sustainability without impacting profits? A recent study was done in China, particularly, between 2009 and 2013 uh, to assess the environmental and social performance of Chinese banks, increasing their performance relative to, to that. Uh, and what was the result? It was quite interesting to note that they found that sustainability is really not detrimental to financial performance. If anything, is actually complementary and a key driver. In fact, certain research suggests that the opposite, especially when the government and regulatory environment collaborates uh, and with the central bank who is pushing this agenda, there is opportunity for us to find greater efficiencies and also achieve profitability uh, as we think about sustainability. For me and for us in EY, it is achievable and research actually indicates success is more likely to be driven by local capital and government owned institution. I think it is important to say that we are the ones to implement the change that we seek. We can and we will. And I think that exactly is the message that we need to put out there. Banks must be willing to facilitate the journey to a sustainable future. And governance is at the center of this. We must emphasize the importance to combine transparency with participation, with collaboration, to increase engagement with all the stakeholders so that at the end, we can see a better working world which aligns to our purpose. My last comment on this is finding our alignment with the corporate purpose and sustainability. What we are seeing today is that organizations are redefining their purpose to reflect the DNA of actual sustainability in the way they do business. I'd like to stop here for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. thank you very much. I think your last point is very well made. 
which talks about sustainability as a cultural thing. So uh, it's not just about having the principles, but also uh, living sustainability as a way of life. I know we are just um, some seconds to three o'clock and I want to open it up to the public or participants in either Lagos or Abuja and online as well. So I will need the help of the uh, MC here in terms of the questions uh, from participants in Lagos or Abuja. Okay, while, while I'm waiting for the questions to come through, um, uh, permit me again to, to open it up a bit. And the question for me here is, um, again, coming back to the, the tension, the challenges, um, and here I'm, I'm looking at uh, Mrs. Sogun uh, and, and Mr. Lau in terms of the banks. What are the challenges in, in pursuing some of these goals? Say, for example, um, COVID-19 uh, has happened, and we're thinking, okay, the, the world will change, and probably the banks will need to change the things they fund. So think about our hospital, the health system. Why is money unable, you know, Africa was predicted to have been wiped out if the COVID thing succeeded. Well, thank goodness it didn't happen. Shall we wait again for another pandemic or epidemic? You know, how, how do we channel funding, especially from the banks, to now support the health system? So I, I, I wonder if you could reflect on that and possibly the, the risk involved. So I'll go. Yeah, sorry, yes. So subject to anything that Kola will say, um, I, I, and I think you're right, it's a very good question. Um, what are we found, as I said, I sat on um, a committee on the green, this is specifically for green projects, on the Green Bonds Committee before the uh, launching of Nigeria's debut green bond. And one very clear, um, clear, clear, what sign that we saw, one clear thing that stood out was the fact that it's actually, it's bankability and it's not that easy to identify or get bankable projects. You would think because Nigeria at its state of development as an emerging market in need of, you know, off grid, in need of, you know, solar solutions, you know, lighting, hospitals, all our needs, all our infrastructure needs, there should be an abundance of projects, and they are. But the process, for instance, of issuing a green bond uh, it requires, it's almost similar to trying to issue a sukuk, for instance. You require certification. You require pre, it's not like just issuing a loan. It's you require pre, you know, pre approval of the project to demonstrate its uh, green effect. So how, you know, you have to be able to measure and demonstrate that X amount of carbon emissions are being reduced by the project, and this needs to be certified. You need, and there are about few, there are few certifying agencies and bodies. So, you know, some of the rating agencies also do certifications. It's quite, it's quite a long and difficult progress. It's worth the effort, and it's something that we need to build capacity. So what I noticed was that the we were learning as we were, went along, we need to do this, we need to do that. Oh, this needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And that capacity needs to be built up in order to be able to create bankable projects. But as Kola mm. said, you know, the willingness is absolutely there. We want the projects, but we okay. need to build capacity to assess them. Okay, fine. I mean, um, Kola, um, do you want to speak about the investment in health and if that was uh, an option or still an option for your bank or yeah, the bank I, sector? I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Yes, Look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Please go ahead, yeah. Mm. Again, I think it, it's it's something that you know banks have started to to look at. Um, as Stambic IBTC, I think we're looking at one or two, possibly three projects at, in in the meantime. Um, but as uh, Fumi said, it's the bankability of these projects that that you know raises the issue. Um, some of these projects, I mean. Um, stand and fall on on the sort of legal agreements and the commercial agreements that you get into. Um, some of these projects, um, as they are projects, need to be project financed. And the complexity of project financing, the protections that you need from your legal agreements is still something that as a banking sector and as a country, um, we're still trying to get our, hand, our hands around. So it, again, it's a slow process. We're getting there. We're looking at some of these projects. We're looking at some hospitals. 
Um, but between the banks and the financiers themselves and some of these investors in, in some of these areas, um, um, there's quite a lot of learning that's still, that's still going on. So as we learn, um, again, we will pro uh, proceed cautiously so that we don't start burning a hole in our capital. At the same time, putting some of the projects themselves at risks. Um, but we are looking at the projects and we are guiding as many investors, as many sponsors as possible um, and moving as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I, I think one thing common um, across the two last comments um, is uh, the issue of capacity building. Um, so can I invite um, Hassan Inouwa from um, Hassan Online? I mean, is it possible? Can you ask your question briefly? If possible. Okay, if you're not there, so can I ask, okay, Mwala Precious? Can see her hand or body's hand. Okay, oh, yeah. So Hassan, do you want to go for it? Who wants to talk? Yeah. Um, okay, Mwala Precious, do you want to go for it then? Okay, it seems that we have a bit of technological challenge there. Um, so coming back again to um, um, Sholapi, I would like to ask you, I mean, what do you want the banks to do, um, especially in supporting what you're doing in Lego, beyond partnership? How, what else would you want to see banks do? Thank you very much. So as Kola was speaking, I really, I understand it, I get it. As I said, I used to be a banker. I understand the concept of capital at risk. At the end of the day, it's a very highly regulated industry for very good reason. We can't afford to have you know, banks crashing. But in spite of that, I want to say four things. Um, sustainability requires courage. We have to do the unusual. We can't keep doing all that we know. Um, I know that you have to keep capital safe, but you know we have to get to a certain level of specialization. And to do that, we do have to break a few eggs. So it is important that we find a way to test relatively safely, new, you know, expanding the scope of what we do. There are banks that all they do in, you know, certain parts of Southern Europe is just invest in wine in a specific region in Europe. That's the level of specialization we've gotten to. And it's until we get to that point that people understand, there's a bank that'll understand how to grow onions in the North and how to grow tomatoes somewhere and how to do cocoa. And until we get to that point, we won't have real banking to support the real sector. The second thing I'll say is resilience. You have to keep trying even when we fail spectacularly. You know, if we take a hit once because we tried something new, don't let that keep us from trying something new. The banking sector has evolved so significantly over the last few decades, the last uh, two to three decades. For me was the, you know, the fundamentals of the FinTech industry. So it's important that we remain resilient. Uh, transparency, we have to have tangible targets and public measurements. Let not, let's not be afraid to fail publicly. That's what's necessary to deliver a true framework, especially around sustainability, because everyone is still trying to grow in this space. Otherwise, it's just a theoretical nice to, nice to have. And in spite of what you said, Ms. Alawal, speed, because we need that change now. We have 10 years to achieve you know, the, the SDGs. More importantly, as Mrs. Ogunleti pointed out, the rest of the world will figure out a way to move on without us. If there's one trillion dollar, one trillion dollar opportunity, the world is already doing a quarter of that, and Nigeria is a hundred and million, a hundred million dollars. It shows that the rest of the world will find a way to move on without us, and we'll be left without the, the change that we we need when those resources are, are out there. So we need our banking sector to please step up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Innovation is key, right? You know, so we can keep doing the same thing and expecting change. Um, so the last question I would like to pose to uh, uh, Paul here. When I speak to banks, you know, <laughs> they talk about the CBN, right? The Central Bank of Nigeria. From your perspective, what do you think the Central Bank needs to do differently to get the banks on? Because sometimes also even the Central Bank in itself appears a bit laid back about it. Okay, on the, side, on the, on the part of the regulator, what we need to do is to encourage banks to come on board. Uh, we are not going to coerce banks to do things. We know that they will see the benefit in many of these projects and see the future in it. When you see benefit in things, it becomes easier for you to be, to be persuaded to go into it. 
So as uh, Central Bank, we'll continue to do our utmost to get the bank to benefit from the future, to see the beauty of collaborating with other institutions, to move forward and to finance areas where we really need development and that can sustain the future. The agri sector, like the governor said, the ICT sector, uh, there are other social intervention areas that the CBN is going into that needs the assistance of the uh, industries so that we can move forward. As a CBN, we're ready to work with the banks, with the industry as a whole, and uh, get the future better. The prospect of the future is actually awaiting us to tap into. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Benson, very well. you know, your last comment before we wrap up? What would be your advice to the banks and the regulator? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ken. And uh, it's been quite an interesting conversation. I wish we had more time. Uh, but I, I, think, I think the message is out there. And I think that for me, at the end of the day, uh, there's need for capacity building to ensure competence in handling uh, the risk from coming from uh, ESG. Uh, and I think the regulator has said it. Uh, it is important to note that both the regulators and the banks uh, play the most important role in ensuring that the industry is adequately prepared and equipped to withstand the risk ahead. Uh, and I think that that has to be on the front burner. Uh, so therefore, capital requirements and capital adequacy measures should be clearly aligned and defined to promote ESG goals. The banks themselves should they need to redesign their credit systems, their recovery processes, Okay, the stress testing models need to be recalibrated. Uh, a little bit more around innovation, of course, we know the banks are going into digital banking uh, and all that, but it's important to also pay attention to some of the cyber security infrastructure and data protection capabilities, you know, as we think of, you know, what we want to do to promote uh, sustainability goals in the banking sector. Uh, like uh, Shalakwe mentioned, it's all about resilience, about, you know, that will and commitment to do it. And if the central bank truly commits to promoting the goals of uh, sustainable uh, banking, I, I think it is it is possible. And therefore, I want to encourage us to go in this direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I think the panel the panel members have done a very um, great job discussing um, this matter. Um, when I started researching on sustainable banking about uh, ten to twelve years ago, um, I didn't know we'd be here today. So I want to congratulate the CIBN for taking the initiative to include sustainability in banking, you know, kind of strange, but it's also a good sign of progress. Uh, it might be slow, but we are moving with the rest of the world and I hope the journey continues. So this is just the beginning of the conversation and as it continues to intensify, hopefully the banks and the regulators will also be ahead of the, of the scenario. And also there is a role for the public sector here. I'm thinking about both the federal government and the state and even local government to ensure that the sustainable development goals and not just rhetoric, as Salafi has mentioned, we have less than 10 years to accomplish them. And the banks, the financial institutions will play a critical role in mainstreaming sustainability in the economy. So on that note, I want to hand back the, the conversation to uh, the compare and thank you all for participating. Uh, thank uh, Mrs. Falaki, Fatal Bay, represented by Paul Onigoji. I uh, also thank Mrs. Shalakwe Hammond, Mr. Kola Lawa, uh, Mrs. Fumio Gunlesi and Dr. Benson Uero. And um, thank you very much and, and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your, Your panelists, panelists not leave, leave just, just yet. yet. We, we do, do have one, one question virtually, virtually and um, I, will I will be opening, opening the floor very quickly. We will take a few more questions. questions. Our, Our first question virtually, virtually comes from Chidi Ibuji. And he says, in sustainable, in sustainable banking, banking principle, how, how can bankers mitigate against fraud from internet crime? He has, he has put, put Yahoo boys, boys here. here. Uh, and, and that's, that's from Chidi Ibochi. Professor Amishi, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, you're going to have to live in the next two minutes, right? So. Um, so maybe you can take over from here and see who can, because I talked to you to end by 3.15 and I'm drawing it to a close to jump onto another meeting now. So maybe if you can continue without me, that would be great. And, uh, but it's been a pleasure with yourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, that, is, that is perfectly fine, Professor. So, so let's, let's um, we, we still have the panelists there. The, the question, question is from Chidi Iboji. 
he says, in sustainable banking principle, how can bankers mitigate against fraud from Yahoo Boys? That's internet crime. Well, again, I, 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 I'm again, subject to my colleague, um, Colin, and anybody else. Uh, again, it's building in resilience, like Shalakwe said, into our processes. Obviously, every single bank is impacted um, by cybercrime. And so in, in banks in Nigeria, both in collaboration with the regulator under the FSS, the Deputy Governor Aisha, and, um, uh, and within the industry, we are building up capacity to stay one step ahead of cybercrime. You know, there's a lot of training across the board. City uh, last year actually ran, we, do, we run simulations. We run continuity of business processes to, to, to check what would happen if you were attacked, if you had one of these malware attacks. How do you ensure continuity of business? Every single bank in Nigeria I know has a COB site that you'll be able to step up within the next hour after an attack and so on. For City, we um, regularly run simulations, we build training, there's a constant focus, both at a global level, leveraging, we have various cybersecurity agencies around the world that check what the latest information is on cyber and infosec and parlay it locally. Last year, in collaboration with Central Bank of Nigeria, the World Bank, the IFC, and in, I think, six, seven countries in Africa, we ran a cyber security simulation, and also with the banking industry, several banks, the Stock Exchange, NIBS, who were hosted by NIBS, we ran two-day cyber security simulation. Extremely fascinating, and we're actually hoping to run similar programs in the, in the months to come. But the, I think the key thing is resilience, staying one step ahead, information and training. Thank you. I'd like to jump on that as well, because I had an interesting conversation about this uh, last, you know, on Sunday, uh, talking to someone who works in the space, the security sector. And um, I think it's important for us to separate motivation. So there are people who do this because it's fun, it's thrilling for them, it's on the edge, but they're happy to actually play either side. So what we need to do in that case is recruit them to be white hat hackers and be on our side and actually help us to arrest those that are trying to do it from a mischievous perspective. There are also those who do it because they're just not enough opportunity. So we bring them together and create opportunities. You know, the concept of cognitive dissonance, no one really wants to be out there doing bad. There are probably some people who are, but a vast majority could be doing it because that's the only opportunity that they see. So I think if we came together and worked together with them in a way um, that didn't, you know, in a way that they could relate to and understand, we could actually use them to actually secure the system. Because, you know, this person I was speaking to is actually working with uh, someone who, you know, is quite an infamous hacker and now supports them and, you know, gives them a heads up on what needs to be done and really has helped them to improve their security system. So I think we just need to engage Security is security industry, online security industry. Our uh, speaker representing Ms. Falake Mipatagwe, Mr. Paul Onibodu, Mrs. Sholakwe Hammond, Mrs. Kumi Ogunlesi, HCIB, Mr. Kola Lawal, and Dr. Benson Uweru. Thank you very much. Those were our speaker and our panelists for session, session two, two, risks of, of facilitating a sustainable future. Are banks prepared? Let's, Let's give them a round of applause, please. At, At this point, point it's a, a point that, that uh, secretly I've been waiting for. for. It's, it's uh, time for us to get, get some lunch. Um, lunch. Lunch is 30, 30 minutes, and, and then we're moving into breakout sessions. sessions. Now, now one, one of these sessions will take place right here in this hall and, and the second is upstairs in the Cano room now that is near the congress hall mezzanine so you go out of the doors at the rear and go upstairs which is also the direction you're going for lunch now up those stairs and in the mezzanine lunch is ready 
we, we will, will be back in, in half an hour for these breakout, breakout sessions. sessions. Now, now the, the breakout, breakout sessions are the, the impact of finance on emerging sectors, sectors spotlight on MSMES, manufacturing, manufacturing creativity, and agriculture industries. Now, now that, that will take place in this conference, conference hall. And the second breakout session is the impact of finance on emerging sectors, leveraging digital by the banking industry. This, this will take place in the Cano room, which is also upstairs in the, the mezzanine. That's, That's what's up. up. We've got 30, 30 minutes. In 30, 30 minutes, I will be back up here. Uh, there won't be too, too much grace because we are running, running rather late. So please, we, we have, have broken for lunch. lunch. Thank you very much for the attention and for being participants today. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot. Thank you. Um, Lagos, if you're listening, we are now breaking for lunch. It's half an hour, and then we go into our breakout sessions, um, just so you know what we're doing. We will resume here in half an hour with our breakout sessions. Breakout one. And two, breakout session, session one is here. here. In, In this hall, breakout two is upstairs the Cano room, and, and we are resuming at 3.45. 3.35. Please be back in your respective breakout sessions at 3.35. I would, I would urge that if you are having lunch, please proceed now for same. That way we won't have any further delays in resuming with our breakout sessions. We have limited time. Um, Lagos, if, if, if you can, can hear me, please indicate that you can hear me. In Abuja, Abuja we are breaking for lunch here to resume at 3.35. So can you please relay that information to your guests so they know exactly what's going on. We're breaking for lunch now, and we will resume with the breakout sessions at 3.35 p.m. Prompt. Lagos, Lagos, can, can you, you please, please acknowledge? For those, those joining us virtually, um, you, you can, can have lunch too if you, you haven't, haven't already, already because obviously, obviously we can't see you. You could have had a plate of ever with a kusi soup in front of you, uh, and we wouldn't be any the wiser. But um, um, we, we are, are breaking for lunch here. We'll resume at 3.35. Lagos, I haven't heard from you, so I don't know that you have heard, heard what's, what's going on, on but uh, we, we are breaking, breaking and we will resume at 3.35 p.m. prompt.
Thank you. 
Welcome, Welcome back. back. I've, I've never, never quite been able to uh, determine whether a good meal in the afternoon makes you more or less attentive or more or less inclined to get involved in the second or third part of a program. I guess we'll find that out today. A slight uh, a correction on uh, the earlier announced venues for the breakout sessions. Breakout session one will be taking place in the Cano room and that's to the rear of the Congress Hall mezzanine. So if you had, where you had your lunch, there is a room, the Cano room, at the back of that mezzanine just by one, one of the staircase, one, one of the stairwells. That's, that's the entrance to the Cano room. And, and that, that is where breakout session one will be taking place. Breakout session one is the impact of finance on emerging sectors, spotlight on MSMEs, manufacturing, creativity, and agriculture industries. So once more, breakout session one will be, be taking place in the Cano room, and that, that is on the mezzanine upstairs to the rear of where you just had lunch. Breakout session two, which is the impact of finance on emerging sectors, leveraging digital by the banking industry, will take place in this conference hall. So, so just, just downstairs where you just left. That, that is where breakout session two will be taking place. We already have our chairman for breakout session two seated. Um, join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Shegun Aino, OFR, FCIB. The, the president, president, Africa Fintech, Fintech Network, and, and chairman, Udwa Investment Company Limited. Good, Good afternoon, sir. The rest of uh, them are joining us virtually. I will move to the speaker, Mr. Demola Adebise, HCIB, the GMD CEO, Wema Bank PLC. Our uh, next uh, panelists are Mr. Mr. Mitchell Elegbe, GMD founder, InterSwitch Group. Mr. Olubenga Aguala, co-founder, Flutterwave. And Ms. Mrs. Shola Oladunjoye, principal, Global Banking, Standard Chartered Bank, Nigeria Limited. I'm going to run through this one more time. We already, we already have, have our chairman seated, Dr. Shegun Aino, OFR, FCIB, President, Africa Fintech Network, and Chairman, Odo Investment Company Limited. Our speaker, Mr. Demola Adebise, HCIB, GMD CEO, Wema Bank PLC. And our panelists for session two are Mr. Mitchell Elegbe, GMD, founder, InterSwitch Group, Mr. Olubenga Aguola, Co-founder, Flutterwave, and, and Mrs. Shola Oladunjoye, Principal, Global Banking, Standard Chartered Bank, Nigeria Limited. Moving over to breakout session one, the impact of finance on emerging sectors, spotlight on MSMES, manufacturing, creativity, and agriculture industries. Our anchor there is Dr. Jemala Shogunle, HCIB, Chief Executive, Stambic IBTC Holdings, PLC. And, and the panelists are Mr. Osai Gogo Omorogwe, Divisional Head, SME Banking, Fidelity Bank, PLC. Mr. Johnson, Saint De Samuel, MBCEO, Infinity Paint International Limited. Mr. Jorge Silva, MFR, Nollywood Actress and Executive Director, Lupodo Group of Companies. Mr. Onyeka Akuma, Founder, Farm Crowdy. Mr. Ayodeji Balogun, Chief Executive Officer, Apex Commodity Exchange. 
and, and Mr. Oluwa Beniga Adelowo, Manager, Corporate Bank, United, United Bank for Africa. Africa. In breakout session one, I will pop in in due course, but for the purpose of kicking things off, here at breakout session two, I will be handing over to our chairman, Dr. Shegu Aino, OFR, FC, IB, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, um, Director of the Program. And I want to say good afternoon to you all, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are, because I know we have uh, a lot of people on this call from different parts of the world. Uh, I'm uh, here in Abuja. I know a number of our panelists are in Lagos, and I believe uh, a number of us are also joining virtually. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want, I want to thank the Federal of Bankers of Nigeria, the leadership of the team led by the President, for putting this together. Uh, in spite of the uh, COVID that we've had, we did not allow that to affect the planning of our annual event. And this, uh, and this conference is really very really historic. And I'm going to give kudos to the organizing committee under the able leadership of Patrick Akinosa for being so ingenious and for the uh, amount of work we are putting into this. I've been listening to some of the activities this morning, and I'm so impressed with what you have done. So thank you all uh, for, for what you have put together. I welcome you all again to this uh, session, the breakout session two, which is uh, focusing on the impact of finance on emerging sectors. Uh, as you know, uh, the emerging sector has been broken into two. I think session one is addressing areas of agriculture and other areas, but we are giving specific uh, special uh, focus on banking. That's, that's why we are looking at how banks have been, I mean, how uh, banks have been leveraging on digital uh, to uh, do their work. That is, the impact of finance on emerging sectors, leveraging digital by the banking industry. Um, the, uh, the advent of internet over 30 years ago and mobile, uh, mobile technology uh, in Nigeria about 19 years ago. We've seen, We've seen a lot of transformation that have happened in many sectors, particularly in the banking industry, and most especially with the payment and services and payment sector, which is now going to do so many other areas. So we know that banks have leveraged really on digital, but have we done enough? What are the issues? What are the challenges? How can we use it to drive financial inclusion? How can we use it to, you know, economically empower our, our people? So, so these are the issues that we look at today. And, and we, we are, are happy and uh, uh, privileged to have the distinguished uh, personalities, uh, industry thought leaders, who will be giving their perspective on the journey so far, and of course the way ahead in terms of how banks can leverage digital to deliver their services. As um, the director of programs has said earlier on, the the speaker, the main speaker for this uh, session will be Mr. Adebola Adebiche, who is the Group Managing Director of uh, Weber Bank. Um, uh, Weber Bank, I'm sure everybody knows about uh, ALAT, uh, a digital bank that Weber Bank um, uh, put together. This is again some of the benefits that digital, the region of digital has helped in the financial services industry. Demola is an accountant, a banker, he's been a consultant, and he has his uh, first degree in uh, ICT, so, so you can see that it combines a lot of things. things. I'm, I'm sure in the 25 minutes presentation, we'll be able to uh, uh, identify some of the issues that are you know, linked to this subject matter and be able to share over 20 years of experience working in banks and in uh, consulting. After the presentation, we will have uh, a panel of three uh, people, uh, very, very distinguished personalities. The first person is Mr. Michel Elebe, who is the Group Managing Director and founder in InterSwitch Group. Before Michel founded InterSwitch in 2001 or so, he used to be one of the executives in TEDx. TEDx is one of the pioneer technology companies in, in Nigeria. I remember in my days in banking, he used to do TEDx in Echo Bank and you know, other places. And um, uh, in that capacity, while he was in TEDx, he actually implemented with other others, Nigeria's first online and real time transaction switching and payment processing infrastructure. 
in Nigeria. We see that Michel has come, in, has come a long way on this issue of digital. So we are very happy to have uh, uh, Michel, the founder of Interswitch, and very strongly the fact that Interswitch was probably the first payment system company, the first fintech company, I would say, that has reached the uh, 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 one billion uh, mark in terms of assets. Recently, you are in the news, Visa, by 20% of in that company for 200 million dollars. So that means they're a unicorn, a company that has reached a valuation of about a billion dollars. So thank you. So congratulations, Michel, on that feat. We'll be able to hear from you some of the things that I should share with that and how your interaction continues to support the sector. Next is Oluwega GB, called GB, Oluwega Bola, so the co-founder and CEO of Totalwave. Big has worked in various banks, GT Bank, Access Bank, Google, Alam Stambi, Gazons, a certified ethical lacquer, is a fintech engineer, and also a Microsoft certified system engineer. So, Big has been sharing his thoughts with us on this subject matter. And last but not least is Mr. Shola Olamidoye, principal global banking, standard chartered bank. Nigeria is an economist and an accountant, and um, he, he, he coordinates the regional activities of accountant managers in uh, Standard Chartered Bank. Before Standard Chartered Bank, he worked in the research capital and investment uh, uh, organization uh, in, in, in Nigeria. So, this is a group, but this is a line up of the eminent personalities that we are addressing us on this subject matter. Uh, this so, we are in for very, very interesting, interesting and very, very great uh, times. Um, and the presentation by Ademola Adebishi will uh, start now. The company in five years. So I would like to invite Ademola to make his presentation in not more than 25 minutes, after which um, we will go on to the panelists and ask them specific questions, and then we will also address some other areas of the topic and the paper presented by the Molala. After that, we we'll have the question and answer session uh, or comments, comments, you know, uh, more input into what has been discussed, and then we'll wrap it up with the closing uh, remarks. So, so, Mr. Debeche, if you are ready, can you please start your presentation on the topic, the impact of finance on emerging sectors, leveraging digital by the banking industry. Over to you, Molala. Thank you, um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank you for that uh, interesting um, introduction. Um, I'm indeed very delighted uh, to be a part of uh, this session this afternoon. Um, I also want to thank the um, organizers, uh, presidents of the CIBN, uh, Mr. Patrick Akimuto, the, the chairman of the uh, team that put this together. Uh, it's indeed um, very interesting. I've been I've been on the on the on the sessions uh, since morning, and I think the the topics have been quite properly selected uh, for this purpose. Um, earlier in the morning, Dr. Enelama talked about uh, three things: um, capital, infrastructure, and technology uh, to push financial inclusion. Now, this afternoon, uh, over the next few few minutes, I'll be talking about the technology side of um, things, zooming in on it. And um, thankfully, I have um, experts uh, to support me uh, in, the, uh, in the audience. The topic, let me just share my, um, permit me to share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, yes you can. can. Okay, good. Uh, basically, the topic is around um, how do we leverage technology uh, to push financial inclusion uh, in emerging sectors. And um, we'll be talking around um, five key things. Um, how do we leverage digitization to drive financial inclusion? Uh, positioning the banking industry as a catalyst uh, towards um, uh, sustainable, inclusive growth through leveraging disruptive innovations, 
a number of things are happening. Uh, a lot of things are happening, and things are happening very, very fast. Uh, we're going to be looking at some provide some actors in the in the in the fintech uh, space uh, who are doing great things also uh, to support uh, uh, financing uh, the emerging sectors. And of course, we'll be looking at challenges and the way forward. COVID, as we all see, uh, we all say that uh, we are all in the new normal. Um, just permit me to, sorry. Sorry, permit me to uh, put up my screen. COVID-19 has uh, changed the landscape. Um, Pre-COVID, a number of, um, we were all doing things, um, co coasting on normally, but in the last two, three months, um, we've seen a major, major shift. Uh, we talk about the new normal now. Um, Satya Nadella, uh, the CEO of um, Microsoft, recently said that the world has experienced two years of digital transformation within two months. And this is actually happening, and um, the fintech industry, uh, the, the the financial services industry, is not um, left behind. In fact, we are at the forefront of um, what is um, going on. And um, talking about financial inclusion, it's even more important now um, with the new normal um, for a number of activities happening uh, in these uh, in this space. Uh, digitization. We all talk about digitization. We talk about digitalization. We have our digital transformation. I think it's important that we try to distinguish uh, between this because we tend to use these words interchangeably. Digitization is actually the process of converting from analog and uh, into um, uh, uh, a digitized form. For example, a document. Converting a document from a manual, a physical form into, uh, it does not, it's just a, a manual process if it's left at digitization. But when we talk about digitalization, we tend to move a, a step further. Uh, that is when we begin to talk about changing the process to make it more efficient using technology. And that's digitalization. And of course, digital transformation is the old gamut of uh, having to change a complete business model. Uh, to improve on um, on the uh, on the processes. For example, a number of businesses, a number of sectors were affected by COVID, and um, due to the fact that business processes or business models changed overnight, you know, as a result of uh, COVID, and uh, this has led to a number of phenomenal things that have happened. Things are happening so fast. Um, basically, what we're trying to do here uh, over the next few slides is basically to look at how we're going to can use financial technology to drive financial inclusion. And um, in, a, in a sustainable manner, uh, we're going to be looking at the players in the sector. Uh, we're going to be looking at the risks and how to mitigate some of these risks ahead. Talking about the digital economy, the digital economy, basically we're talking about using um, technologies uh, to drive the economy. And some people will say that uh, it's about how to do business on the internet, uh, on the World Wide Web. You know, uh, there's several definitions for digital economy. But basically, things are changing. Um, today, we have a number of players. Uh, we have the traditional banks. Uh, we have the fintechs rising up very, very fast, and they're eating into the uh, the, the banking space, the traditional banks, uh, the space where the traditional banks are actually operating. And then outside of that also, we also have uh, players even outside the, uh, the, the, the banking industry, uh, the financial technology industry, where we have players operating. Um, we don't see them as competitors, but they're actually competitors. I mean, Amazon started off as a retail, uh, a retail uh, outlet. Uh, but today they are the largest technology company in the world. So basically we see a lot of things happening and um, and all the things, the, what we're talking about here is all around innovation, innovation, um, using technologies around machine learning, artificial intelligence, we talk about big data. We all historically have, we sit on a lot of data 
but we don't make any sense out of it. Uh, we now talk about data being the new oil, you know. Uh, so we talk about robotics. How do we improve our processes um, with robotics? A number of things are happening that are mundane. Can we replace them with, um, with robotics? You know, so a number of all these things are underlying that is the fact that the value proposition that is being pushed is basically simplicity, um, customer experience, and um, efficiency. Those are the key things that is being pushed. Now, talking about coming back to financial inclusion, um, we see a number of things. I'm not going to talk about the traditional things that we already know, um, but we're just going to be talking about some of the other things that we probably are not um, probably focusing on or have not seen. Um, today, we talk about key things around identity. Identity. Yes, we all know about the BVN and all that, uh, NIMC and all that. I won't talk about that. But uh, of course, there are other um, technologies that um, we can also utilize. Working in an ecosystem, for example, with the telcos, uh, things around geofencing, things around geotagging. For example, in the agri space, um, agriculture, we talk about the entire value chain. How do you ensure that from the commodity buyer up to the last mile, the, the, the farmer in the, in the farm, in the rural area, how do we identify them? Probably don't have BVNs, but we can adopt things around um, geotagging, geofencing, um, to identify identify these um, farmers. Um, these are technologies that are already, already there on social media. We, we are already there today. Uh, it's not um, something that is still coming. Um, again, talking about um, trust, um, we begin to talk about uh, things around awareness. Uh, we talk about wallets today, a number of players in the fintech space they create wallets. Uh, wallets have, um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, requirements, KYC requirements, probably have lesser um, requirements. Um, again, these are ways of uh, ensuring um, that we are able to create that uh, big trust uh, amongst. Uh, we talk about AI and robotics. Um, recently, the central bank introduced, uh, uh, ensured that um, the we improve the trust within the um, ecosystem, all the digital channels that we have, setting tighter SLAs. For example, when you talk about chargebacks or when we talk about uh, uh, resolving co complaints from customers. Now, the way to go about this is not about putting human beings there. It's about intelligent systems, using robotics to deal with uh, a number of uh, all these things. Today, we also talk about talking about COVID, um, again, we are talking about how do we do transaction in a contactless matter, manner. We talk about um, QR codes, QR codes. Uh, a number of technologies exist now. The mobile phone can recognize QR codes very easily. All we just need to do is integrate this into our system and, um, uh, and up we go. Um, yes, there are other technologies around USSD that uh, would uh, ensure that the last mile is taken care of. Uh, but I'm not going to be delving too much on that uh, at this point. Now, talking about innovation itself, innovation is very, very key. Uh, what we see today is um, a number of players in the market who are trying to create an environment where innovation thrives. Now, one thing people always make the mistake of is they think that um, throwing technology at it will solve the problem. It's not about throwing technology at it. It's way beyond having a deep pocket. It's all about culture. It's all about people. How do you ensure you put everything together uh, to make um, to to solve the problem that we are trying to uh, solve? Again, the other bit also is the fact that um, a number of uh, players, uh, traditional banks, we talk about um, ideas generation. How do you generate ideas? For example, those in the rural areas, they don't have data. How do you do things in an offline mode? You know, a lot of all these ideas you can get. Um, coming up with um, things around uh, setting up hackathons. Um, the last session was on sustainability and all that. How do we generate ideas? How do we improve our society? Um, hackathon is a very good way of um, generating ideas. You throw it open 
identify social problems and uh, throw them open through an hackathon. Uh, we had a, a, a physical hackathon last year, uh, but this year we're going to be having a virtual hackathon. And the whole idea is a number of all the thing, ideas that we get, um, we, we can actually use to improve the system. Um, we talk about um, cooperation, building an ecosystem. Um, this is inevitable. You cannot be an island onto yourself. Uh, it's important that um, you build an ecosystem. Um, you need to have systems that are interoperably, uh, op, 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 you cannot interoperate. Um, we need to uh, ensure that um, things work very smoothly. A very key example is the SANEF. Um, it's an ecosystem for ensuring that financial inclusion um, thrives. And uh, I, I guess the, 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 the program is really way, well, well on course. I think a number of players have talked about this. Um, uh, speakers have talked about it in previous sessions uh, this morning. Uh, again, the other bit also is around um, approvals, regulatory approvals. Um, the central bank and other regulators are, are getting more and more aware and um, living up to expectation these days. Um, a number of products are being churned out and uh, to support financial inclusion. And the central bank is actually playing a major role, uh, is at the forefront of, the, of ensuring that this, um, this happens. I will see a lot of things happening in terms of policies that are coming out, a lot of things around shared services, a lot of, a lot of things in the cyber security space, having a, a shared SOC, uh, Security Operations Center, um, having sandboxes, ensuring that uh, fintechs are able to work very closely with traditional banks, um, setting up sandboxes. So a number of all these frameworks, the central bank is uh, putting that uh, together. And I believe that uh, with this, we can uh, continue to address um, uh, all this. A major issue that uh, was raised uh, earlier in the day about um, costs of doing business, especially for the bottom of the pyramid and all that, um, a technology that really can address this is the blockchain. Um, again, for us, we're still number of, I mean, the central bank is still testing this in, the, in our ecosystem. Uh, some other clients has already been used. Uh, we believe that with blockchain, that can, you know, can crash the costs of doing business, cost of uh, uh, doing business um, financially. Again, talking about positioning the industry, we've talked about uh, digital disruption. Uh, the father of disruption is the uh, late Professor Clayton Christensen of Harvard University. Uh, he was the one who came up with this. And um, a number of this is happening today. Uh, we see disruptions taking place. The fintechs are hitting very heavily into the traditional bank space, uh, coming up with tremendous uh, ways of improving on how to deal with financial inclusion. Um, one other thing that we see is the fact that uh, uh, we have an opportunity also to leapfrog. Um, barriers are dropping, you know, uh, leapfrogging is very important. Um, Again, from the legacy systems of the traditional banks, uh, we see fintechs have been able to uh, leapfrog into, into new technologies that can deal with uh, um, uh, problems. And of course, um, they can do it in a much uh, safer, cheaper way, in such a way that uh, uh, the barriers to entry uh, is, uh, is lower. Innovation, innovation, we, talk, we keep talking about that. I've talked about the different types of technologies uh, that can be used uh, to improve on financial inclusion. Uh, I'm talking about AI, machine learning, blockchain. Now, this also brings to the fore that the fact that skills are also going to change. The skills that will be required in the financial services space um, over the next few years is going to change completely uh, from the traditional way of looking at things. It's already changing. We have different workforces within the banking, uh, within the banking, even the traditional banking industry different workforces uh, dealing with different things. Uh, here we talk about um, data scientists, talk about software engineers, scrum masters and all that. These are all new technologies. And it's important that as, as bankers, we begin to um, upskill in order to deal with, uh, with this. Now, everybody talks about platform, platform, platform-based models. Uh, that is the buzzword again, you know, um, but again, uh, different strategies to achieving uh, plat uh, the platform and uh, architecture. What do we mean by platform? Basically, what we're saying is that 
We're bringing all parties onto a platform to do their business, to exchange goods and services, uh, you know, in such a way that um, makes life easy for everybody. That is uh, in a very simple way, uh, putting it. Of course, the platform ensures that uh, uh, the rules of the game are maintained and all that. So that is the direction of the digital transformation. A lot of people are going towards the platform uh, model. And of course, one thing that digitization also um, digitalization also does is operational efficiency. Uh, the, there's a school of thought believes that as we move towards the digital space, initial costs may be high, but over time, as we begin to migrate customers onto the, onto the digital platform, um, we, we begin to see uh, improved um, uh, bottom line, of course, as a result of improved services as well. One key thing that is very key is customer experience. Customer experience runs through all this. Everything is around customer experience, ensuring that everybody along the pyramid, the bottom of the pyramid, all to the top, they all are served one way or the other. Now, talking about what is going on um, in the space and then some of the players that have been playing in the different segments. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, um, sectors like a Greek, uh, ICT, healthcare, and education. Uh, of course, I see that are, the, are these sectors we are going to be discussing around. And of course, we have players doing great things uh, along this um, space. For example, if you pick the Greek space, uh, we talk about the Greek value chain. How do we impact it up to the last mile? You know, the farmer in the, in the, in the farm. How does the farmer? pick his goods and pick them to the market to sell. The logistics, all these things, they are technology solutions that addresses every segment of the value chain, agri value chain, you know, from the cost commodity buyer all the way to uh, the last mile, the farmer. Um, we have players like Farm Crowdy. What they do is, for example, how to access finance. You do not need to know about agri, but um, you can invest in agri through uh, crowdfunding and um, of course the the farmers can have access to this funding uh, they're doing great things um talking about uh, mobile money agency banking i think a lot of discussions are going on this uh, you know cellulant is a, a player in this space um through wallets they also create a way such that you can actually transact along that value chain um without physical cash um you know, uh, talking about e-money, what using wallets. Uh, Paga is also a player in this space. Um, talking about the lending space, um, it's also important. Uh, an orange seller can actually go in the morning on his um, on his mobile phone, uh, request for 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 financing to go and buy oranges in the market uh, in the in the farm. Goes to the market. Um, sells the oranges and by evening is is uh, repaying his loan uh, the loan that he took all this can be done through digital lending now digital lending is something that um, again is coming up um pretty fast uh, the limitations again has to do with um, uh, how robust our lending algorithms are and of course the local nuances uh, that we have uh, in this in, in, in this in this area Payments, payment, payment. That's a major, major chunk, um, a major uh, aspect of uh, the digital uh, landscape. Uh, we have players like Flutterwave uh, into Switch uh, playing very heavily in this space. Um, again, SMEs, uh, lending to SMEs. We have the likes of Lydia. Uh, so quite a number of things are happening. Also insurance. You can insure yourself uh, digitally as well. Uh, we have Cassava. Uh, doing things along the along the space, so quite a number of um, activities can happen. Ribi is providing financial inclusion uh, through cooperatives, uh, where uh, members of the cooperatives can actually um, uh, have access to financing, you know, uh, to be able to do their their stuff. So a number of all these things are happening, and it's happening pretty fast. Um, uh, yeah. Talking about the impact of finance on the emerging sector, again, you talk about the digital economy, I've talked about that. In education, we've seen a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, transformation in the last three months with the COVID. 
a uh, number of um, things are happening, uh, learning is happening online, um, exams, everything have been all online, you know, and all these things require um, financing. Uh, so the education sector is actually uh, uh, doing quite well uh, in terms of uh, uh, ability to be able to deal with them, uh, all the startups and all the uh, people there. Uh, agri tech, I've talked about agri tech, I've talked about players like uh, Cellulant and all that are playing very heavily uh, in this uh, space. ICT, communication, we've had a lot around um, a lot of transformation in terms of uh, how do we engage customers, how do we engage uh, uh, in the new normal. Um, data, data, data is very important. And of course, the ICT sector, as we've seen, has created a lot, has added a lot to our GDP. And we begin to see a lot of transformation uh, in that space. Today, we talk about remote work. Uh, we talk about uh, virtual meetings. Quite a number of things happening um, uh, all over. So really, and also, of course, the health, health sector cannot be overemphasized in terms of uh, application of technology. Uh, in this space, uh, again, it's really post-COVID. Uh, so really, it's um, it's it's these are sectors that a lot of things are happening, and players in this sector, uh, uh, technology is very very key at this um, at this point. Um, SMEs is, is about forty five. It creates about forty five percent of employment and thirty three percent of GDP, um, based on um, statistics. Um, of course, they've been eats very hard, but again, we see that um, there are lots, lots and lots of um, opportunity. Uh, we need to open up that space to ensure that uh, um, financing uh, is, 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 is possible. Um, again, key things around liquidity. Liquidity is very important. Um, how do they access um, liquidity? Uh, to venture capital, to other, other forms of investments, of course, there's the issue of credits. Uh, the central bank has been has been at the forefront, uh, especially during these uh, the recent times, uh, introducing a lot of palliatives, um, you know, again towards uh, the SME sectors, you know, and all that. And of course, they've been at the forefront on the things around SANEF providing funding to ensure that there's financial inclusion and all that. Again, wrapped around all this is the fact that risk management, a robust risk management is important uh, for us to be able to uh, continue to uh, do quite well in this, uh, in this way, in this space. So digital disruption, um, it's, it's very key. It's um, something we, it's a direction. Uh, Everybody is talking about it. Uh, but then again, we're all taking different routes towards it. But eventually we must ensure that uh, this is where, where we, should, uh, we should be. Um, finally, again, um, talk about challenges. Again, as we move towards this space, there will always be challenges. Um, some of the challenges we've had in previous uh, discussions, I will just rehash a few more. Um, it's important that um, policymakers, uh, the regulators, uh, continue to nurture innovation. Um, the central bank is doing quite a bit, quite a lot in this um, in this in this space. A number of things happening. Um, trying to introduce some boxes, um, shared services for for banks and the shared services. Um, we have the SANEF and all that. So a number of all these um, cybersecurity frameworks are being introduced to ensure that um, um, we're, we're also mindful of the fact that those risks will, they will be there. They cannot be completely um, avoided, but of course they can be mitigated. You know, uh, so a number of all these things are happening. Um, we're beginning to see a lot of collaboration, um, you know, uh, between the fintechs and the banks. Collaboration is, is, is important. You can't be an island unto yourself. Um, banks are introducing APIs. Banks are sitting on data. They're introducing APIs where fintechs who have complementary um, uh, services can actually access. And a lot of all these things are taking place. So there's a lot happening uh, in this space, and it's important that uh, we, we are mindful of this and that we try to put everything together to try to see how we can further improve on financial inclusion um, in, in, in Nigeria. Uh, I think on that note, I just want to end um, my presentation.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I hand over back to you. Thank you very much. Can you give the Dumola a round of applause? He has uh, given us so much within uh, a few minutes. Fully loaded with a lot of uh, takeaways for us. I'm sure um, during the uh, discussion of the session, we want to uh, you know, ask him some, some few things, things that are not be clear, clear to us. us. He's discussed about five different uh, areas. He's shown us the importance of uh, the necessity for deep problem, which a lot of institutions have been doing. The kind of product that we have in the market space, ranging from, from you know, digital savings, uh, digital learning, digital insurance products, uh, also called uh, InsurTech, you know, mobile, mobile money, and, and so on and so on and so forth. And of course, we also went into how uh, uh, digital as a particular in other sectors that the people, you know, as bank, as bank, bank, as bank, bank we deal with all the various sectors on the economy and whether apples in those areas also, also, also affect, affect the, the, bank, bank, the, bank, bank, in, the bank, bank industry. industry. Telemedicine. You know, you know, something that's also, also is, you know, you know yeah, yeah, involved in. And it ended with discussing issues and about challenges, especially around regulation. You know, but the good news is that regulators are actually also using soft-tech, that's why we're publishing technology, and regulatory and regulatory technology to also advance the scope of uh, innovation. I mean, the, the scope of uh, you know, technology in the financial services is also able to help them to render, to render their regulatory um, services as efficiently as possible and to also advance and promote uh, innovation. We'll be talking more about that during the question and answer session. Thank you very much again, Nimalala, for the wonderful um, presentation. Um, we'll be coming back to you um, in about um, 15 minutes' time uh, during the question and answer session. Um, we'll, then, we'll now call on our panelists to please speak to somebody that they will say, or introduce new areas that are within the uh, theme of this, uh, this session. And the first person that will call upon is Michel Legre, I've already introduced him to you. And um, I want him to, in his five minutes presentation, focus on areas as in, I mean, he's a significant player in this uh, industry. I've been mean, operated for many years. And I know that he's been part of the uh, proposition that, that is happening in the last 20 years in the digital space. space. So, so Michelle wants to tell us, are, are we really doing enough? Are uh, banks leveraging enough on digital? What, what are the, are the, where, where are the gaps? gaps? What, what are the other areas, areas that you think banks and the general sector should focus, focus on in terms of leveraging on digital to be able to provide the kind of benefits that we have seen and that we will continue uh, uh, to see? As you tell us, what, 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 what are the challenges that are impeding growth, and how do we remain customer-centric in terms of crafting solutions that will address customer needs? So um, let me welcome uh, Michelle Legre to please um, provide this sort of intervention, particularly uh, on this area of the pipeline. Michelle? Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. First, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for having it fit for me to be a panelist. Thank you to you. Uh, I think Mr. Debisher has done a very fantastic job um, addressing most of the areas that I personally think are quite important. Uh, he's done a very good job addressing them. So what I'd like to do is just speak a lot of contribution uh, in areas that I feel some of the ideas I has put into areas that we can actually develop from. I think the fact that banks can understand the, the impacts or the potential of technology for digitization in their business is not in doubt. 
not about in Nigeria. Uh, there are various studies out there that have shown that when banks adopt the position of serving their customers, they potentially could achieve a double the upgrade credit. Um, they could reduce the costs by as much as 30 percent and of course double return on equity. I think that general view is very clear amongst banks. One advantage we have as a country that should actually help drive digitization is the fact that we have a very youthful population. With more than 50% of Nigerians being youth, and not only are they youth, these are people who also have shown a strong affinity for technology. We put that group of youth from the affinity for technology together, it gives you a very powerful mix that allows the rapid adoption of digitization. So if we're not achieving that degree of digitization or inclusion, as I like to say, we need to step back and ask ourselves the question, why not? Why not? I've seen a previous reports from consultants, researchers, show that despite the of the banks, the central bank itself, all the players in the past in the last 20 years, when you could really say Nigeria has moved into the era of modern technology-driven banking, payment penetration less than 10 percent so when you are there like in which the question that comes to your mind if the last 20 years we've all worked very hard and penetration is at 10 percent do we want to lose the next 20 years to get another 10 percent or must you begin to think about ways to do things differently. Now, when I think about payment in Nigeria, there's a picture that comes to my head most times. It looks like cash is sitting comfortably in a vehicle, and that vehicle has taken off and is accelerating, and digital is chasing it on foot. So it's like we're working very hard pushing technologies, but that elimination of cash appears to be accelerating. Clearly, chasing cash in a vehicle that's accelerating may not be the best way to go. So the question therefore is, what do we do? I've spent a reasonable amount of time trying to understand the Nigerian situation the progress we have made, the challenges we face, and what it keeps coming to mind that we have enough challenges to propel the right level of investment to actually go after opportunities. And I think if we learn from what we have done in banking, the banking industry itself, the fintechs can begin to take lessons from there and try to translate them into other areas. Many years ago, the banking sector decided to focus on the challenges of their customers. And that challenge, initially, we thought it was hard to eliminate cash, but later we realized that what the man on the street really wanted to have was just to get his cash on time, whenever he needs it, in the right amount. And that drove the first wave of adoption around the ATMs. Other waves of growth have come. USSD, for example, is one. And if you go back to check history of Nigerian payments, you'll discover that the areas where we invested the least in terms of advertising and so on and so forth, were the areas that grew fastest. And what is the lesson to take from that? The lesson is if you focus on the challenges that a common man faces in accessing funding, 
or becoming financially included, then we start a very good chance of driving adoption. Now, it is safe to assume that every Nigerian, no matter what they do, is involved in one form of economic activity or the other. They're exchanging value in one form or the other. So we talk about using technology, using digitization to drive financial inclusion, for example, we are basically saying, why are millions, tens of millions of Nigerians transacting in what appears to be a very inconvenient approach or manner? And banks being at the center, at the heart of commerce, what can banks do to help improve on this adoption. I know today this is about banking, but the truth is that I like to call on other industries to also look at what the banks have done. Okay? So today, everybody talks about FinTech, financial technology. In other words, applying technology to solve challenges in the financial ecosystem. There are challenges in the banking, in, in the agricultural ecosystem. So can we apply technology to agriculture? Yes, we, ha we have, we can. So the likes of Cellulant and a few others are in one way or the other beginning to address that challenge. But just like we have seen lots of companies, I'm sure at my last count, we have over 200 fintechs all trying to solve challenges around financial services sector. We need an equal number of, 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 of organizations dealing in other sectors. When you are in agriculture, I want to apply technology. Payment is the last thing that comes to your mind. Payment is something you want to plug into and if the APIs are there and they have service provide providers, you can do that easily. But somebody needs to think about in the heart of agriculture, with all the efforts that the central bank is making to make funds that are available in that sector, what are the enabling technologies, what I like to call agri-tech, that we need to put in place to unleash adoption, which will further enhance banking, because a lot more people in that sector to be financially included. When you go to housing, what can be done in housing in Nigeria? We have offices in Uganda. What do I see? People pay their rent. So those are monthly transactions. In Nigeria, we pay annually sometimes two years. How can we disrupt that? You go into retail, it's the same thing. When you talk to large FMCGs, they will tell you that less than 10% of the sales they make come from the formal sectors, comes from the shop rights, the games, the banners of the world, less than five to 10%. So the question is, that other 90% in retail, what kind of technologies can we put in place? What can we put in Okari to make it easy for the traders there to adopt technology in the transacting? We need to think about that. You come to transportation, the same thing. Where is our Oyster card? Where are the validators? Until we're able to go into these different sectors where a lot of transactions, economic activity, and we put in the right technology, the right infrastructure, just like we did with banking 17, 20 years ago. Once you do that, it becomes easy for that bridge to these sectors and banking to happen. 
And that is where you begin to see true financial division. We need to understand that people transact, that cash is not a problem for most people. I do not think there are many Nigerians who have 20,000 Naira in their company. So moving 20,000 Naira in their pocket is not a big deal. All right, yes. excuse me, uh, I'm, I'm so, so sorry, sorry to interrupt. interrupt. This, this is the MC, the chair has, has been trying to get your attention. attention. Okay, sorry, let me round up quickly. Okay, please. Yes, please. So in summary, therefore, what I think we need to do is to ensure that we are able to open up other sectors and all the open banking APIs that we're trying to create in bank the country through. Until those other sectors are open up, link to backing, we will have challenges. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much, Michelle. Michelle. I mean, uh, we're all, all in gross gross gross. Gross. We really enjoy it. I wish, I wish we, we have, have uh, more time. To be, yeah, I know you have so much to, to, to say, but we, we have a uh, little bit. I hope, hope sometimes in the near future, future CIBM will be able to bring you into a keynote on this very, very important. Time time to, to provide, provide uh, some, some more insights. Thank, Thank you very much. Let me then quickly go to Lubinga Agwala, the co founder and CEO of Total Wave. Lubinga uh, has said that he has worked in many banks, GT, Access, Tampic, before he went to venture into funding the FinTech. And we'll be able to share his experience in terms of uh, how they're working with banks. How banks are delivering on their yeah, products and other products, products available in the, 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 the market space, space, technology and innovation uh, space, and, and how, uh, the, how, how, how we think banks should be doing a lot more towards to providing solutions and making solutions available to, to our customers, particularly to drive financial inclusion uh, and provide convenience to customers. So, DB, over to you. Thank you so much, and very happy to be here today. Um, many thanks to the organizers of the conference, and great to hear um, Mr. Debisha speak, Mr. Ilegbe speak. Um, so from, from, from where we stand as a FinTech, right, um, we see the Oh, I think I lost connection for a second. Okay, from where we stand as a fintech, right? We see um, an opportunity to create a scale and superior customer experience for customers in, in Nigeria. And our goal, for example, of Florida Wave is to simplify payments for what we call endless possibilities. The, that cannot be achieved without the bank. So not a bank, we're just a fintech player, right? We, we, we rely on banks for if not 100% of what we do um, as a FinTech and a Florida Wave. But what I have seen so far um, across the board has been, the banks have been pretty, um, as compared to 2016, 2015, um, as of right now, the banks have been pretty supportive. A lot of the, a lot of the bank partners that we work with um, and across the ecosystem, we've seen them, you know, consistently trying to leverage what they have and giving that to us to build layers on, on, on that. And what I think is the biggest piece of that is even beyond building layers is basically harnessing and creating a new crop of customers. Um, as we can see, Nigeria is a growing country. The populace is um, average age is 20 to 30. The growth is, is huge at that level. Internet penetration is increasing across board. Mm. And for us, I thought a wave, our, those are basically, we're building the financial service of the future, right? We're building payment infrastructure that can make it sim simple for a small business to accept payments from anywhere in Nigeria and the world at large. An example of that is what we did um, earlier this year, where we built a product called Florida Store. Florida Store is a solution that makes it easy for a small merchant to put their wares online. When COVID struck, a lot of these merchants could not sell um, anymore. So we basically built this solution to, in like two, three months, to allow a small business put all their products online. 
be able to sell to anyone anywhere in the world and also ship to them, right? It's an example of what a fintech can do and do well. We can do, we can build scalable products and we can leverage on our bank partners, the card networks, and of course, the entire ecosystem to push it out. And what we've seen so far has been banks are becoming more and more open to fintech partnerships. Um, we, we've got a bunch of partners um, across board and we've seen that in a sense that they now understand the impact that we can make beyond the traditional banking ecosystem. And that for us is basically the biggest value prop for the entire, entire environment. Um, as a fintech, right, we're creating what I would call new value. And with new value comes what I also call new risk, right? And what I think is very important is for us to balance both. We have to ensure the risk being created is commensurate and we ensure that the entire ecosystem is well protected. And that's what we've done across, but compared to what most people might think about fintechs, I don't think any fintech is out there right now to, um, to disrupt a bank. I don't think so. Our job as a fintech is a complement, right? To build um, infrastructure and technology that can make payments, banking, invest tech easy. And you've seen the likes of, you know, Invest Bamboo, Ro uh, Riseverse, you know, companies creating new investment products. You've seen the likes of remittance companies springing up everywhere. And the goal here is building that infrastructure that makes it easy, that makes it work across board. And that's what I think we've seen in the last couple of months and year across the ecosystem. Yes, I would say the banks are becoming more and more open and we're seeing a lot more partnership going on across the board. And like I said, FinTech rely on banks for us to work. We need banks to even open more, right? We need banks to engage us more to be able to scale what we're building for customers. So for me, um, it's, a, it's a great place to be right now where the banks are partnering and even the, the what I would call the fintechs have been here for a long time, like Interswitch. Also, you know, opening up the ecosystem, partnering with other younger fintechs to ensure that we can all leverage the ecosystem. And that I think is the way to go. Banks, and the talking to us about how uh, banks should be leveraging the digital to particularly drive financial inclusion. And how the banking industry can be positioned to be able to do this to ensure sustainable inclusive financial services for customers. Thank you. 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 I, I, I hope it's not um, having connection problems. Why we uh, waiting for him to be able to stretch? Okay. Um, we, we hope, hope um, Shola will be joining us uh, uh, soon, but, but we will move, move on, on to the question and answer session, session and the uh, comments uh, from the audience. Uh, the director of programs will uh, uh, direct how that will go. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. We, we have, we're, we're opening, opening up the floor for questions. questions. That, that includes this hall. Um, you simply raise, raise your hand, hand if you have any questions. questions. Approach one of the microphones on either, either side of the hall and, and ask your question. question. For, for Lagos, for our session, session, breakout session, session Two, the, the floor, floor is now open for questions. Do please indicate if you have any questions. It would actually be nice to hear from you one way or another so we know that you are actually with us. This is speaking to Lagos. Um, just approach any of your microphones there and continue with your question. We will pause for you should you approach the microphone. For our guests who are joining us virtually, I have said that there is 
a box, a Q&A box. Raise, raise your, your hand, post your, your question, question in the Q&A Q box. You will be acknowledged and given access. That means we will be able to hear you here in Abuja. So the floor is open for questions on our breakout session too. And uh, the chair is waiting. We'll give you a little time. I'm assuming that there aren't any questions for this particular breakout session. Just giving you a little, little bit more time, time just in case anyone is having technical difficulties. Remember, if you're joining us virtually, you will need to unmute your, your microphone in order that we hear you once you've been granted access. So, so do remember to unmute yourself and, and then speak. And while we're waiting for people to ask questions, if there are anybody in the audience that wants to provide some more insight into these uh, topics, probably we can only come to that. Not more than one minute per person. All right. Hello? Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Hello, sir. Okay, okay so, so we, we have, have some online, online questions, questions here. here. Um, um, the, the first, first one I'm going, going to say comes from Anma Aminu Aliyu. And, and he says, says what, what makes some, some people deny banking system in Nigeria? What makes some people deny banking system in Nigeria? I'm not sure that one <laughs> makes too much sense, but um, we, we will go for this one, one from, from Chidi Iboji, who says, is it possible for the CBN to make a policy of adopting digitalization such as ATM that reject a customer who covers his or her face? while, while trying, trying to make a withdrawal. And we have this one, it says anonymous, but I, I will read it anyway. Paper by Dr. Adyamala Adebise, CEO, MD, Wemma Bank, PLC, is very educated and backs seriously my earlier question to restore banking and finance programs in all our universities, high institutions, for the teaching of financial literacy and an enhancement of financial inclusion. Oh, this, this came from, from Professor Sebastian Uremadu. And what is the CBN doing to ensure that ACIB graduates are assigned core banking duties in the bank they are working at? Many of ACIB graduates are transferred to training school or other departments, for example, check management center, thereby depriving them the opportunity of practicalizing the knowledge acquired in the process of qualifying as a professional banker. I think we can, did you get all the? Yes. All right. So, and I'm sure the speaker and the panelists are also listening. Um, the first question has to do with what makes some people deny banking system in Canada. Uh, yes, yes. Um, um, I think Mr. Debushi will want to address, address that. that. And then there was also another, another one about, about whether it's possible for CBN to, to make a policy for anybody covering the head of something from having access to uh, ATM. Um, I think Dimula may also try to address that. that. Um, and then, um, so if the CIB graduates are assigned for banking duties, what can CIB do? I'm sure I have, the, I have one of the, of the president, of the president of the CIB is here. We you want to answer this uh, question with me outside the interview of the speakers. So, so uh, Debola, you want to address all the questions? questions. And then after you, um, Michelle or, and um, Benga, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chidi, Chidi asked the question on um, whether CBN can come up with a policy that will prevent anybody covering his face at the ATM from doing a successful transaction. Uh, actually, uh, the central bank has done quite a lot uh, in, um, as I said during my paper, in uh, ensuring that SLAs are, are focused on. Uh, speaking specifically to the issue that you raised, technologies today exist such that if you attempt to cover your face, the transaction will not go through. Now, it uh, depends on the model of the ATM that is being used, but what happens is once you cover your face, uh, the ATM, the, so the, the technology is already existing today in banks, and uh, it's already there. I don't know whether this is a particular situation that you experienced. So it doesn't really require the central bank coming up with um, a policy. But in terms of policy, um, talking about chargebacks or talking about um, money stock in the ATM and reversals and all that, we already, uh, recently the central bank came up with a, a framework for ensuring that we shorten the, um, the, the SLA, the time required to do those reversals. And that was what I was referring to when I said, today, for you to achieve those SLAs, you need to adopt robotics, you know, to, to deal with it, you know. And within 24 hours, you'll get your monies back. You know, that is the SLA that we've, um, that's currently in place, with, that the central bank actually forced to happen um, last month or two months ago. Now, uh, I think there was a... Somebody gave me the title of doctor. Maybe when I leave this job, I will go for my DBA, and then I can be a doctor. Now, talking about um, collaboration with universities, yes, there are already collaborations with university, um, banks. Um, I sit on the board of Nigerian uh, Interbank Settlement System, NIPS, and um, basically we have um, interactions with the universities, either in form of um, um, exchange exchange programs you know we go to teach them uh, the practical things that happen in the industry and they also come in to do internship and all that so we actually have that um, also coupled with that is the fact that um, we actually have we're doing an hackathon and it's not just doing an hackathon uh, we also progress from being a, doing an hackathon to doing a boot camp where all the ideas that uh, we're able to crop from the hackathon we take them to the boot camp and try to develop them, develop them into ideas that can actually solve the problem of society. So really, uh, there is a collaboration already going on um, at different, uh, different levels uh, between banks and uh, the universities. I honestly do not understand the first question from Aminu, talking about denying banking services. Um, Maybe he wants to be a bit clearer on that. Um, but I, honestly, I, I don't want to hazard a guess because I don't understand the, um, the question very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, Michel. We, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Okay, let me check. My... Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm back now. I, I got caught. Okay, okay, okay. go ahead. Hello, Michel, can you go ahead, please? Oh, sure. Okay, I thought so now I was going to say something. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think for me, a lot of progress has been made in, in this area. And um, the challenges we face as a country, as an industry, uh, are not the type that we cannot solve. And I believe that the adoption of uh, and targeting the right problems and challenges we face 
to be able to make a lot of growth coming from the sector. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Binga, you would like to make your remarks, please? Um, just say thanks for being a part of this meeting today and this conference today. And um, to mention that collaboration is the way to go in this ecosystem. And we'd like to see the current collaboration levels increased so we can both deliver great experience for our customers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I want to, on behalf of everyone on this uh, call, both that are here physically, and those that are joining virtually, I want to thank uh, Demola, DPC, uh, Binga, uh, and uh, Michelle for the wonderful contribution they have made. I think Shola, Ola DJ is on the call now. Shola? Yes, I am. Can you, you know, we have just four, four minutes to run up. You can just you know, uh, make your contribution in two minutes. Hey. Fantastic, and thank you, everybody, and good evening. Uh, apologies, I got kicked out and was a struggle trying to get back in. I think the, the, the point I wanted to add was largely around how the banks currently position themselves and what the future looks like. Uh, from, from where we see it as well, the sharing economy uh, is now part of the new normal, and we then have to consider how the way the Uber and the Airbnb and the housing was being fragmentized is way we will get to. So we, we uh, the, the way it says that the, the, the construction of banking into individual granular services is fast approaching. It is here already. And how banks can then be able to break that and sell those services to, to customers without necessarily offering the customer the end-to-end -end banking solution is something that is key and is starting to grow now. I think that for the most part, will help the innovators, the SMEs and the fintechs to be able to leverage on their cost strength while seeing banking as a service without necessarily worry about the end to end. It will, it, it basically just means that if I'm a fintech person and what I need at this point in time is card services, I literally can subscribe to a card service and use that and effectively reduce my cost of doing business. It will drive innovation and for the most part, it would lead to prosperity and increased economic growth. The 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 fintechs is a new is a new business model. It, it is here to stay. The the features are, are already there. I think what we're also seeing is on the white labeling side that is currently happening, and banks have to, as part of their strategy and their appropriation labs, that have look at how these banking as a service, which is basically here, and it's maybe not necessarily fully in our in our client, but it, it is the new wave. And that will very quickly help in terms of being relevant in the future. Uh, if you, there was a research done and one out of every three millennial would, it would quickly change their banks in, six, in 60 days. And they expect that in the next future, they won't need a bank. Uh, if that's fact, which it is, we then have to consider how bank evolves, banking evolves and then stays relevant. I think finally on the point around financial inclusion, we. It is very important, all the points that have been made around how fintechs can help. But one point we see which is really still important is the cost of um, the business. The central bank has done quite a lot in terms of the tier one accounts and how it is much easier now adopting BDN, valid ID, as well as a photo to open an account. But the cost with regards to card insurance, transfers, account maintenance, withdrawal charges are still quite, in, still quite an inhibition and the banks have to and the way to look at that, whilst I'm a banker, I understand that the services are not completely free. It's how do we ensure that we support the inclusive agenda whilst being able to then leverage on the upside, which is the increased innovation and the prosperity and effectively economic growth that will come on the back of that. I think the final point, given the, the time constraint, is still the ease of opening an account. While the tier one account is absolutely a good progress, and the banks have adopted that, and the central bank are streaming that, very, very easily. It's how do we use non-data driven type solutions to open an account? Why, why, why is it not possible to buy USSD open an account? Um, the challenge remains, the feedback has been the, the identified photo ID, but if you recall that at BVM registration process, your 
photo is already being taken, then we should be able to further simplify the process of account opening whilst ensuring that at the end of the day, we are able to achieve the World Bank target of total um, inclusion in the financial system. And we're able to see that in the last collaboration, And the, and, the, and, the, and the users, and with the availability of smartphone and you know, other, other form of communication and digital tools, more and more people can be rich, and this has actually deepened financial inclusion within the country. But there's still a long way to go. We still have a long way to go if we are to ensure that other people have access to basic financial services and are not just financially included, but also economically included which I think is very, very important. This is another thing that will come up from this. And the presence of partnership cannot be weak away. The banks need to continue to partner with fintechs. And what we have seen in the last uh, one or two years, actually, is that the line between the fintech and the bank is getting uh, blurred. And going to the days when technology companies are going to provide for banks, we now see banks you know, getting involved in a number of ways. One of which is partnership. We've seen banks also actually buying fintechs to be able to resolve the solution in house. You've seen banks investing in fintechs. You've seen banks even transforming into fintechs. So banks today, both abroad and in Nigeria, Nigeria like Echo Bank, GT Bank, Sterling Bank, they tell you that they are a technology company or a platform, uh, the banking license to offer financial uh, services. So they are actually doing this themselves. So it's not now depending on the top party to provide some of those services, even though some of the fintechs have to plug in into their system. So we are in for interesting times, and I believe with a fintech company getting bigger and bigger, rather than banks actually buying uh, fintechs, you may see in the future fintechs actually buying banks, and it's already happening in the US. Just about a week ago, um, one of the 23-person company called Juco in the US, Actually, bought a three-year-old uh, bank, Mid Central National Bank, that is uh, nationally regulated. You know, being the, being the, being the first retail to buy a bank. So, these are things that are going to happen, and this is going to help to transform how uh, the banking system will be leveraging on digital to be able to provide services for their customers. Uh, our time is up now. I want to thank everyone that has participated in this, both the speakers. The panelists, the audience, including those that are here live, those that are Lagos live, and those that have joined through digital means. The conversation will continue because I know that we've got a lot of uh, things to take over from here, and I believe that so many other things will come out of this. I've really enjoyed the session, and I hope that you have also uh, done. I will thank again the Science of Market of Nigeria for putting this together and for giving us the opportunity to be part of it. Thank you very much, everyone. for the round of applause, Dr. Shegu Aino, OFR, FCIB, President, Africa FinTech Network, and Chairman, Odua Investment Company Limited, the Chairman of this session, The Impact of Finance on Emerging Sectors, Leveraging Digital by the Banking Industry. I can tell you, sir, that it was uh, during this session we got loads and loads of messages online, um, and, and let, let me just say, say to the online people that, yes, yes we, we did see your messages. messages. I, I will mention just a few names who sent messages in, but most of these messages were saying how interesting they were finding the sessions and how interesting this was. So uh, a huge endorsement there. Some of the messages came from, uh, we had Bosu, David, Andu, Rebecca Dawudu, Emmanuel Ogu, Adebisi, Iola, just, just uh, to, to mention, mention a few, but there are quite, quite a number of those, and uh, these came in rather than questions. So I, I suppose it's uh, an endorsement of your panelists that, that you had, that they were as articulate as they were in, in delivering what they had to contribute. Had to contribute. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much sir.
Right, as, as you're aware, aware we, we had two breakout, breakout sessions going. This, this concludes breakout session two, but breakout session one is still ongoing. Breakout session one is still ongoing in the Cano room, which is upstairs at the back of the mezzanine. The impact of finance on emerging sectors. Spotlight on MSMES, manufacturing, creativity, and agriculture industries. If you would like to make your way over there, please do, because I will be holding till the conclusion of that breakout session to bring day one of the 13th Annual Banking and Finance Conference to an end. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing a summary of what we've covered on today's show. I suppose we could, we could, uh, we could do that while they wind down because they are probably not too far behind. Today's session started with the arrival and the registration of the participants. Then we introduced our guest speakers you got, got to hear, hear from the host, host the, the president, president, chairman of council, CIBN, Mr. Bayo Ulubemi, FCIB. We had, we had a good well, good goodwill messages, messages from, from quite a number of high-profile dignitaries today. They included His, His Excellency, Mr. Babajide Songolu, the Executive Governor of Lagos State. We also, we also had Mrs. Zainab Shamsuna Ahmed, the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Federal Republic of Nigeria, who was representing His Excellency, the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces, President Mohamed Buhari. Uh, she declared the conference open. We had a keynote address by Dr. Okechuku Enalama, the former Minister, Federal Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, and, and Chairman, Chairman African, African Capital, Capital Alliance. We had with us today also the Governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Godwin Emiefele, who gave us a goodwill message. We heard from Princess Adejoke Orelope Adefulire, the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Sustainable Development Goals, Federal Republic of Nigeria. The conference, conference was declared open. We, we had photo sessions. And, and then we went, went into the business session for today's proceedings. Session one was inclusive banking, where, where we are, and the way forward. That, that took us to session two, which covered risks of facilitating a sustainable future. Are banks prepared? That, that then brought us to the breakout sessions, sessions one of which you participated in, the impact of finance on emerging sectors, leveraging digital by the banking industry. Looking ahead, ahead to tomorrow, tomorrow we, we convene at 8.30 a.m. Events start at 8.30 a.m. So please do be in the hall and seated by that time, because we will commence with session three. I might, I might give, give a recap, recap of uh, once more what took place, place day one. one. Then, then we'll go into session three, innovations, innovations and disruptions, how fintechs are defining our future. And, and we just heard, heard, heard the chairman talk, talk about a fintech that bought a bank. bank. That, that surprised me. me. We'll, we'll move, move on to session four, leadership and, and competence, repositioning, repositioning the banking industry for relevance. relevance. And, and that, that will bring, bring us to our final session for tomorrow, green banking and economic growth. That's how we will ride for tomorrow. Also earlier today, we did have our keynote address. It was delivered by Dr. Okechuku Enalema. Um, I did mention that, former minister Federal, Federal Ministry, Ministry of Industry, Industry Trade, Trade and Investment and Chairman African Capital Alliance. A vote, vote of thanks, thanks was given by Mr. Patrick Akinwuton, FCIB, the Chairman, Conference Planning Committee, and Managing Director, CEO, Echo Bank, Nigeria. So, if you're not in too much of a hurry, can I ask, please, that our digital people give us the screen of our breakout session that's going on upstairs, 
whilst we wind down and, and wait for that to conclude as well. Can we have breakout session one, which is going on upstairs? Can we have that on our screen? No? no? All, All right. right. So if, if you bear, bear with me, me we, we will give, give them a short while. while. I'm sure they're not too far behind. Um, they, they will, will be concluding very shortly. Then, then we'll close today's proceedings and, and expect to see you tomorrow. Um, as, as you wind down, I did promise today we, we tried, we played catch up quite a bit um, and, and got a bit sidelined. So I had some things I prepared where I said I was going to take you through some, some of the stories, stories I got, got about the banking, banking industry, things, things that you don't normally, well, perhaps, perhaps you've experienced, experienced it, but you probably haven't heard it articulated this way. way. I asked 10, 10 people, including bankers, what they, they didn't like about going into the bank, what, what they didn't like. And um, I, told I told them that if you gave me this, I would say it, on this stage, and because, because we, we, we will have, have the captains and uh, the movers and shakers in banking in, in, in the hall. One, one of them that came back was came from a customer services lady who said to please let, let people know, know that, that, that I'm being polite to you and smiling and looking you in the eye when you walk into the bank doesn't mean that I'm flirting with you. It doesn't mean I fancy you. It doesn't, it's not an introduction for you to ask me for my number. So, so it does appear, appear that a lot of that goes, goes on. We have, we have someone else who says to me that what they, they get, uh, they, they don't like about going into the bank is a mixture of body odors in, in the banking hall. I mean, this, this one blew me away. away. <laughs> and he <laughs> said it was particularly on Mondays and Fridays. I don't know whether those are particularly heavy days in the banking hall, but um, that, that one made me laugh. And, and I, I promised someone, someone I was going to give this quote from Mark Twain. And Mark Twain is quoted as describing a banker as, and I quote, this is not Chico now, but you will need a sense of humor to appreciate it. Mark Twain is quoted as describing a banker as a fellow who lends you an umbrella when the sun is shining but, but wants it, it back, back the, the minute, minute it begins, begins to rain. <laughs> Honestly, it didn't make me laugh. I, I don't know why, why, why that, that is. is. I've, I've had, had quite, quite a pleasant experience myself. Perhaps it's my, my bank. bank. And, and finally, finally today, a fat man walks into a gym. gym. Now, now, this gym is directly across the road from an ATM gallery. So, so he walks, walks into the gym, gym and he goes to the gym instructor and says, I'm and determined, determined to shed some weight and, and lose this pot belly because there's this young lady and I want to marry. So, so the gym instructor looks him up and down and says to him, Oga, you need to use one of those machines across the way in the ATM gallery. If, if you don't, don't get the punchline of the joke, it's a little bit like an Igbo proverb, and they say in Igbo that if you are told a proverb and then you need to have the proverb explained to you, and that's, that's not a good thing. thing. So, so when, when a joke is being said, if you don't get the punchline, then you need to explain. It takes so much away from it. So, so I do hope you got, got it. Can, Can I get a signal that we have concluded upstairs? All right, right please, please give me one second. A little bit of music, please, and uh, we, we will, will conclude shortly. shortly.
<sighs> right. Session, session one, one has just concluded. concluded. Breakout session one has just concluded as well. Uh, the, the impact of finance on emerging sectors. Spotlight on MSMES, manufacturing, creativity, and agriculture industries. With that, it's my privilege to say thank you very much for coming out for day one of the 13th annual Banking and Finance Conference. The theme, Facilitating a Sustainable Future, the Role of Banking and Finance. It falls on me, your MC, to say, to say thank, thank you very much for coming out. out. Today's, Today's session is, is now closed. We will, we will resume here in the morning for day two. Thank, thank you very much, much and good night. night.